Blue Nose Audio presents Current, a secret baby romance. Written by Lainey Davis. Narrated by Tom Taylorson and Carly Robbins. Chapter 1. Walt. June. Trent, put on a suit. I need you to come with me today. I'll text you the address. My father doesn't waste time with pleasantries. Not with me, anyway. He hangs up the phone abruptly. I could have had plans today. I could have been out somewhere. He has no idea, and he doesn't care. Something evidently came up, and I'm needed to show my face and preserve the family brand. I look at the address my father sent. Heinz Hall, downtown. I remember something vague my mother had said about going to a client's daughter's wedding this weekend. The fact that I'm being called in as a pinch hitter means Mom is either faking a dizzy spell or she mixed up her benzos with her vitamins this morning. I could tell my father to fuck off. I could get in my car and just drive away. I have a college degree. I could probably get a job doing something and support myself. I used to watch YouTube videos about people who just live in a van and drive around the country, working on farms in short bursts to support their wanderlust. I don't have the first clue how to do anything on a farm, and we've always had plenty of money to travel in style. I don't have wanderlust so much as a deep and burning desire to escape the Sheffield name and all that goes with it. But if I'm honest, I can't escape the hope that eventually my father will smile at me and maybe tell me I did a good job at something. Depending on who you ask, my parents are model citizens. They're involved in philanthropy and sit on boards of directors for charities. They invest in their communities, and our last name shows up all over kids' baseball jerseys and soccer fields we've patronized. But behind closed doors, my mother criticized my sister's appearance incessantly. My father spent the past 25 years both telling me I'm worthless and insisting I need to step up and take the helm of the family empire. The promise of that is intoxicating. Taking the helm. What would that feel like? I step into my closet and start putting on my tailored suit. It's like a costume. When I'm wearing it, I'm Trip Sheffield. Heck of a guy. I shake hands too aggressively and laugh too hard at old men telling sexist jokes. When I say something, it has no substance or else it makes women uncomfortable. I tighten a perfect Windsor knot in my tie, hating my reflection in the full-length mirror. Maybe it's not entirely fair to say the suit is a costume. I'm never not wearing tailored couture. The last time I tried to be me, I was in high school. I was a day student at a posh academy where boarding students came from all over to prepare for a lifetime of success. I was, of course, expected to participate in respectable sports like lacrosse, golf, and tennis. I was expected to take courses in business and economics. But one day I enrolled in an acting class. I figured I'd spend my entire life acting like Trip Sheffield. What if I tried something else? I stare into my reflection, remembering the twitch of my father's neck muscles when he personally drove to campus to inform the head of the school there had been an error in my registration. To anyone else, he was an attentive father, taking time from his corporate life to see to his son's education. I saw the way his entire body clenched felt the sting of his fingers digging into my arm as he walked me to his car. I learned two things that day. First, whatever hold the Sheffields apparently had on the upper class is apparently precarious. And second, our friends and neighbors are evidently utterly unforgiving of any activity that carries the slightest whiff of not meeting expectations. I tuck my phone into my jacket pocket and sigh, hoping I'm not late to meet my father. He greets me with a nod and starts walking inside. Hey, I say, causing him to stare at me disapprovingly. I just... Can you brief me before we go in? He rolls his eyes. Mick Brady's son is getting married. Owns Beltane Engineering. They're consulting on the Garfield project for us. You recall your responsibilities to this property? Sure, Dad, of course. This is just a little last minute for me is all. Yes, well... Your mother wasn't feeling well today. I don't ask after her. There's no point, really. Anything I should be aware of before we go in? I arch a brow, glancing around his shoulder to see if I know anyone. 
My father licks his teeth and waits a few beats before saying, The Broad comes from a well-connected family in the South Hills. There will be a lot of important contacts here today, but they're here for a wedding. Don't bring up business. And for the love of God, don't try to talk about your bakery. I hold up my palms in a surrender gesture. Of course not. I sputter. My father gave me a task for his company's new project in the Garfield neighborhood. I keep clinging to hope that this will be my big opportunity to prove myself to him, but most of the time he doesn't seem to remember he assigned me a project to lead. There had been a project planning meeting, and he asked for ideas to round out the development. I spit out the phrase, Keto Bakery, in a panic after scrolling through social media on my phone in my lap. I plunked in the terms powerful influencers and market trends and managed to get the nod from our investors. I'm supposed to be creating a trendy new customer magnet as part of some big project my father has going in that neighborhood. That's what our family business does. We develop new commercial projects, secure investors, sell the businesses, reap the profits. Only, I'm not sure how any of it really works. I mostly take credit for the work our interns are doing. Dad shakes a bunch of hands as we walk inside and take our seats just before the ceremony begins. I tap the program on my leg nervously as the wedding party files past. And then a woman catches my eye, because she looks as uncomfortable as me. She's tall and gorgeous, and she moves like she's not used to wearing a dress. I look at the program, and almost everyone has the last name Brady, so the man with his arm hooked around her is most likely her brother. I find myself feeling relieved that he's not competition, as if a woman like that would ever look my way. Her full lips are painted a deep red, the color of ripe cherries. Her long, golden hair is looped into a braided crown, and she is absolutely regal moving through space, like she owns every atom. She turns her head to scan the room and looks through me, past me, like I'm just a face in the crowd. I stare at her for a half hour, not even aware when the wedding ends, until she files right on past me again, and I watch as she walks directly toward the bar across the hall, in the space reserved for the reception. I feel my father's hand on my shoulder, an ounce more firmly than is comfortable. You see that tall drink of water over there? Dad points at the bar, and my heart sinks when I realize he's gesturing at the regal beauty from the ceremony. She's one of the Brady kids, and I'm doing business with her family. Why don't you go over there and show her some of the old Sheffield charm? It's not really a request. I exhale slowly, wishing it weren't so easy to let my slimy persona slide into place. I nod at my father and walk toward the bar. I doubt that I belonged in the world of engineering. On the other... I was at least 18 years old before I realized it's not normal to be able to identify your cousins based on the smell of their farts. After the ceremony, I grab a drink and make a beeline for the ladies in red. Orla! Sam sings out my name and shakes her glass at me. You look terrific. Did you take my advice about the shapewear? I told you I don't do shapewear, I tell her, rolling my eyes. You're missing out. It just smooths everything. As she gestures up and down her abdomen, I catch sight of a guy staring, and I roll my eyes again. You're attracting attention, I say, my voice a little quieter. Sam waggles her eyebrows, like she knew, and that was the point. Sam laughs and shimmies as Logan, another Brady girlfriend, makes her way toward us. Oh my gosh, Orla, you look beautiful. This whole thing is beautiful. Logan claps her hands and bounces on her toes. Cal won't stop talking about the architecture of the building. At the ripe old age of 31, Cal's six years ahead of me in age and a few decades behind me in common sense. Except when it comes to girlfriends. Logan's pretty great. Let's talk about something more important, Sam says, steering us both across the room. Nicole mentioned there was a cheese sculpture. The food at this event was actually something I got excited about when Nicole was describing it over the past few months. Waitstaff circulates the room with all sorts of things wrapped in bacon, tiny cups of shrimp, various flavored meats. 
I think she commissioned an actual chalet made of Swiss cheese, I say, snagging a skewer of chicken satay from a waiter, who grins at me suggestively. I consider kneeing him in the balls, but I don't want him to drop the meat. I might want more of this later. Sure enough, we approach a table that would fit in at an art gallery. It's like a model railroad village, but all the structures are made from different cheeses, and tiny knives invite would-be destructors like Foof to tear down the walls. Now we're talking, I say, setting my drink on the edge of the table and reaching for one of the knives. My tongue pokes out in anticipation while I consider where to start. I twirl the cheese knife, pondering. Should I slice into the Roquefort sheep farm or the Gouda windmill? You can handle my knife like that any time. A deep male voice cuts into my decision space, and I whip my head around to see who said something so gross. The guy who was staring at me and Sam earlier, who looks like a Ken doll, gestures lewdly in the vicinity of his crotch, and then winks. I absolutely hate winkers. Pass, I say, jabbing the knife into an Italian villa made from Asiago. Undeterred, Kendall leans on the edge of the table and watches me. You really know your way around a hard blade, he says. Any chance you'll save a slice for me? Unlikely, I say, and I turn away from him, grabbing my cheese and my drink and finding my friends, who have migrated toward the fruit table. Nicole did say we should all stretch out our stomachs with the appetizers to make room for the feast she's got coming our way. I'm here for it. When I get back to my friends, Logan and Sam are conspiring about introducing themselves to some of the rich old buzzards here at the reception. Sam hired Logan as the CFO at her company, and the two of them are inseparable. I'd kill for a female best friend at work. Sure, we've got Dakota, but our project manager is mainly in the office, and I'm typically out on job sites. I munch on my cheese and listen as they rank the rich guests by their likelihood of becoming investors in Sam's business. Soon, I realize they're not going to stop talking about work, and I have nothing of substance to offer in the conversation. As my mind wanders, Ken Doll keeps looking at me and licking his lips. I glare at him, but then I decide his lips are actually kind of pillowy. He's really fucking hot, but he knows it, and that makes him seem gross. I look around for Maddie and Emma, hoping they'll distract me, but when I find them, they're both gushing about how great it is to have a day off from their kids, and I feel left out of that conversation, too. Unlike Sam and Logan's work talk, Maddie and Emma's mom talk causes my chest to tighten, and the blood in my temples to pulse uncomfortably. I know they're entitled to a break, but it stings a little to hear them expressing relief about it when I know my mom sobbed for months when she learned her cancer was terminal. All she wanted was more time to be a mom. I drift over to where Nicole and Zach are chatting with their guests. Zach, usually the grouchiest guy around, is actually smiling as he fiddles with his new wedding ring. It glints silver in the lights in the hall. I'm about to have my turn hugging them when Nicole's sister steps in my path. Una, right? Wasn't it a beautiful ceremony? It's Orla, I remind her. She knows damn well what my name is because my dad said I had to play nice and work with her to plan Nicole's shower. Thankfully, she took charge of that whole thing, but she still had to type my name in the to line of every group email. Orla, of course. Her smile is as fake as her nails. I never have any idea how to behave around fake people. I grimace and poke my cheese with a toothpick. She leans closer to me. Soon it'll be your turn. Do you think you'll choose a non-religious ceremony as well? Uh, yeah. Because we are not religious. I know it's a faux pas to say that, but why is she asking me about my wedding at her sister's wedding? I spin away from her as she blinks and make my way back to the snacks. A server passes by with bacon-wrapped dates, and I pluck one from the tray, cramming the sweet and savory goodness into my mouth. Um, God, that's good, I say involuntarily. Aren't they, though? 
This time, I'm intercepted by my dad, who seems to be making his way toward the bride and groom. I look around his shoulder to make sure Nicole's sister is gone before I fall into step alongside him. He drops a kiss on the top of my head. You look beautiful, sweetheart. Thanks, Dad. You clean up nice, too. Dad always wears suits to work, so this slightly fancier suit shouldn't make much difference. But with his silver hair cut short and his beard trimmed, he looks damned sophisticated. When I look up at Dad's eyes, I see they're a little watery. You gonna make it? He dabs at his eye with the heel of his hand. Oh, yes. I'm just thinking how much your mother would have enjoyed seeing your cousins all grown up. And you, obviously. Anyway, I was just missing her today. I feel a pinch inside my torso. Like my spine has locked itself into place. I have to breathe very carefully as I work to maintain my composure. This is all feeling like too much. I just wanted to hug my fucking cousin, and even that has meant a journey through emotional minefields. Hey, Dad, I'm just going to grab a drink. I squeeze his arm and try to turn out of his grip. You already have one, Orla Bear. He taps at my glass. I chew on the inside of my cheek. I meant water, Dad. Best to alternate. Ha ha, gotta pace myself. I force a smile and he nods. I walk away, not knowing where to go. I can't seem to find any of my friends, and my relatives are all scattered throughout the room. A huge combination of uncomfortable feelings has my head throbbing a little bit. But when I look up at the bar again, Kendall is standing in my space. You look lost, little lamb, he crows. Want me to help you find your way? I roll my eyes. Are you always this pompous? Little lamb, come on, he blinks. I was just referencing the cheese sheep you destroyed over there. He shrugs and reaches for my plate and plucks up the remains of a tiny cheese sheep. Then he opens his mouth, sticks out that tongue, and eats my cheese. I should hate him. I should punch him. Any other day, I'd stomp on his foot and tell him to get lost. I can't put my finger on it, but I know this is an act for him. It takes one to know one when you're putting on a show, after all. I squint at him, wondering what's beneath this shell. He grins, and suddenly, I have to know. I very calmly set down my cheese, smooth out my skirt, and grab his hand. A solution to my wedding discomfort has presented itself to me. I'm going to walk away from this crowd and get sweaty with this sexy, gross douchebag. All right, I say. Let's do this. His eyes flash a brighter blue. Come again? I plan to, I say, tugging on his arm. There's a hotel across the street. Legs. My hands move automatically to caress them. Being here with Orla feels daring. I imagine my father scanning the reception, wondering where I've gone, fearing I'm saying something that will impact his reputation. Instead, I'm in a hotel room getting shoved around by a grouchy Celtic goddess. Well, Wally, I believe you offered me the use of your knife? I snort out a laugh. You gonna slice my throat with it? Are you saying you want me to choke you with your own dick, Wally? I feel a burst of energy and a surge of lust, and I thrust up off the mattress, flipping us both over so I'm on top of Orla, nestled between her legs. I jut my hips against her, feeling the warm heat at the apex of her thighs. She wants me too, I remind myself. She's into this for some reason. I'm totally overcome, outside my normal comfort zone. I'm typically timid with women in bed. Frankly, I don't think I'm very good at making things good for them. But for some reason, this woman rejects my trip performance. I can be anyone I want right now. And I want very badly to be a man who makes Orla fucking Brady feel good. I lick my lips, staring down at her chest, and take a deep breath. I'm gonna stuff my dick into your pretty little pussy, Orla fucking Brady, I tell her. And her eyes turn molten. I press her wrists above her head with one hand as I unzip my fly. Does that sound okay to you? Finally, Wally, she says, smiling. 
That's exactly what I want to hear. Chapter 4 Orla Of course, Sam and Maddie catch me sneaking back into the reception. I try to play it cool, like I've just been in the bathroom for a long time. But Sam squints and leans toward me, sniffing. Orla. She puts her hands on her hips and leans close. You smell like man. I groan, but grab a flower from a nearby vase and sort of smear the petals around my throat and wrists. Better? She laughs at me. No, now you just smell like man and have crushed flower parts on your neck. Who did you do? I shrug, scanning the room for Wally, but not seeing him. He moaned for a long time about his dick getting stabbed, and I eventually left him in the bathroom to come back to the wedding. I sort of hoped he'd be down for another round later. That Ken doll is a sex god, and I'd like some more of that, please. He was a whole different person in my hotel room, and I liked it. It felt daring, risque, something my father would frown upon, something a man would do without thinking twice. Oh my gosh, Maddie says, reaching for her fanny pack and procuring a lollipop. Is he here at the party? She stands on tiptoe and starts looking around the room. I think he left. I whisper, reaching out for champagne from a passing server. I sip my drink and try to use my eyebrows to convey I totally wore him out. But that's only true in the sense that I might have somehow broken his precious winky. It's me who feels wrung out inside. Only I'm not wrung out. I'm feeling electric and alive. Like I can do anything. So something weird did happen during, I tell them, biting my lip. They lean in. Did you ever, like, stab a guy's dick with your IUD? Maddie drops her plate of food on the ground, and it shatters. A server comes rushing over with a tiny broom and dustpan, while Maddie and Sam both stare at me, slack-jawed. Sam grabs my elbow and drags me away from the mess as Maddie totters after us. Tell me exactly what just happened, Sam says. I want to know everything. So you never had that happen? Maddie closes her eyes and raises a hand in the air. I just need, like, one more minute before I can breathe again, she says. I'm picturing it silently at the moment. Was there blood? Well, just a little, I tell them, explaining how he sprang off of me the moment it happened. I mean, at least he came, right? Despite his tiny flesh wound? Sam nods, squinting, holding onto the wall for support. I'm going to go ahead and say, that's unusual, Orla. Mm-hmm, Maddie agrees. But really, how terrific is that? Your pussy bites back. Do we feel bad for this guy, or are we happy it got him out the door sooner? Where are you on your journey with this man? I consider. Gulp down the rest of my champagne. Remember how Wally caught me in a moment of weakness when all my demons were trying to make me uncomfortable. I'm not sure I have the stomach to go after someone who acts smarmy and entitled in public, even if he turns terrific behind closed doors. This was an efficient way to end the encounter, I tell them. Sam's laughter echoes above the live band performing at the reception, but then she grabs my arm. Looking at me sternly, she says, Seriously, though, you should swing by a clinic for an STD panel. I groan. I had been trying to suppress worrying about that. Yeah, I reach for a cookie from my friend's plate and take a bite, shrugging. It was worth it. Monday morning, I have a sour stomach. I'm meeting a new client today first thing after a quick brief meeting at the Beltane offices. My dad is trusting me to take the lead on the electrical for a new commercial eatery, and I've never done this before but I have to sweat all my nerves out at home because I don't let people at work see me this way. One sniff of doubt, and they'll all be clamoring to put a man in charge. I skip my Brady family group run this morning and take off on my own, pounding out an eight-minute mile pace until the endorphins chase off my nerves. I stand in my bathroom and remind myself I took charge at the steel plant last year when they had a machinery collapse. 
If I can supervise the repair of a 30-year-old conveyor system, I can get a few ovens and deep freezers up to code. In an old laundromat. No big deal. No fucking sweat, I say out loud to my reflection. This will be the last project I have to tackle under supervision before I can sit for my professional exams. Just a few more months, and I can become a licensed professional engineer. I can practically feel my ovaries cheering for me. I breeze through the planning meeting at the office and take a company car to the Garfield neighborhood where the client is redeveloping an entire city block. They're putting in an upscale brew pub, hot yoga studio, and apparently a keto bakery. I had to look up the word keto, and I'm not really interested, but Dad reminded me yet again of my upcoming exams and my long-term plans for career growth. Even if they don't eat grains, they still need their wiring up to code, I mutter. A circuit breaker is a circuit breaker. I park a block away, and my boots crunch on the crumbling sidewalk as I make my way to the building. I pause to pull out my tablet and make a note to ask Dakota about the timing of new plumbing and wiring compared to when the concrete guys are scheduled to replace the walk. I'm not even sure if Beltane has been hired to oversee the entire job or just the electrical. Come to think of it, there are a lot of unchecked boxes on this job sheet. I'll have to touch base with my dad and Dakota after I meet with these folks. When I reach the door, I find it locked. I frown. I know the space isn't currently in use, but I've got an active work permit. I assumed it would be crawling with contractors, especially if they're at the stage where they're bringing in the electrical engineer for a consult. I lean against the front window to peer inside and then scream when I hear someone speak an inch away from my ear. Didn't know they'd be sending in a little lady for this discussion says an all-too-familiar voice. I whip my head around to see Wally, looking unforgivably sexy in a dress shirt and slacks, standing next to a bored-looking, much less sexy colleague. Jesus, Wally, you shouldn't sneak up on people like that. He's taken aback when he recognizes me. I snort. How's we, Wally, faring? His eyes widen as his colleague frowns. I stick out my hand. Orla Brady, Beltane Engineering, I tell the new guy, and then I turn to Wally. You're supposed to be showing me the plans to convert this place into a commercial kitchen? I watch as Wally transforms his face from human back into smarmy cyborg. My assistant should have sent you the plans electronically, he says, trying to sound condescending. I see the subtle move as his eyes dart to his colleague and back to me. Wally rolls his eyes and says to his colleague, this one probably had trouble with the attachment. He hooks a thumb in my direction. Like I told you this morning, we're just waiting for the engineers to quit dragging their feet on this. You can cut that crap out right now, Sheffield, I tell him. You know perfectly well you only obtained the license for the diagramming and vector drawing software over the weekend. We're reviewing the plans today in person based on the concept your architect submitted Friday. The boring suit guy looks impressed, then turns his head toward Wally, waiting for a response. Wally maintains his waxy grin. Like I said, you were sent the plans as an attachment. If that's true, why would I be here in person? Why are you here right now, Wally? His nostrils flare the tiniest bit, and I know I'm starting to break through this inexplicable facade of his, is he showing off for this other guy, or trying to ruffle my feathers on purpose? He's so much more acceptable when I've got him alone and half-naked. He huffs. Not that it concerns you, but I'm giving Hampton here a tour of the space, as he's one of the key investors in this new concept. Oh, Christ. Here we go again with the concept. Baked goods with no sugar or grains. Wally opens his mouth to respond, but his phone rings. I kick at the gravel on the eroding sidewalk. Where's your timeline for the concrete repair? Have you coordinated the plumbing install with our crew? I'm starting to get the sense that he either has no idea what's going on with this project, or else he's acting like this because I'm a woman. Either way, I'm insulted and pissed off. His phone rings. Again. 
He reaches into his pocket to silence it as I cross my arms and tap my work boot, noticing how dirty it looks next to Wally's well-shined dress shoe. He still hasn't stepped back out of my personal space. Wally's phone keeps ringing incessantly, and the Hampton guy keeps staring back and forth between us until Wally finally pulls the phone to his ear. What? He barks, and then I hear a series of shrieks spurting from his cell. He sticks a finger in one ear and backs away to take the call, leaving me and Hampton to stare at one another. I don't suppose you have the plans from the architect? I raise a brow at him and keep my arms crossed, tapping my tablet against my forearm. He shakes his head. I give it another minute as I watch Wally pace frantically along the sidewalk, gesturing wildly before I watch him take off at a jog. I guess we're done here, I say. The Hampton guy stares as I toss my notes on the ground and walk the opposite direction to drive back to Beltane HQ. I'm going to have to raid my father's office. Everything since I found out feels simultaneously sped up and slowed down. I'm not sure if it's still the same day. I head upstairs and open the door to Dad's office, the hunter green wallpaper and darkwood furniture greeting me. I step into the room and feel the constant fear of my youth. A summons to this room was the precursor to a stern reminder of my failures. I've never been in here alone before. I feel like an imposter as I sink into my father's chair, looking around his desk for any information that might guide me toward a responsible adult who knows what to do in situations like this. I set my drink on my father's coaster and catch myself looking over my shoulder, waiting for him to scold me for taking liberties. I remind myself I saw his dead body at the morgue. He isn't going to speak to me, unkindly or otherwise, ever again. There's a brass box on the corner of the desk, and I open it to discover a good old-fashioned file of address cards. I flip to L and immediately feel foolish to realize the lawyer would be listed by last name, not occupation. I down the rest of my whiskey and dump the cards on the desk, quickly flipping through until I've pulled out three with ESQ typed after the name. Relief washes over me when I recognize the name Hampton on one of the cards. I remember a barrel-chested man with red cheeks who shook hands with me and my dad when I signed papers for my trust fund when I turned 21. I dial the number, and I'm surprised when a familiar gruff voice answers the call. Oh, I mutter. Hello, I thought maybe I'd reach a secretary. Who's calling me at this number? He sounds irritated. Of course my father would have the inside track to some private line for his lawyer. Um, this is Trip Sheffield, I say, hating the feel of that name in my mouth. I think of Orla, refusing to call me by that name. She's maybe the only person who has ever agreed with me that it's terrible. Trip! Watson's voice shifts from unease to jovial. What can I do for you, son? Oh, I tell him. Well, my father died today. It's dark by the time Watson finishes talking at me and we hang up. I stumble downstairs knowing I should probably eat something, but making my way instead toward the bar. I left my tumbler upstairs on my father's coaster, so I just take a swig directly from the bottle before approaching my mother. She stares at me, her eyes glassy. Mom, I say, putting my hand on hers. She looks down at the contact and then meets my eye. Did you know the money was gone? Oh, Trippy. She pulls her hand out from under mine and then pats my head. Of course I knew there were some hiccups. Your father sold the boat last year. It's nothing to worry about, I'm sure. Mom, it's not a hiccup. Watson spent an hour telling me what we needed to liquidate immediately to pay off debts. He described years of failed investments, shady business dealings, negotiations with the IRS. It's all gone, Mom, I tell her. The Empire, the great Sheffield name, all of it, gone. The ski chalet, the business, the cars, all of the cars have to go. I own my townhouse outright, and my trust fund wasn't impacted. 
and Mom can keep the house. Barely. But everything else I've ever known, including my father's reputation, his precious brand, it's all gone. Rosemary bustles in the door, looking irritated. This better be important, she snarls. She doesn't look at or acknowledge our mother. I don't blame her. But I do start laughing. For all my yearning about a different life, about a relief from the pressure of being a Sheffield, I would have thought this day would feel lighter somehow. A relief, perhaps. Instead, I laugh maniacally. Dad's dead, I tell my sister, who squints at me. And we're bankrupt. Chapter 6 Orla July I'm still enraged at the loss of the stupid bakery project I was supposed to manage for stupid Wally and his stupid family business. I should feel empathy for him that his father dropped over dead of a heart attack, but everything that came to light since that day has done nothing to improve my opinion of that family. Pa Sheffield was apparently a lousy crook with unpaid invoices all over the city, engineering, construction, consulting, you name it. He left them high and dry in recent years. The Sheffield business was swimming in debt. Dad says we should feel thankful we only lost some planning stage work for them. The contractors working on their other projects on entire block are just up Schitt's Creek. No payment, nothing. Wally's whole family were all living some puffed-up, pretend life. Uncle Mick keeps assuring us that Walton II was an all-right guy back in the day. Uncle Mick says that about all his gross friends. He and Dad don't even seem all that upset about the bakery dealing falling through. I still haven't gotten a replacement project to round out my final year of supervision, so I still can't start my prep work for the professional exams. I carry an unhealthy level of anger about it, which is probably tied into inexplicable irritation that I haven't been able to locate Wally since that day we were supposed to be meeting at his business. It's like the other Sheffields fell off into one of the sinkholes downtown, along with a city bus, which brings me right back to the purpose of this team meeting I'm not able to stomach today. Dad stands at the head of the conference table with a laser pointer, fully in his element, as he walks us through images of a broken street. You see, the episode has severed wires, pipes for both water and gas, and impacted the stability of the foundations of nearby buildings. This is, as they say, pay dirt for our civil and geotechnical crew. Orla, I'm bringing you in to consult for electrical repairs. My eyebrow shoots up. Allegheny Power isn't bringing in their own people for that? Dad shakes his head. The incident is due to a city road failure, and the city has hired Beltane. He winks at me. You're getting a redo after the bakery fiasco. I open my mouth to speak, or smile or something, but a wave of nausea crashes over me. I leap from my seat and, right there in the conference room, in front of all my cousins and peers, I puke into the trash can. Nobody says a thing for a long time. Zack grabs a napkin from the coffee cart and holds it out to me gingerly and I dab at my mouth. Sorry, guys, I mutter, feeling a flush creep up my cheeks. I'm ready, Dad. Tell me more. My dad's face falls and he starts shaking his head. Liam slaps the conference table. Out, he barks, pointing toward the door. We just got Arlen back into daycare after a week home with a fever. I'm not having you contaminate me with your germs. I have no idea what just happened here, but I doubt I'm contagious. I wonder if I can tell them all I'm just overwhelmed at the responsibility from Dad. Guys, I was just thinking about someone gross and lost my breakfast. This is not a big deal. Liam, don't look at me that way. He continues to look at me like I have the plague. I'm not sick, I swear. People around the table start to murmur and cringe. Best to take a sick day, shortcake. Uncle Mick leans against the wall in the back of the room. He hates sitting still and always winds up standing and pacing during meetings. It occurs to me 
that he might be scared of the smell of my little interruption here, as he and everyone else seemed to be leaning far away from me. Right, I say, picking up the trash can. I'll be on email. Let me know the plan for Project Sinkhole. Sick day, Orla, my dad says, pointing his laser at the door. I roll my eyes and head out. The nausea has totally passed, almost like it didn't happen. I sigh, staring at the bucket of evidence that it had, in fact, happened. I never get sick. I'm not sick now, actually, but I don't mind spending the day working from my couch, if I'm honest. I haven't been sleeping well this month, probably because I'm irritated with Wally's family. I hate that my thoughts of him are so complicated. Hot sex, swirled together with douchey behavior and a scummy family. And mixed in there is anger at myself that I thought I had him figured out. I thought I knew he was just pretending to be a windbag. I've spent weeks now pissed off that I thought I saw some sort of connection with him. I carry the puke can to the dumpster outside and text our admin that we need to order a new trash can for the conference room. When I get to my car, I pull up the foof group chat and decide to vent a bit. Got huge opportunity to lead sinkhole project at work, but got sent home because I yacked in the meeting. Almost immediately, my phone pings with a response from Maddie. You didn't breathe near Liam, did you? We just got Arlen back into daycare. No worries. I really think it's fine. I feel totally fine now. I think it was nerves. Sam sends a gif of a woman recoiling in disgust. Orla, girl, you never get nervous. Do not come to Foof tonight. No parties for pukers. Juniper, amen to that. Me, since when is everyone so concerned with vomit? Nicole, since always. Why are you not concerned with vomit? Maddie, even when I was pregnant and I knew it was just morning sickness, I was concerned with vomit. Emma. Actually, you sort of weren't, Maddie. Maddie. Fair. But mostly, I just like to puke and carry on because it bothered Liam so much. Juniper. I'm so glad I never puked when I was pregnant. I only knew I was prego because my nipples hurt like hell. This last text hits me like a sledgehammer. I am sitting in my car, pulling my bra away from my chest because my nipples are so sensitive. In the middle of doing this, reading Juniper's text, I realize my nips have been this way for a few days at least. I look down at them, afraid to exhale, because the sensation will feel like razors slicing my skin. I frown at my phone and start to drive toward my apartment. I start willing myself to feel nauseous again, hoping for food poisoning, or maybe a virus, even if it means I get Liam sick. Women get sore nipples, surely? Doesn't everyone go through phases like that? Besides, I can't be pregnant because I have an IUD. It's been settled in there comfortably for years. I drive and fret and think about Wally. He's the only one I had sex with in... Really, I can't remember the last time I had sex before that. But Wally didn't even finish inside me. He sprang off the bed when my IUD strings apparently stabbed him through the condom. I start to sweat. My friends all encouraged me to go see my gynecologist after that. Penis stabbing is not part of the normal IUD experience. But I got so wrapped up in hate-talking the Sheffield family after we got shafted on that bakery project, I just let it slip. At least I took care of the STD screening. That counts for something, right? Shit. I pull a fast right turn into a parking spot outside a drugstore, and I stalk through the store like a shifty character, darting around trying to find the pregnancy tests. I locate them along the back wall, under the careful scrutiny of the pharmacy staff. Great, I mutter, realizing that, like the condoms, these must be hot ticket items for desperate people to steal. Of course, there are 30 different kinds of pregnancy tests. Do I need early notification? Do I need something electronic? Digital? Jesus, I have no idea, and there's no way I'm asking. I grab the box with the least pink on it, because fuck that marketing. The heavens shine on me via the existence of a self-checkout station, so I quickly pay and get the hell out of there. When I get to my apartment, I stare at the box on the counter for a long time. I'm still not nauseous. My nipples still ache. 
I grab a glass of water and pound it down and head into the bathroom with the tests. Two agonizing minutes later, I stare at twin purple lines, clear as day. Chapter 7 Walt I almost don't hear the knock on my door, which is nuts because I've been thinking for a week that the silence in my house was deafening. I haven't even been watching the TV. I'm just... existing. At first, there was so much to do. I had to make thousands of decisions about the funeral because Rosemary just helped herself to Mom's Ativan and the pair of them sat comatose in our living room. My aunts and uncles always have a lot to say about every element of our lives, but none of them showed up to help me pick out embalming options or write an obituary. Watson at least barked out orders until we dealt with all the paperwork, signed this, and this, and this. By the time I was done with him, We'd settled Dad's debts and sold almost everything familiar about my life. So now, Dad's in the ground, Mom's set up with an allowance, and I have nothing to do. I don't have a job. I don't know how to get one or what it would be. I don't have a career, and all those frat brothers who vowed to stick together like family, they're not taking my calls. None of them even came to the funeral. Some outstanding citizen my father turned out to be. Those thoughts are loud and persistent, but eventually I do hear the knock. I stagger to the door and open it before I remember to check if I'm dressed. I glance down. Apparently sweatpants count as acceptable because the guy at the door doesn't flinch. Sign? It's the mailman, holding out a digital signature pad and a large envelope. What is it? I stare as the mailman uses one hand to massage his lower back while he waits for me to sign his form. Certified mail, dude. He leans against the wall as I move in slow motion. It feels like I'm swimming through molasses. I wonder how long it's been since I stepped outside. The mailman grunts. Jesus, I'm beat. I'm on day 13 with no time off coming anytime soon. I stare at him. He stares at me. I say, I guess that's better than not working at all. He snorts. You looking for a job? We need help, bad. You ever take the civil service test? What's that? I sign the machine and hand it back to him, stuffing the envelope under my arm. You know, the civil service test. You pass that and we can get you on a mail route. Take some of the load off my shoulders, man. Think you could pass a drug test? Do those tests for liquor? He shakes his head at me. You're a trip, dude. But think about it. The pay's good. He backs down off my porch and takes a few unsteady steps toward my neighbor's house before picking up his pace. I watch him adjust his headphones and bop his head along to whatever music he's listening to as he works. I'm a trip. I snort. Another reason to hate that awful nickname. But I'm intrigued by his mention of the civil service test. Who knew there was a test to be a mailman? I try to remember the last time I took an exam. Probably high school? but my mother always insisted I had anxiety in high school and I had a lot of accommodations for tests. I don't recall giving a shit about any of it, and most kids in private school have anxiety. The liberal arts school I attended for college didn't have exams. We had discussions. And look where that got me. Half-naked, staring at my wall, listless. I head back inside and try to decide if being nothing is better or worse than inheriting generational wealth and fucking it all up like my father did. I locate my laptop under a heap of takeout containers. It occurs to me that I'm going to have to stop blindly putting things on my credit card. I don't even know how much I have coming in each month. God, I don't even know who pays my internet bill. Someone must be doing it because the browser still works when I type in what is the civil service test. I frown as each site I click seems to be a den of advertisements. By the time I find the actual exam site and realize I can take the test online right this minute, I click begin before I think about what I'm doing. I start squinting at addresses on the screen, figuring out whether two listings are the same or different. I find the questions are easy for me, and the questions fly by. I memorize zip codes and street names, clicking my way through until I get to a section that asks about my work history. Work? Have I ever done anything a mailman would consider real work? Let's see. 
My internship in college was, of course, at my father's company. I mostly sat in the break room watching as the real interns made copies and took notes at meetings, eager to glean information relevant to their actual ambitions. I graduated from college and was hired by my father's company as a manager and started wearing expensive suits while I went about my days pretending I understood property development. Oh, and then I went with my father to his client's son's wedding and fucked one of the bridesmaids and pierced my dick in the process. I strike that last bit from the answer block. It put me over my character limit anyway. I try not to let myself think about Orla fucking Brady. I save thoughts for her for when I'm alone at night and feeling particularly down. I summon her in my mind, all fierce words and long muscles and molten heat. When I'm alone, I relive the experience of pleasuring her, hearing her moan my name. Here, in the daylight, I silence those thoughts. I fill out the rest of the questions and click Submit. And then I take a breath. Since high school, I've done exactly two things without first considering the impact on my family or our business dealings. I fucked Orla at that wedding, and I took that exam just now. I sit on the stool, my hands tapping against my legs, and I look around my townhouse. I didn't pick it. It was given to me. It came decorated and furnished. I feel no attachment toward it or anything inside. I feel no ownership. I did nothing to earn any of this. I did nothing to earn that night with Orla, either. That was a gift, I decide. And the sting at the end was to make sure I knew it was a fantasy. Nothing that could ever continue. I purse my lips and pick up my phone, opening a checklist app I've never used before. I make a list, bills to figure out, and I add internet to the list. Then, with a laugh, I add, cell phone. Idea what to do. I've got some sort of miracle fetus determined to exist, despite an IUD and a condom. I've got a physically demanding job. I've got no idea how to find Wally. I should find Wally, right? I look vaguely upward and give two middle fingers to the universe that took my mom away when she wasn't too much older than I am now. I know exactly why I was late with my annual exam. It's the same reason I'm late with every annual exam. I don't want the doctor to discover I'm wasting away from the same cervical cancer that took my mom. Never mind the fact that finding it early could help save me. I remember what my mom looked like going through all those treatments. I remember how she writhed in pain, so skinny she said it hurt her bones to lie down. What right do I have to make a baby if I'm just going to die before I can watch her grow up? And who the hell would take care of her? I don't know the first thing about babies, and my dad doesn't need me saddling him with another kid to raise on his own. Although, I guess he's not on his own anymore. He's been pretty serious with Elizabeth for a few years. I grind the heels of my hands into my eyeballs. I have to find Wally. That's the first step. I pull up my phone and call Dakota. Hey, Orla, you feeling better? I heard about the meeting. She cuts right to the point, which I appreciate. World's better. It wasn't anything contagious, but don't tell Liam. I want him to squirm about it a little longer. You're all so mean to each other, she says. I love it. Makes me feel right at home here. She pauses. So what can I do for you? I take a breath. Something about the Sheffield project just isn't sitting right with me. I want some closure or something. Ah, join the club. Dakota tells me how all the developers who tried to partner with Sheffield are out millions. He was taking all their money and investing it in some Ponzi scheme, she says. You know, like that famous one on TV where people lost everything? It's one of those situations. What about the company? Wouldn't that be separate from his personal investments? That's just it. She sounds exasperated. He was taking money from everywhere. Personal, company. The whole situation is messed up, Orla. Anyway, the company's bankrupt. Totally dissolved. All contracts and payments canceled. We're just lucky we never got past the assessment stage. Didn't Uncle Mick know that guy? He's usually not fooled by bullshitters. Dunno. That's more a question for him or your dad, probably. Yeah. 
I take a swig from my water bottle. The more I hydrate, the more I remember that I'm starving. I'll ask him, I guess. You got any contact info for the Sheffield Sun? Hmm. I can hear her clicking around, searching her computer. Sorry. Bunch of dead ends even our collections firm couldn't unearth. Stupid Wally, I mutter. Who builds a keto bakery anyway? I hang up with Dakota more confused than ever. How can I get involved with a man whose family is under scrutiny for being thieving crooks? I work for a family business. It's pretty obvious Wally would have known what his father was up to. Who knows? The bakery project could have been planned as a front for their swindles. I don't think I want anyone like that involved in my life. I mean, what kind of father would he turn out to be? Whatever I do, I can do it alone. Check that. I'm never alone. Not really. Team Brady sticks together. I think about how my dad and uncle moved in together to join forces when their lives fell apart, how I grew up with three cousins that are more like brothers, and how each of them now has a stable relationship. I sigh. I recall how I helped intervene when my cousins were having problems with their girlfriends. I'm no different from them, all up in each other's armpits. I wouldn't be saddling anyone with anything. If anything happens, there will be at least six Bradys waiting in the wings to get involved. I think back to something Dr. Andrews said the first time we met. She was explaining the female reproductive system to me properly, filling in the giant gaps left by public school health class and a house full of brothers. All the eggs in your ovaries have been in there since you were in your mother's womb, she said. That means if you decide to have children, the egg that grows into your baby will have been inside your mother, too. She's part of you, and you are a part of her, Orla. Your bodies know each other. I start to cry, clutching at my stomach. Half this bundle of cells is a clump of DNA that my mother grew, a part of her, in me. I've spent years afraid she passed her cancer on to me. But all signs and tests indicate that she did not. What she did give me was a tiny egg that, despite all odds and without anyone's permission, has fertilized. I drive home, resolved. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to have a baby. It's twilight by the time we finish. Mark slams the sliding door of the van shut and turns toward me. You drink at least two Gatorades tonight, Sheffield, and show up tomorrow ready to pick up the pace. I am not missing Jeopardy two nights in a row. Yes, sir, I tell him, tipping the sports drink into my mouth with one hand and giving him a thumbs up. I strip off my shirt and drape a towel over the seat of my car before I head home. I learned a few days ago that my sweat leaves white rings on my leather interior, and I haven't gotten around yet to figuring out where to go for regular detailing. I finished up my list of bills and got them all in my name, but I've been so exhausted from work I haven't had time to branch out to other basic maintenance stuff. I found out my dad's assistant at work had been taking care of everything for our family, literally everything. When there was no money left to offer her a severance when we dissolved the company, I had to ask her how to cut herself a check from my trust fund. The face she made when I asked that? I'd like to never cause someone to make that sort of face ever again. I'm working on being less useless. When I get out of the car, I see a flash of something tan in my front yard, which reminds me to figure out who deals with my yard. As I'm adding yard to my checklist app, I see the flash again. Limping a bit since my muscles seized during the drive home, I make my way toward the thing. It's an animal, obviously struggling. I crouch down beside it, my leg muscles screaming. It's some sort of furry mammal, and it seems to be panting. It's super hot. I'm practically panting, and I had the air conditioner on. You thirsty, little guy? This is something I relate to. I take the cap off my water jug and pour a few drops in the small disc. The critter sticks out its tongue a few times, but starts sneezing and then it sort of sags back into panting mode. This animal, I'm pretty sure it's a rabbit, is suffering. I feel panic rising inside my chest again as I watch it struggle. 
I remember the feeling immediately after my father died of total inadequacy, much more acute than my lifelong feeling of general inadequacy. When Dad died, there were important things to be done, and I had no ability to do them. Right, I say. I'm not going to be useless again. I can figure this out. The rabbit turns its head again toward the little disk of water. I take three long, deep breaths as I stroke its head and think. I know the phrase animal control only because I run into those guys out on the job, mostly in neighborhoods with vacant lots. I find them trapping feral dogs or groundhogs. Based on my conversations with them, I figure animal control would euthanize this critter. Back on one of the routes I did a few days ago, there was a house where I delivered three huge boxes of hay. Before that, I didn't even know hay came in boxes or why anyone would mail it. But as I was heaving the last one onto the porch, the woman came out to thank me. What's up with all this anyway? I asked. I foster animals, she said. They eat the hay? At the time, I remember thinking I wish she would drive her ass to a hay barn instead of making me deal with the boxes. But now I figure she's my best shot at knowing what to do. I just have to remember which house was hers. I scoop up the rabbit and wrap it in the towel I'd been using to mop up my sweat. I stick him on the floor of the passenger seat and make my way back to Lawrenceville. When I get to the lady's street, I start driving slowly and then laugh at myself because her house is obvious. The porch is full of bags of dog food and pet carriers. She'll know what to do, I repeat to my furry friend. She can help. I pick him up and nuzzle him against my chest, only then realizing that I'm not wearing a shirt but I'm still wearing my work shorts and ridiculous black non-slip shoes. Whatever. I inhale, hold my breath, and wrap the bunny-shaped door knocker. The woman with the graying hair and the bright smile answers the door. Yes? I instinctively pep the rabbit a few times before I stutter out. I found this, and it's sick, and I didn't know what else to do. Her face changes, and she reaches for the rabbit. Oh, baby she says to the bunny. Then she looks at me. You are smart to bring him here. Come inside. Feeling good about my choices, I follow her in through a series of rooms where, instead of furniture, she's got large pens full of rabbits and dogs and... Is that a pig? Mm-hmm. She doesn't look up from the rabbit as she sits at her table. She massages his belly and looks into his eyes. I'm going to take his temperature. Are you a vet? She shakes her head. I've been doing this a long time. I can do all the basic first aid. You're lucky today's Tuesday, though. She sighs. I think this little guy needs the vet, and this is one of the days he is open late. She makes a hurried phone call and writes down an address. And then she looks at me strangely. Do you have a shirt? I'm taken aback by the question. Uh, well, a dirty one, but sure. Okay, good. You're going to drive to this address right now. They're expecting you. She walks out to the porch and grabs a pet carrier and eases in my furry, tan friend with a kiss to his head. She taps the roof of the carrier. This is the information for our rescue. If you call this number, I'll answer. Any time. Uh, you're not going to take the rabbit? Can you not take care of the rabbit? I shake my head. I found him, I remind her. In the yard, outside. He looked sick, so I just picked him up. I see. She taps her chin and looks around the house. I think she's assessing whether there's space for another pen here. It looks pretty crowded. Plus, this little guy seems like he really might be pretty sick. I mean, I guess I could take care of him for a little... I can tell that's the right thing to say, because she beams. Where are you parked? I'll carry the rabbit, and you carry the supplies. You'll need some basics after you leave the vet. Ten minutes later... I'm racing toward the vet my new friend Susan calls the Rabbit Whisperer. My sleek little car is full of hay and pellets and litter, because apparently rabbits use litter boxes. I feel a little euphoric knowing I did something right in taking this animal to see Susan. My little friend is still sneezing in the carrier beside me, although Susan got him to eat a little bit of mushed-up lettuce. Don't worry, dude, I tell him. We're going to figure this out. Talk that passes the time. I bite into a pomegranate seed and realize the hard center isn't for eating, 
I'm working on spitting it all into a napkin when Sam and Maddie start tugging me into the back room so we can get started. Once a month or so, we all meet here to talk about our goals, brainstorm, and smash the patriarchy. Juniper Jones leaned on Foof to get through two elections for judge. My cousin Cal's girlfriend, Logan, transformed her career when she met Foof. Logan works for Sam now, and the two of them are pretty much taking over the tech world and venture capitalism, whatever that means. I usually don't have much to say here, other than last month grumbling about getting stiffed on that consult payment. I feel nervous about telling them I'm pregnant. We don't usually talk about domestic stuff here. We're friends, and definitely talk to each other about dating and stuff. But these meetings are usually about our life goals. It feels somehow inappropriate to bring up this little detour I'm taking, but I remind myself that this is why I came here, to seek their advice. Who wants to get us started today? Sam asks, gesturing a manicured hand around the room. Nobody moves. I feel myself getting hot, my breath coming faster. If I don't spill my guts now, I'll either puke on the couch or chicken out. Me. I'll go. I slam my drink down on Esther's antique table and adjust my posture on the velvet fainting couch she's got set up in here. The whole place has a speakeasy feel, and I love that Foof meets in here with the echoes of that era where women throughout America started cutting off their hair and stepping up into the workforce. Sam smiles and sits down, shaking out her hair. I pick the drink back up and finish it, and then I remember that it doesn't have any alcohol in it. Oh well. So, I start, and then I stare down at the pomegranate seeds. My doctor suggested an app that messages me each week to say how big the baby is, comparing it to fruits and vegetables as it grows. My six-week surprise is currently the size of one of these. I blow out a breath. I've decided to have a baby, I tell them. On my own. Chloe, a romance writer and helpless romantic, claps her hands. Oh, are you going to a sperm bank? Can we help pick your donor? Esther raises a brow at her, and she puts her hands in her lap. So I'm already past that part, I explain. I reach into my glass and pick up a seed. I stare at it in my hand. This is about how far I am into the process. Maddie and Nicole and Logan look like they're going to explode. None of them has said a word yet. I look them in the eye as I continue. I haven't told my family yet. Right now, my big thing is panicking, because I have no idea how to be someone's mother. Still, nobody says a word. I have managed to shock Foof into silence, which is really saying something, especially from Nicole. Orla Brady. Nicole walks over to me and grips my thigh with a firm hand. You will be an amazing mother. You're an amazing woman, and you have an amazing group of friends. Yep, Maddie nods and sips at her own drink. As the others murmur agreement around me, I fall to pieces. They know my mother died when I was young, and that I was raised by wolves. Orla, I want you to look at me. Maddie puts her hands on my shoulders. I came to this family when I was a total mess, remember? I was unemployed and homeless, and Team Brady took me in. You've got a lot of support here. Yeah, but my cousin also impregnated you and made your life even messier than it was. I dab at my face with the napkin. What I'm saying is your family did a terrific job with you, and I see no reason why you won't be the most amazing mom to this little pomegranate seed. And I'll get to be Aunt Maddie. I'm going to be an amazing aunt. Ooh, shit, yes, I'm going to be Auntie Nick. Nicole makes a face like a cartoon villain. She always knows how to make me laugh. You all really think I can be decent at this? It's not quantifiable, and there aren't clear objectives. I do better with clear objectives. Sam and Esther laugh. Orla, you can dismantle your naysayers with a glance. You ran the Boston Marathon twice. Three times, I interrupt her. See, this baby will have no choice but to worship you. The other women nod. Juniper leans forward and points a finger at me. Motherhood is hard as hell. You can always call us to help correct you when you're doubting yourself. Yep, 
Maddie and Emma nod aggressively. I moan a little bit and suck in a breath. I don't want to be here talking about personal crap when you're all here for career support. I cry a little harder now, and Samantha makes a surprised face. Oh, Orla. I'm sorry if we gave you the impression that your personal goals are somehow less valid than your professional goals. She clutches at her chest. Fresh out of fucks is about letting go of the pressures that keep us back from reaching our dreams. Whatever those dreams are. If you're struggling with how to be a mom, then we're here to help you overcome your blockage. She looks over to Juniper and Emma and Maddie, our resident moms. Can I say blockage in this context? Maddie holds up an index finger. If you're constipated already, you can have some of my colace. I've also got some Miralax, Emma adds. It's good to have options. You assholes are offering laxatives? I sniff, crying a little, and Chloe hands me a napkin. Somehow that offer sends me over the edge into full-out sobs. Everyone gets up and hugs me until we're a huge octopus of strong arms, squeezing. Listen, Juniper bangs an imaginary gavel on the table. I know you think this is less important than your other concerns, but you need to give fucks about your bowel management tools for pregnancy. Trust me, this is helpful advice. The ice broken, I reveal my deepest fears to them that I'll struggle with guiding a child toward adulthood when I barely know what I'm doing outside of work. What if the kid doesn't know how to make friends? I don't know how to make friends. Don't look at me like that, Nicole. I only met you because you started banging my cousin. I take one of those shuddering post-cry breaths. I actually do feel better just saying all that stuff out loud. Nicole just shrugs. Well, if your kid can't make friends... They'll just be friends with Maddie's kid, Emma nods. And you're connected enough to my family. You can just drop your kid at stag functions and they'll blend right in. We might not even notice another one hanging around. Juniper laughs at that. The two of them are married to Nicole's boss's brothers. We do sometimes have Brady's stag combination family dinners. And it's true that there's always a million kids at those. But shouldn't I know how to teach these things? On my own? Maddie and Emma exchange a glance and then look at me. Maddie tilts her head to the side. Why would you have to do anything on your own, Orla? You have us. I feel something snap inside. Maybe it's my sanity. I start crying again at her words. I don't want to be a burden on anyone, I whimper. Oh my God, Orla. Foof converges on me in another giant hug. You are not a burden. We all rely on each other. I'm not even sure whose voice is offering reassurance or if they're taking turns. All I know is that they start ordering me to rely on them. And the thought is terrifying. ...and gives me a hug. And it feels so warm and safe. She doesn't cringe at the smell of me, which I think must be some Herculean sign of strength. I came right here from my shift. I can't imagine how much I must be stinking up the clinic. I know it's scary when the little ones are sick, Rita says. Do you know where you're taking him next? Which foster family? I shake my head rapidly. I hadn't considered giving him to someone else, especially now that I know he's having a heart attack. I don't know anything, I tell her. I start breathing rapidly through my nose, feeling like the room is suddenly hot and getting smaller. Susan gave me a pen and hay and things. Hey, she tells me, patting my shoulders soothingly. It's an unfamiliar feeling for me, and I snap my head to the side, staring at her. We'll figure this out, okay? Do you want the bun? I nod before I can think twice about it. I feel a gut reaction like it's necessary to care for this little rabbit, even if I barely know how to care for myself. I feel like I have to prevent some other creature from dying of a heart attack, which doesn't make any sense because I can't summon any strong feelings about my father dying. I mostly feel like I have to take responsibility for something and have it work out okay. Rita pats my arm again. Okay, well then it's your bun. Simple as that. 
but I don't know anything about taking care of him. The panic starts to seep in again, and I whip my head over to the exam table, where the vet is bent over the rabbit, muttering softly to Stacy. Rita waves a hand. We'll help you with all that. What's your email? I can send you our handbook. And you've got Susan's phone number. You just call her any time, and she'll talk you down from the ledge. In a few minutes, Rita manages to not only distract me from whatever is going on with the rabbit, but she's also got me in an online group for rabbit volunteers, and she typed a bunch of rabbit lady phone numbers into my cell. It's like you've got five new moms, Walt, she tells me, smiling more warmly than my mother ever has. Stacy and Dr. Roberts beckon for me to approach, and they explain that the rabbit is in congestive heart failure. You're going to give him a diuretic and another heart medication twice a day, Stacy says, as Dr. Robert pats my rabbit and moves on to another patient. We just had to clear a lot of fluid from this little guy's lungs. Poor thing. She strokes him gently between the ears, and his little nose moves up and down a few times. How do I... give medicine to a rabbit? She smiles. Total beginner, huh? Well, the good news is you can mix it all into some food for him. She hands me a sack of green powder and tells me to mix a little bit with water twice a day and sprinkle the meds on top. You're going to use a pill cutter. Like for old people? I remember watching my grandfather's housekeeper slice his blood thinners. Yep, like for old people. She shakes open a shopping bag and starts loading in the powder and pills and a pill cutter stamped with the veterinary practice logo. We work together to slide the bunny back into his carrier, and she tells me to make sure he has a few bowls of water available in his pen overnight. And you want to take a cardboard box and cut two holes in it. He'll want to go in there and hide a lot of the time, she tells me. I slide my credit card to the receptionist and wave to Rita, who shouts for me to call her in the morning with an update. And then I'm in my car, alone with my new pet rabbit. I run a shaking hand through my hair, staring. I've never held anything so fragile, never been needed like this. I realize I've spent most of my life feeling like a hindrance. Even at my new job, I'm a pain in Mark's ass. But right now, I'm all this little guy has. I carry him inside my air-conditioned townhouse and set him down before I run back out to the car for his gear. I get everything set up in the living room where I can keep an eye on him easily, and then I lie down on the floor next to him, inside the opening to the pen. I spread out the hay like Rita suggested, and then I wait. I breathe slowly and wait, wondering if I've done enough, if I got myself in over my head, if I'm hurting this rabbit by not knowing more about how to care for him. I wait, and I pet him gently, and wait some more. After an eternity, the little dude opens his eyes, hops towards me, and starts licking my hand. Chapter 12 Orla September I puke every day now, sometimes twice. Like Maddie, I keep a stash of snacks on my person at all times. I consider asking her to borrow some of her fanny packs, but I feel bad since she gave me all her maternity clothes and stool softeners already. Dad keeps sending me home from work if he catches me puking, which is super annoying because I'm starting to chew through all my sick time, and I need to save that for when the baby arrives. I still haven't told my dad, which means the foof ladies can't tell my cousins. So then I feel even worse for making everyone cling to this huge secret. Yet I keep stalling. Foof have not asked about the paternity of this wee bundle, but my dad will, and I don't know yet what I'll say to him. Every few days, I look up the Sheffield family again and immediately regret it. Sometimes I find a Yelp review of one of their businesses, where former employees lambast them for failing to pay contracts. Sometimes I find gross pictures of Wally's dad with his arm around politicians who have since been revealed as sexual harassers. I decide to stop looking them up. This baby will be all Brady. As soon as I tell everyone. Dr. Andrews says, Everything looks right as rain in my body. She hooked me up with some classes I can take online to learn about delivery, and she sent me a binder of information about breastfeeding. I'll read it all eventually, 
as soon as I tell my dad I'm pregnant. I'm almost out of the first trimester when Dr. Andrews promises I will stop puking and start feeling like myself again, except with a lichen attached. Today I can't seem to keep down any breakfast, but I really don't want to be late for work, so I just ignore the competing sensations of hunger and nausea. It's warmer than usual for September, and I tie my flannel around my waist as I survey the progress on the sinkhole project downtown. I found a kick-ass team of female electrical engineering student interns for this semester and brought them with me to the job site to check out the repaired wiring as it integrates with the repaired plumbing and gas lines. My whole team stands down in the pit, taking notes while I snap some photos for our project file. Who knew all this was right below the surface of the street, I say. We're just about ready for the next phase, when crews are going to fill the sinkhole. My cousin Zach is geeking out over the plastic balls they're using as filler to increase strength and stability around the area of the sinkhole. Did you know these little guys are made from leftover plastic from kayak production? He tosses a few spheres in the air. My interns shake their heads. Zach grins. Not only will this save money, but we're using way less concrete. I roll my eyes at him. That's all well and good, bro, but these scholars are here to learn about amps and ohms. I beckon them over to the deepest part of the sinkhole, and we review the connections and casings until my dad pokes his head over the pit and tells us it's time for lunch. Something about the combination of smells from road tar and sewer gas has my stomach in turmoil, so I skip the sub sandwiches and spend the hour fantasizing about acing my professional exams. If I can take them this winter, I should be able to get everything done before the baby is born. I'm still a little bit shy of my required supervised hours, but I can start studying for the test a while. I absorb the material more easily while I'm actively working on those projects anyway. I love the thrill of working on complex electrical engineering projects. I love the mathematical formulas that just click in my mind. The ways I can apply them to make lights turn on and motors spark to life without overheating their wires. It seems like I should feel timid or tamp down my joy and comfort at this, but engineering just comes naturally to me. And engineering is badass. I just reconstructed the power grid inside a giant hole that nearly swallowed a bus in Pittsburgh. I did it while mentoring student engineers. So why the hell am I having such a hard time telling my dad about what's going on in my womb? After lunch, the interns hop a bus back to their campus, and I huddle with Zach and Liam to coordinate across our disciplines. Another great aspect of Zach's bubble-filled concrete plan is that it makes it easier to drill down to the pipes and wires if we encounter a problem in the future. The sun comes out in force, and I feel sweat gathering in my elbow pits while we look over the plans. We're not starting a pour today, are we? I look up at the sky, noting that the light has shifted. It's got to be near quitting time for the concrete crews. Nah, Liam says, waving his hand. They like an early start anyhow. I think we can wrap up here today and plan for tomorrow to be poor day. We start to climb the ladder out of the sinkhole, and my sweaty hand slips a little on the metal rung. Easy there, cuz, Liam says, placing his palm on my back to steady me. His hand feels uncomfortably warm, and I try to swat him away as I resume climbing, but I can't seem to get a grip on the ladder. I reach up to grasp the lip of the sinkhole to pull myself up, but my legs are unsteady. Hey, Kel, a little help? I hear my cousins shouting for my dad, which pisses me off. I am perfectly capable of climbing out of a sinkhole, I shout at them. Only my mouth doesn't seem to be working properly, and I hear my words coming out all blurred together. Ah, oh, hell, I say as my dad grips me by the upper arm and hoists me to my feet. My knees immediately buckle, and when I open my eyes, I'm sitting in the back of an ambulance, which is parked by the sinkhole. Jesus, Dad, an ambulance? He frowns at me. This is protocol, Orla. You think I wouldn't follow protocol if any Beltane employee suffered a medical episode on a job site? The paramedic shines a light in my eye, and I instinctively swat at him. Sorry, 
I tell him when my dad frowns at me, but really, I'm fine. Did you eat today, Ms. Brady? A second paramedic appears with a clipboard and a pen, while the first guy hooks up a blood pressure cuff to my arm. Are you taking any medication? I sigh. Yes, I ate. No pills apart from vitamins. It's just hot out here. Actually, she didn't eat lunch. My cousin Liam's head appears over my dad's shoulder. I saw you spending your lunch break studying, and Uncle Kel said I could eat your sub. He shrugs. I roll my eyes. Okay, fine. I skipped lunch. The paramedic jots down notes on the clipboard. Can we have any privacy at all? Just this once? This is embarrassing enough. I glare at my cousins, relieved that at least my interns have gone home for the day. If I'm going to faint climbing out of a pit, at least it's just my family members here to witness it. Ms. Brady, is there any chance you might be pregnant? The first paramedic shouts a blood pressure reading to the clipboard guy and looks into my eyes. And there it is. There was the moment before this, and then there's now, when I have to admit in front of my father that I'm knocked up. Sure, I could send him away before I answer, but if the answer is that I'm not pregnant, I'd just say so with him standing here and he knows it. An eternity passes while both paramedics poke and prod me with their blue-gloved hands. It's a standard question. Ms. Brady? I sigh. Dad's eyes bulge. I tug at the neckline of my tank top. Can I have some water? Clipboard guy nods and uncaps a plastic bottle of water, handing it to me. It's ice cold and feels good. I start to gulp it down involuntarily. I thought I at least drank water during lunch, but apparently not. I can feel my pores opening up in relief as the water works its way through my body. Almost as soon as I gulp down the bottle, I lean forward and puke it all back up on the street behind the ambulance. I reach for my shirt to dab at my mouth as the paramedic clicks his pen open and closed, waiting for me to answer. Yes, I say not looking up. Yes, I'm pregnant. Everyone zooms into action. The first paramedic grabs his radio and says, This is Unit 36. We're bringing in a pregnant female, dehydrated. We will administer IV fluids in the rig. Over. No, I say. I'm not going to the hospital. I just fainted. I've been puking. I'm fine. The clipboard paramedic starts buckling me into the gurney in the back of the truck. This is protocol, ma'am. Please don't call me ma'am, I mutter as he reaches for my arm and sticks a needle in so deftly I barely feel it. He hooks up a bag of saline, and I can immediately feel the liquid coursing through my parched body. I must have been really dehydrated, which makes sense. I sigh again and notice that my dad looks like it's his turn to faint. He climbs into the back of the ambulance just as the first paramedic closes the doors. I'm spared having to talk to him, because the driver turns on the siren, and it's so loud I sit with my hands over my ears as we rock along the bumpy streets toward the hospital. We pull up to the emergency department, and both paramedics haul the gurney out of the ambulance with surprising skill. I felt that less than the potholes, I tell them as they start wheeling me through the door. I don't bother telling them I can walk, and I don't bother suggesting that my dad stay in the waiting room. He clings to the rail on the side of the gurney until his knuckles are white, clenching his jaw and staring at me without blinking. Even his beard looks worried. Once I'm parked in an exam room waiting for the doctor, alone with my dad, he clears his throat. When were you going to tell me? I was going to get there eventually, Dad. I just... Haven't figured out what to say yet. Why don't you try something now? I can't tell if he's angry at me or scared or both. I lick my lips and look up at the saline bag. I really do feel worlds better now that that thing is almost empty. I wonder briefly why I'm not puking up the fluids from the bag. But then I remember that these bypassed my stomach. I briefly consider asking for a take-home IV bag for days when I'm particularly pukey. Orla. Dad's voice hitches, and I worry he might start to cry. So, I tell him, reaching for his hand. He squeezes mine. 
His palms feel cold, which actually feels nice. I'm pregnant, and I'm going to do this thing, and the guy isn't in the picture, and I don't want him to be. I add this last bit, emphatically, squeezing my dad's hand. All right, he says, swallowing. You're in charge, Orla Bear. Tell me how to respond here. If you're worried, I want to reassure you. If you're excited, I'm going to be over the moon with you. Tell me what you need. I look away from him like I always do when I feel something big and huge. Because of course he had to go and say the right thing and turn my insides to mush. I feel a giant ball in my throat as I work to choke down all the emotions I practice shoving aside every day. I consider the vomiting and turmoil of the past few weeks, but then I look at my dad's eyes, glittering with moisture and love and utmost support. I'm terrified, I tell him, and super uncomfortable, but I'm leaning toward excited, I guess. He climbs onto the gurney and wraps me in his arms, kissing the top of my head and laugh crying until I start crying. Eventually, we pull apart and he sits back in the chair, still holding my hand. My baby is having a baby. I know, Dad. And then I start crying in earnest, giant heaving sobs I've been holding in. I'm not sure how long I cry but I feel my dad's strong arms around me, hear his voice whispering that he's here, that he supports me, that I can do anything I want to do. Eventually, I look up at him, and he says, Can I make a suggestion? Obviously, it's your call. Sure, Dad. As long as it's not finding another line of work. He frowns. I would never say that, and you know it. I nod. No. What I was thinking was, I've been spending most of my nights at Elizabeth's house. Dad, I don't want to hear about that. He cracks a smile. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that she's not going to move again, not until Jake starts college. She wants her son to have stability. And my house isn't really big enough for both of them to move in. We both need access to office space. Are you telling me you want to shack up with your girlfriend? Maybe build a bridge across the street between your two houses? He ruffles my hair like I'm still a small kid with a bowl cut. Well, yes, I want to shack up with Beth, as you say. But what if, what if you moved into my house? He ducks his head so it's level with mine and meets my gaze. It's paid for. I wouldn't charge you rent. I'm not going to freeload off you, Dad. He waves his hands in the air. You could pay the property taxes and utilities. What I mostly mean is, with me and Beth across the street, you'd have support. We're literally across the street, but there's no bridge. We wouldn't come over unless you expressly invited us, so you'd have privacy. I do like privacy. He nods. I know it. And I don't want to sound preachy, darling. But you're going to need help the first few months. Babies just suck all the energy out of their adults. I recall when Arlen was born, and Liam told me he and Maddie hadn't slept more than 90 minutes at a time for weeks. I sort of thought he was exaggerating. Dad keeps talking. Beth and I were thrilled to help hold Arlen so Maddie could get some rest. Just imagine how delighted I'll be to snuggle a little Brady bean of yours, Orla. He claps his hands then and makes a squeaking sound. My baby with a baby. Something about his facial expression and his kindness and the reality of what's about to happen sends me over the edge. I start sobbing again. Oh, honey, Dad says. He wraps his long arms around me again, holding me tight. I snot and sob against his shirt.
Just let it out, he says. I'm right here. I have no idea what I'm doing, I wail, making actual boo-hoo sounds as I cry on to my father. All the rash decisions and denial of the past few months, catching up to me at once. I don't know how to be a mom. Hey, he says, lifting up my chin with his hand and resting his forehead against mine. You had the world's best mom for ten years. You do know how to be a mom. And better still, you contain all the very best parts of your mother. A tear wells up in the corner of his eye and rolls slowly down his cheek. He doesn't brush it away. That has to count for something, right? Before I can nod or respond, the doctor finally comes into the room, complete with clipboard and frown. What seems to be the trouble here? He looks at my dad wedged into the bed beside me, stroking my hair. No trouble, I tell him wiping my face on the flannel shirt still tied around my waist. I was just telling my dad, he's going to be a grampy. Brady today? There isn't a first name on any of the mail. Her whole family must hate me. I know we fucked over their family firm and that job, but they'll have to take a number if they're looking for a pound of my father's flesh. I don't even know what makes me think the word flesh, but as soon as I do... I remember Orla's thighs again. God, the length of her legs. I never even saw her fully nude. But what I did get to see has been the stuff of all my fantasies since. I pause at my truck and take a long drink of water. I check in on Pud, who is napping in a beam of sunshine on my living room floor. I stare again at the letter. Brady. I close up the truck and head toward the porch steps, Startling when someone opens the front door just as I'm reaching for the lid of the mailbox. Oh! A woman shouts. Time stops. It seems like it's Orla, but this woman is pregnant. She has a tiny round basketball jutting out the front of her body, highlighted by the tight cotton dress she wears with just a pair of flip-flops. I can't imagine Orla wearing something like that on a workday. Even though I fucked her in her bridesmaid's dress, I always fantasize about her in jeans and plaid shirt and hard hat. I don't want her to see me, to remember and think about what my family has done to hers. Sorry, I mutter, turning to walk back down the steps, onto the neighbor's sidewalk, and on back into oblivion. Wally? She grips the porch railing and shouts my name. I stop with my back to her, certain that if I turn around, my life will crackle into flames again. Chapter 14 Orla He turns around slowly, and we make eye contact. I hadn't considered that I'd ever run into him in person, which I realize is stupid because we live in the same city and Pittsburgh isn't all that big. But why is he dressed like a mailman? Is it you? Did you come here? I instinctively rub my stomach, which makes me roll my eyes at myself, because I feel like a cliché. But I recently started feeling this little bird wriggle around in there, and I frequently find myself clutching at my new shape. He clears his throat. Just, uh, bringing you the mail. He shrugs and gestures at the truck. I look at the mailbox, open the lid, and see a letter nestled in there. I pull it out and bring the corner to my lip, and then remember that might be Jeremy and tuck it under my arm. Did something happen to Peggy? You're not usually the mailman on this street, I tell him, cringing at how bitchy that sounds. I remind myself that he doesn't know he's the father of this child. He has no idea. He's apparently undergone some sort of career shift and is carrying out his business like nothing happened. But then I remember that his father died, and I feel like an asshole again. I'm still pretty new, he says with a shrug. I cover people's vacations. Peggy is leaf-peeping in New England with another carrier from our station, but nobody's supposed to know they're together. I won't tell a soul, I say leaning back against the closed door to my house. 
I don't know why I like that he revealed this bit of information, this slice of personal intel that makes Peggy a real person in my mind, rather than just the woman who delivers my mail. Or did. Now apparently I've got Wally doing that. He clicks his teeth and looks up the street like he needs to get a move on. But he doesn't budge. Hey, I say quietly with all the warmth I can muster. I'm really sorry you lost your dad. He nods. Thank you. He looks off to the side again like he doesn't want to talk about this, at least not with me. My heart starts racing a little as I realize the enormity of this. I'm talking to my baby's biological father, who doesn't know that he has a half-baked child. I swallow. So, um, you know, I know what it's like to lose a parent. His face changes. You do? I nod. My mom died of cancer when I was just a kid. My dad lives across the street just there. I point to the house where he and Elizabeth are probably drinking coffee and staring out the window at me chatting up the mailman. I don't know why I told him where my father lives. I clear my throat. So, yeah. Let me know if you ever want to talk about that or anything. Like I said, I've been there, and I know it sucks. I hated my father, he says, his eyes flashing ice blue. I nod. I never said that before. To anyone. He lets out a long breath. Parent loss is a huge deal. It's all really complicated, I tell him. People don't get it at all unless they've been there. Like, even my dad? He lost his wife, sure. But his parents were still around until really recently. He never had to walk around wondering what his mom would do in this or that situation. So, yeah, I can talk to you about it. If you need to vent. I'm rambling now, so I chew on my lip and try to stop myself. Wally nods a few times. I'd really like that. Orla fucking Brady, he says, grinning. His whole face shifts when he smiles. I forgot I told him to call me that. I laugh. He points at my stomach. I understand if you have obligations, but I'd really like to grab coffee and... talk about dead parents. That makes me bark out a laugh. Sounds like a grand time. We can talk about urn pricing while we're at it, and prepaid cremation. I'm trying to get my mom to do that now, he says, bringing a hand up to scratch at the back of his neck. His mailman shirt lifts up when he does, and my eyes widen when I catch a glimpse of his abs. Can I give you my number to set up the coffee? I stare at him for a bit and then nod. I watch as he reaches into his shirt pocket and pulls out a pen, scribbling down his number on someone's junk mail, and then springing back up the stairs toward me to hand it over. Our fingers touch as he does, and I feel a wave of heat move through me. Everything Dr. Andrews said about the second trimester comes true all at once. I feel horny and nauseous and energetic all at once, and I have to cling to the porch railing so I don't leap down the steps into Wally's arms and demand that he take me to his mail truck and fuck me again. I hope you call, he says with a small smile, and I can see how vulnerable he is in this moment, how utterly changed he is from the fucker who threw gross pickup lines at me at Nicole and Zach's wedding. I will, I tell him and I watch as he makes his way down the next few houses before circling back to his mail truck to refill his sack. He gives me a salute as he starts whistling along down the block. Who was that? My dad's voice startles me, and I look up to see him jogging across the street, carrying his briefcase. Oh, the mailman, I tell him. He's covering for Peggy. She's in New England. Nice time of year for it, my dad says. He peers over my shoulder. You're not unpacking the heavy boxes by yourself, are you? I shake my head. I am now fully moved out of my apartment and fully moved back into my father's house. Only I've been sleeping in his former room and we're setting up a crib in mine. It all feels super strange still. But I definitely agree with Dad that this was a nice plan. My friends are coming over tomorrow for an unpackathon. Maddie's even bringing Arlen so we can let him toddle around and show us where I need to baby-proof. Dad beams. Excellent. 
That's really terrific, sweetie. You coming in today? I shake my head. Thought I'd study from home if that's all right? He laughs. I'll check with the boss. Dad and Uncle Mick always let their P.E. candidates study for their exams while on the clock at Beltane. They don't usually allow for remote work, and I try not to take advantage, but I really can make more efficient use of my time if I put in all my study hours at home and then schedule my doctor visits in the afternoon. You coming across the street for family dinner later? Dad hooks a thumb over his shoulder toward his new house. Elizabeth is making ginger meatballs. Is that even a thing? Apparently, they're very good with pineapple and teriyaki sauce. Dad pulls me in for a hug and kisses me on the cheek. Then he boops me on the nose, and I punch him in the shoulder. He pretends it hurts, and I punch the other side. All right, all right. See you at six, though. Wouldn't miss it, I tell him. And then I text Wally my number before I head inside. Body has firmed up since I got my mail carrier job, but it was kind of weird to be felt up by women twice my age. Thanks for staying a little later for me. I set Pudding's carrier on the check-in table. Are you kidding? We'd do anything for you two. Rita sticks a finger through the grate on Pud's carrier, greeting him. You want a snack while we get him situated? Well, I happily reach toward the snack tray. I always want food. You know that about me, Rita. But I'd also really like to come and see, just so I know what to do if I ever have to do the grooming stuff myself. Is this guy for real? A woman starts fanning herself. What an amazing bun, Dad. I shrug. I try. It feels like a line. A few months ago, it would have been the start of a series of lines. But today it's true. I am trying. I want to take care of this guy. I want to be amazing for someone else to help them thrive. Even if that someone else is a furry little rabbit. A woman in a green apron named Cheryl shouts that Pudding is next as soon as she finishes with Archie, a little lop on her lap. I start to feel anxious, like I always do when Pudding needs medical care. Not that grooming counts as medical care. I'm just always afraid I'm messing up and not giving him the things he needs. I inhale most of the snacks left on the tray until Cheryl says she's ready for Pudding. You can go and socialize if you want, she says, kissing the top of his head. We've got this. Oh, I don't want to leave him, I tell her. She arches a brow. Go on and gossip, she says. Let me cuddle this guy and clean him up for you. I eventually shrug and pick up the snacks. I spot Susan combing a rabbit and wander over toward her. Hey, I say, trying to check the enthusiasm in my voice when I realize I sound like a kid in line for a roller coaster. Walt! Her whole face smiles when she sees me, and she picks up the rabbit's front foot to wave at me like they're both saying hello. I crouch down and greet them both. Susan has some parsley in her pocket, and we both smile when the bunny discovers it and pulls it out with his teeth as she resumes trimming his nails. Haven't seen you in action for a while? Oh, they've been moving me to different neighborhoods. I lean in close as she parts the fur on the rabbit's front paw, revealing a tiny little nail in the back. Do they all have a nail there? She nods. Lots of people forget that one. I watch as she quickly snips the rest of his nails and looks in his ears. Rita says you're helping out at bingo night? I grin. I never did anything like that before, but it sounds fun. Susan raises her eyebrows. You should bring a friend. Double up the number of young people who attend. Ha, <laughs> I'm sure you're all young at heart. I don't know why I brush off her comment like that. Replace it with a line. That's something Trip would do. But I want to be Walt now. I lick my lips and absentmindedly pet the rabbit on Susan's lap. There is someone I'd love to bring. She turns her head, giving me a knowing look. Tell me more. I wave a hand. I don't think... Well, I'm fairly positive there's no hope there. You'll never know if you don't ask. Susan gently places the rabbit into a carrier and stands up, brushing off her lap. I offer her the snack platter, and then we both chuckle because I've eaten everything on it. It's for a good cause. People can't resist a good cause. That's true enough. I agree. We wouldn't want to support Pudding and his pals. Cheryl waves at us from across the room, pointing to Pudding's carrier. I guess he's all done with his spa treatment. 
Susan squeezes my arm. I hope you'll invite your friend to join us. I flush, trying to imagine myself inviting Orla to hang out with me, much less spend an evening playing bingo at an animal rescue fundraiser. But maybe Orla's the kind of person who thinks that sounds like a good time. I make my way through all the remaining rabbit ladies, promising I'll add more pictures to the Facebook group. Where did you come from? Cheryl shakes her head and smiles, patting my shoulder as I make my way toward the door. I shrug. Well, we sure are glad you found us. I drive home, feeling unsettled by the warmth and kindness we just experienced. After a few decades of posturing and one-upmanship, I'm still unaccustomed to people who say what they mean. I think I like these people, I say to Pud, who doesn't respond. Chapter 16 Orla Wally never responds to my text, and I spend way too much time pissed off about it. He's the one who asked me for coffee, wasn't he? Am I making that up? Anyway, he definitely gave me his number. He should respond when a woman texts him. This is why I don't pursue men. I can't handle this kind of emotional purgatory. I remember how he acted when we first met and decide his mailman situation was just a reprieve. Heatstroke must make him act nice or something. By the time I wrap things up at work, I'm so sick of staring at my phone that I turn it off and stomp out to my car. I drive straight home, where I'm supposed to be making an appetizer for family dinner tonight. I pull out my mom's recipe box and smile at her handwriting on the little index cards. Last year, Elizabeth suggested we laminate them to help preserve them, and I'm grateful as I feel a teardrop and watch it splash down on the card at the side of her neat writing in all caps. Even her spinach dip recipe seems to be shouting at me. But what is she shouting about? What would Mom have said if she were here? Would I have gone and gotten knocked up by a stranger at Zack's wedding if Mom were alive? I doubt I would have felt the urge to storm off and avoid everyone if I wasn't a motherless tomboy. I pull the cream cheese out of the fridge to soften and grab some spinach from the freezer, trying to think about something else. That just makes me remember that I'm pissed off at Wally. I grab my phone again and check the message, still no reply. Hello? Wally? What gives? Almost immediately, I see the little dots indicating he's typing something. Huh. So sorry about that, Orla. Work was hectic today. I'd love to get together and talk if you're still open to that. He's so formal. At least he's not trying to be slimy, I guess. When do you take lunch? I can meet up with you wherever. Sigh. I don't get lunch breaks. They literally have a tracking device on my mailbag. So you really are a mailman then? That wasn't like a costume or something? I locate a small pan to put the dip into the oven to heat up, checking my watch. Everyone is going to start pouring into Elizabeth's house soon, and I'll need to get over there with the dip before they eat her houseplants or something. Wally writes back, definitely not a costume. Just call me Mr. McFeely. Are you being gross? No way, Mr. McFeely. From Mr. Rogers? Speedy delivery? I laugh, reading his latest message. I had forgotten about the mailman character on that show. Dad used to put the reruns on for me and my cousins. He loved pointing out the different landmarks around Pittsburgh featured in the episodes. Dad used to buy us all our shoes at the shoe store Fred Rogers visited on the show. I type back to Wally. My bad. I loved that show. Okay, so no lunch break. When's your next day off? No mail on Sundays, right? I decide the dip is warm enough, so I pull it from the oven tuck the bag of bread under my arm, and walk across the street to meet up with my family. Cal opens the door and makes a big show of taking everything out of my hands. You all right? Should I carry you up the steps or something? Jesus, Cal. If you offer to carry me again, I'm going to kick you in the nuts. I'm pregnant, not arthritic. He holds his hands up in surrender. Sorry, cuz. I don't know how to be, you know? Just be regular. 
How were you with Maddie? He shrugs. Regular, I guess? I huff past him with the food, heading toward Elizabeth's kitchen. I roll my eyes when I walk in there to find Dad kissing her as he stirs whatever's cooking on her stovetop. She looks up and smiles. Orla, what have you got there? Spinach dip, I say. Pan's hot. Without a word, she grabs a hot pad and sets it on the counter. I plunk down the dip and bite my lip, trying to decide if I should run my oven mitts back home or just leave them on the counter. They're really Dad's oven mitts anyway. I'm working on getting over feeling like a mooch about this living situation. Elizabeth hustles around, taking the bread from me and setting it out in a basket. Prior to Dad getting with her, we'd probably have just dumped the bread onto a paper plate and all dug in. She definitely has brought a layer of class to our rowdy family dinners. She doesn't even say anything to me about spinach dip not going with teriyaki meatballs. With nothing else to help get ready in the kitchen and no ability to drink alcohol with my cousins, I decide I'm safe pulling my phone out again to check my messages. Wally. Actually, I have to deliver packages Sunday. My work schedule is a real bear. Me. Well, why did you ask to get coffee if you can't? I try not to acknowledge how hurt I'm feeling to be rejected by him. I wasn't even trying to go on a date with him. I literally offered to hang out with him and talk about having a dead parent. I shouldn't be surprised that he's being weird. He's a slime ball. God, that's the last time I reach out to him. The last time. He's a sperm donor. That's it. And he's not even aware that he lent me his demon spawn. I set my phone on top of the oven mitts so I remember to take them home later and look up just as Maddie and Liam arrive with Arlen. Hey! Maddie grins as she shuffles in the door. She's got a million bags dangling from her, and Arlen wriggles around as she tries to hold him with one arm. Liam comes in behind, holding the door with his foot and juggling a gallon of juice and what seems to be the entire snack aisle of the grocery store. Let me take something, I say, rushing over to them. I was thinking they'd hand me a bag, but Maddie flops Arlen onto my shoulder without another word and bustles past me into the kitchen. She washes her hands and hangs up all her bags while nobody seems to notice I'm holding a toddler. Arlen also doesn't seem to notice that he has been plopped onto an inexperienced baby holder. Eventually, he lifts his head and looks at me, realizes I'm not his mother, and starts to shriek. I whip my head toward the kitchen, where my extended family seems not to hear the air horn blasting out of Arlen's windpipe. Cal and Zach are once again fighting over the guacamole my dad set out, and Uncle Mick just skidded in through the garage door. I feel like Arlen is going to burst my eardrums. Hey, buddy, I shout to him, wriggling one of my hands up to cup his cheek. Hey, man, it's me, Aunt Orla. At my touch, he stops screaming abruptly and looks at me. His cheeks are all wet from his tears. Lala? I chuckle. Yeah, man, Lala, what's got you upset? He looks around at the chaos. I expect him to start screaming for his mom or dad, but instead he focuses on my cousins. Cal is now running around the kitchen with the guacamole bowl, huddled low so Zach can't dip his chip. Walk, Arlen says, pointing his fat hand toward my cousins. Yeah, you want some guac? Good plan. I shift his weight so he's on my hip, and I'm surprised to feel how comfortable it is to hold him that way. Like my hip bone is a little seat for his puffy diaper butt. Quack! He shouts again. I nod. I step in Callum's path as he tries to evade Zack, and I duck down just as Cal does. I jut out my hand and grab the guac dish, spinning quickly out of the way as Cal and Zack let out a massive groan. Arlen squeals and slaps his hand directly into the bowl, splashing guacamole onto my face. Both of us laugh as I sink down onto the linoleum. When I look up, the room has gone silent and everyone stares as Arlen smears avocado paste in my hair. Cal squints. We can probably still eat it, right? Only if you can pry it away from Arlen here, I counter. 
I'm interrupted when Arlen sticks a fat finger full of guac into my mouth. Try this, he says, screwing up his face until he looks just like Liam. Eat. Eventually, Arlen's parents pluck him away from me to wash up. I dab myself as clean as I can and settle in around the dining room table. I'm relieved by how much better I feel surrounded by my family. I spent the entire day so stressed out. It's nice to be reminded that I have this gregarious place where everything is all right, even for a little while. That is, if you consider food fights and loud arguments about paint color to be all right. After dinner, my cousins insist I am off the hook for helping with cleanup for at least a year. So I stay seated at the table, eating a brownie and staring at my phone. Literally, everyone else is deeply engaged in conversation about fall baseball, so I don't feel bad checking my messages. Instead of a text, I see I have a voicemail from Wally. Hey, Orla. I'm so sorry about that confusion. This is Walt. Wally. Anyway, I wanted to explain myself a little better. Now I'm doing it over voicemail, and I feel dumb. I do get a day off this week, but I can't grab coffee with you because I already volunteered to help at a charity bingo thing for the animal rescue. Would you want to go? I didn't want to assume anything. Maybe you could come play bingo and we could talk after. I'm happy to pay for your ticket, of course. Also, it's a costumed event, and I was told to wear my mail carrier uniform, but that's not usually a costume for me. I'm a real mailman. God, this is so lame. Please call me back and tell me to get lost. I stare at my phone, stunned by that message. It was so... real. Wally is never what I expect, which is really unsettling for me. I like knowing what I'm getting into, and a costume bingo event benefiting an animal rescue? What's got you making that face, sweetie bug? Dad leans his chin on the top of my head and tries to look at my phone. I shove it quickly in my lap. Oh, just a weird voicemail, I tell him. He nods. Wouldn't have anything to do with that mailman I saw you flirting with earlier, would it? I was not flirting with him. Was I flirting with Wally earlier? He was definitely easy on the eyes, Elizabeth chimes in. Dad flicks her with a dish towel. Since when do we objectify people, Beth? Beth's son, Jake, nods his head. I saw the new mail carrier. He is an objectively attractive male human. Told you, Beth shouts. Nicole pokes her head back in from the deck, where I'm pretty sure she's smoking a joint with my cousins. You have a hot mailman? Elizabeth nods. He's new, though. Not sure if he's sticking around. I want a picture, she says. Those shorts really do it for me. Take a picture before it gets too cold and he puts on pants. I roll my eyes at my family and stand up to gather my stuff together. There's no dip or bread left, and the bowl is still soaking in Elizabeth's sink, so all that remains is to hug my dad and ruffle Arlen's hair before I head out. I walk back across the street to my house, wondering what the hell costume animal rescue bingo is all about. I'm tucked into bed and half asleep before I realize I forgot the damn potholders. Mike now and waves his hand around, trying to get everyone to settle. I'm just here because I'm grateful for the work you all do every day. So who's ready to kick back and have some fun? I jump as Karen presses her two index fingers together and whistles, as loud as if we were at an outdoor baseball game. What? She whisper yells in response to my expression. There's good prizes. I'm here to win. Wally waves his hands again until the room settles back down. He's hilarious up there, hamming it up for the crowd of bunny-loving grandmas. Okay, okay. Susan said that usually you guys call numbers from one of those boring old wire bingo balls. But I thought we'd shake things up a little tonight. He shimmies his hips as he swivels his mailbag around to his front. The crowd is lapping it up. I don't even recognize this man who is so at ease here. 
he starts pulling bingo numbers from his mailbag, circling the room enthusiastically, even bouncing the little ping-pong balls with the numbers on them off the tables as he makes his rounds. I lose myself in the energy, trying to keep up. We're evidently playing postage stamp bingo, in homage to Wally, but all I get are sporadic numbers until intermission. Karen helps me up out of my seat as I look around for the bathroom. Thanks, I tell her. I'm still not used to my center of gravity being off. I remember that, she says following me. Now, of course my equilibrium is all whacked out due to the change of life, she pats my arm. But you don't need good balance to sit and pet a bunny. Know what I mean? I shake my head. I don't, actually. I don't have any pets. She looks stunned, like I just told her she did indeed have to stop staring at Wally's thighs. Are you here to adopt one tonight? Of course, there's a line for the bathroom, so Karen and I lean on the wall to wait our turn. I shake my head again. It's not the right time for me, I tell her. I point at my pumpkin stomach. I need to get ready to take care of this little bunny. It's just me, you know. And then I bite my lip. I still get overwhelmed talking about this adventure. Karen pats my hand. You're going to do just fine, she says, her smile as warm as her voice is husky. Something about her kindness gets me emotional again, and I have no explanation for why I blurt out. My mom died. When I was young, I have no idea what I'm doing. Oh, honey. Karen wraps her arms around me in a tight hug from the side, careful not to smear the paint on my belly. Someone else from our table comes out from the bathroom, and seeing the scene I'm making, joins in the hug before she knows what's wrong. You're all being so nice, I say into Karen's hair. Oh, baby, Karen says. We're all here because we've been rescued. You'll soon see. These creatures. They give us so much. We're happy to pass that love right back on to you. But why me? You guys don't even know me. Karen laughs. Well, you're here, aren't you? And you said you're a friend of Walt's. I never met a man who loves his pet like Walt loves his little pudding pie. Even though it's hard for me to imagine Wally as a doting pet parent, I decide these old lady hugs are better than any of the therapy sessions my dad sent me to in the years after mom died. It occurs to me I should maybe look into getting back into therapy as I listen to the gang from my table telling me stories of loss and loneliness. Cheryl explains that rabbits thump their back legs on the ground when they're angry. Well, one night I fell asleep on the couch, woke up to my foster bunny thumping like crazy, wouldn't stop. Eventually, I walked over to his pen and saw black smoke billowing out of the kitchen. I had left a pizza box in the oven. She starts to cry. That little booger saved my life. There's a murmur of agreement amidst the bingo dabbing. The women agreeing that their pets have saved the humans instead of the other way around. Wally finishes up calling, ignoring rogue shouts for him to take off his shirt. In the end, I don't win any games but I pull out my phone to scan the QR code on the table to make a donation to the rabbit rescue. Karen looks impressed. You know how to use that barcode thing? I nod. Huh. That was Walt's idea. I guess he knew what he was doing after all. I look over to where he's squatting on the ground, visiting with one of the rabbits. I watch as he pulls a treat from his pocket and breaks it in half, splitting it between the rabbits and the pens on either side of him and then he scratches them each between their ears. I stand up. It was so lovely to meet all of you, I tell them. Will you excuse me so I can go thank Wally for inviting me? You better thank him, a woman named Carol nods enthusiastically. Do it for all of us, honey. I shake my head and wave, promising I'll come visit them all again at their Rabbit Grinch photo event in December. I wade through the crowd over to Wally, who sees me coming and stands, hands in the pockets of those ridiculous shorts. You came, he says with a shy smile. That's what she said, I counter, punching him in the shoulder. 
Chapter 18 Walt Orla follows me to the parking lot, and we stand awkwardly by my car. Do you want me to drive? I can bring you back here for your car after. I'm not sure what's easiest. She shrugs. Sure, that sounds good. She's halfway into the car before I can say anything else. And I want to say so much. I want to tell her what it means that she spent her evening here with this organization that's become important to me, with no questions asked and no real time spent with me during the event. I want to tell her how damn sexy she looks with her little belly hanging out of that shirt and those fucking braids. But I also have to remember that the belly is obvious proof that she is not mine to lust after. Not anymore. Probably not ever. She makes a face at me, and I realize I've been staring at her. I clear my throat. So we look kind of interesting for going in public. I gesture between us, me dressed as a mailman, her as a farmer. She laughs. Oh, yeah, I guess I forgot we were in costume. She bites her lip and buckles her seatbelt carefully so that it doesn't touch her stomach paint. I run a hand through my hair, feeling self-conscious. I guess I should at least untie my shirt. She fumbles a bit with the buttons and then sighs, realizing it won't fasten around her stomach. I have coffee, I say. If that's not too weird, we could go to my place. Nothing inappropriate, I swear. She curls her lips to the side, considering, then shrugs. Sure, why not? I start to sweat at the thought of having her in my house. I can't imagine why I'm inviting her over, knowing I'm sitting here lusting after her, and she's just here to be a friend, another person with a dead parent offering solidarity. I scan through my house, trying to remember how trashed it is. I know the upstairs is a wreck, but there is zero chance she'd go up there, so I decide not to worry about it. The downstairs is Pudding's realm, but that probably won't be off-putting to her based on her experience tonight at the fundraiser. So, how about those rabbit ladies? There's a smile in her voice as she asks, turning her body so she can look at me while I'm driving. Yeah, I grin. It's like having a whole bunch of ants. They're so nice. And they pinch your butt, she teases. Well, I've asked them to stop that. I drive in silence for a while, the radio playing softly. Orla taps her fingers on the leg of her jeans. I find myself wondering if they're special pregnancy jeans or if she just has them pulled down low. Then I'm thinking about her ass again, and that's off limits. Shit. I sigh. Thankfully, she asks a question I'm more than happy to talk about. When did you become a bun dad? Is that the phrase they used at Bingo? Ha! Yes, I'm a bun dad. They want me to grow my hair long so I can be a man bun dad. They have a lot of opinions about what you should look like, Wally. I wave a hand. They're mostly teasing. Anyway, I found pudding back in August, so it's just been a few months. But it's been... Well, he's really changed my life. I pull into the driveway, and Orla looks surprised to see we've arrived. My townhouse in Shadyside is nice. There's no euphemism to use about that. I live in a swanky place on an expensive street. My neighbors probably would blow all their Botox if they saw all the rabbit stuff I've got inside these days. I put down carpet runners over the glossy hardwood floors so he won't slip, and cleared off the bottom shelves of all my built-in bookcases so he can perch in there if he feels like it. The great thing is I don't care what they think. It's so freeing, not caring about people's opinions and instead caring about being helpful and nice. Come on, I say, hurrying around the car to offer Orla a hand. I'm surprised that she lets me help her out of the car, but I guess it's harder to move around when she's got a protrusion like that. I unlock the door and pause. We have to hurry inside the storm door so he doesn't get out. He's not in a pen? Her blue eyes are wide, like we're about to enter a haunted house or something. I shake my head. No, putting roams all around my house, like a cat. I mean, it's basically his house now. I pull the door open and hear the click of Pudding's nails on the floor as he makes his way over to greet me. I sneak in behind Orla, trying not to shove her, but needing to close the door quickly so he doesn't make a run for it. As a result, I have to squeeze up against her back, and the smell of her fills my nostrils. She smells like coconut and something minty. 
My already tight shorts become uncomfortable as I catch my breath, and I realize I should probably gate off the front entrance next time. Stop it. There's not going to be a next time. I flick on the overhead light and squat down to greet Pudding. Orla stands and stares. I see her take in the tunnel and the wooden castle I just recently got. Pudding also has a wooden doll bed near the couch. He lounges on it while I ice my knees and watch TV after work. Wow, she says, her voice trailing off. You're really... You're very different from when we first met, Wally. Very different. I don't say anything, but I drop my mailbag and walk into the kitchen, pulling two glasses from the cupboard and filling them with water from the filtered canister on my counter. I slide one glass across to her since she followed me into the kitchen. I can still smell her, and I'm not supposed to be lusting after her, so I just dive right into our agreed topic for when we set up this meeting. I told you I hated my dad. Hate my dad. I correct quickly, gulping down some water. She hoists herself onto one of the stools. He... I didn't like myself before. I can't decide how much to lay on her. I mean... She offered to talk about dead parents, but I guess this is going outside the boundaries of that. She draws her brows together, looking concerned. Well, she says, spinning her glass on the counter. You were kind of a douche. I roll my eyes. I know it. When he died, everything turned upside down. I wince. Your business was probably impacted by his shady dealings. I'm really sorry about that. It's not that big a deal she says, in a way that suggests it was actually a big deal. Well, again, I'm very sorry. It took weeks to deal with all the paperwork from everything. My mom is left with... I don't want to say she's left with nothing. There are people who actually have nothing. My mom is left with her house and her own trust fund from before she married my father. She has no idea how much money she had before or how much she has now. I shrug. She's never really done too much on her own. I help her a lot. Don't you have a sister? I couldn't remember telling Orla about my sister, but I guess she probably looked us up on the internet. I would have, if my business got screwed. I groan. She's not a ton of help. Honestly, my parents really hurt her too. She stopped coming around, but like I said, I wasn't a great person before. I was... I was useless. You weren't. Useless? Orla arches one brow suggesting that she's referring to our night together. I swallow. I didn't even know how to use a can opener. It's pathetic. Now I'm pounding entire cases of tuna just because it's the fastest way to get protein in me. I chuckle. She seems confused. I burn like 8,000 calories a day at work. I can barely get enough food into myself. I refill my water glass and walk around the counter, crouching down to the floor where Pudding is sniffing around, no doubt hoping I'll get him some food. I've been sort of resentful of how much my mom is relying on me after so many years of just relying on my father and his money. I glance up, expecting Orla to look horrified as I'm spilling my guts here. But she's just studying me intently. I pet Pudding, and he rests his chin on my foot until I sink all the way to the ground and he hops into my lap. Pud was really, really sick when I found him. He relied on me completely, like, for everything. I look up from stroking his fur, and I'm surprised to see she's joined me, groaning a little as she lowers herself to the floor. But, I hesitate. I feel like I'm dumping everything on her, just slicing open my veins to a woman my family has screwed over. To a woman who yelled at me to fuck her, and then her vagina actually stabbed me in the dick. I sigh. It's been really amazing to experience pure affection from him, with no strings attached. Pud nuzzles against my leg, eyes closed, blissed out as I pet him. We're both quiet for a while, until she says, I feel like maybe it wasn't fair of me to offer myself as an expert for you or whatever. She tosses her braids back over her shoulders. I don't have any experience with that, with what you described. She bites her lip. But I'm so sorry you never felt affection without strings, Wally. I swallow, and we're quiet again, for a bit until Pudding pops off my lap and starts sniffing Orla. She groans a little and adjusts her posture. Oh, shit, I say, hopping to my feet. 
You should be on a couch or something. God, I'm an asshole. Orla waves a hand. It's fine. I can sit on the floor, Wally. Relax. She reaches out a hand for pudding, but he backs away from her and hides under the stool. What am I doing wrong? She looks up at me with her big blue eyes, and the fact that she wants my rabbit to like her is doing things to me. Very uncomfortable things, especially since I'm still wearing the two small work shorts I borrowed for tonight. I cough and head for the fridge. He just doesn't know you yet. I'll get you his favorite treat to give to him. I grab a handful of basil and parsley from the bowl I keep in the fridge for his snacks. I start to worry that she's going to think I'm pathetic, turning my house into a rabbit haven and dedicating half the fridge to his special foods. But Orla's face lights up and she holds out a hand. I give her the greens and Pudding starts circling her, sniffing wildly. He stands up on his hind legs, wiggling his nose and his whiskers, and she laughs in delight. You are so damn cute, she says, holding out her palm. Pud wastes no time snatching the entire bunch from her, shoving it into a heap with his paws as he starts trucking it in, chewing loudly. You're just the most adorable thing, aren't you? She says, stroking his fur as he eats. He looks up at her occasionally, before diving his face back into the greens. I thought Orla was sexy as hell when I met her, but now as she coos and babbles to my pet rabbit, I can barely contain myself I want her so badly. She sighs and leans back on one forearm. The other drops lazily to her belly, where she starts rubbing. I remember that even though she hasn't talked about the baby's father with me, she's not mine to want. I clear my throat. So, you know, am I totally doomed? How so? She arches a brow at me. I love that she can do that. Her hair is the same butterscotch color as Pudding's fur, and I long to run my fingers through it. I shrug. How long would you say you were a huge mess after your mom died? She laughs bitterly. Wally, I'll let you know if my mess ever gets cleaned up. Paints her toenails flaming red. Sam points at Emma Stagg and Maddie, who are both blissed out as another pair of techs massages their calves. Those two said foot rubs are the secret to surviving pregnancy. I'm actually thinking of replicating this at the office for my staff. Hey, Logan! She shouts across the room to where Logan is sipping her drink through a straw, trying not to crack the mud mask on her face. Not now, boss. I'm finding my zen. I forgot that Logan is a spa night aficionado. Sam leans back toward me. I'm sure she'll say yes to doing this at work. Ooh, we should do this for your baby shower, too. Baby shower? Nicole pipes up. Yes, Orla, you have to have a baby shower. We're going to give you gifts for your little Brady Nugget, and in return, you will let us feed you good cake. Sam, we should definitely do the spa thing again for that. The foof women, who have had children, start sharing stories of their pregnancies and baby showers, and I find myself feeling overwhelmed yet again. I'm much more comfortable here when we're talking about career strategy or financial planning. I feel like I have no context for talking about pregnancy, and I've tried my hardest to avoid baby showers. I don't really have a ton of friends outside my family, so this avoidance was pretty easy until my cousin started having babies. Esther stops by to check on my drink and asks if I'm nervous about the exam. Honestly, I'm not. Engineering is the easiest thing in my life right now. It's all the adulting stuff that makes me squirm. I chug down a huge gulp of her latest refreshing concoction. I feel that, she says. I'd much rather balance the books for my bar than navigate relationships with other humans. Esther breezes back out of the room, and I stare down at my legs as my assigned technician massages them. It feels so good, I can't even hold back a groan. I think back on Esther's use of the word relationship, and, for the millionth time, I ponder Wally. Mailman, rabbit Wally, is such a different person than suited, smarmy Wally. More like a person I'd want a relationship with. Just admitting that sets my heart racing. I don't do relationships. I've never had a romantic relationship. I do hookups and stick guys in the friend zone. But then I had to go and re-meet Wally and listen to him bear his soul about his rabbit giving him the first affection of his whole life. 
All I can think about is growing his baby, who would probably love him unconditionally, and what kind of monster it makes me to keep that opportunity from both of them. What do you think? The woman working on my feet startles me back to awareness of the room. Think? And then I realize she's asking me to endorse her work on my toenails. She painted them a deep purple, and they look lovely, like a fancy woman's feet. Oh, I say, they're perfect. Lost to my own thoughts again, I decide I'll spend one more day with Wally to see if he turns back into a troll. Then I'll tell him. I whisper. Chapter 20 Walt Hey. I stare at the text from Orla for so long, I'm sure it's costing me time on my route. I haven't heard from her since the bingo night, and now she's sent a vague, one-word greeting. I deliver the mail to five houses and take my phone out again and reply, Hey! I ponder the exclamation point for three of the houses. I hit up another dozen houses and my phone pings again. My heart races as I fish the phone out of my shirt pocket. I can't let myself get worked up over Orla Brady. I decide I need to ask her about her boyfriend. Husband? I need to find out so I can more easily stop myself from lusting after her. I look at my phone. I feel bad I didn't follow up after you told me about your dad. You doing okay? How's Pud? Fuck. What do I do with that? She's asking how I'm doing, and she's asking about my rabbit. I sent her a selfie I took this morning while Pud licked my banana peel. Then I check my camera app to see what he's up to, sleeping in a square of sunshine in the living room. Nice to be you, Pudding. And then my phone rings in my hand, startling me. Thinking it might be Orla, I answer right away, but I groan when I hear my mother's voice. Trippy! She wails. I switch the call to my earbuds so I can keep working. Hey, Mom, what's up? Oh, Trippy, can't you come over and talk to me? I sigh, fishing for my keys to unlock the lobby door of an apartment building. I told you, Mom, I'm working crazy hours. I also can't really talk while I'm at work because I have to concentrate. It's not entirely true once I'm out delivering. Much to Mark's chagrin, I've started getting things down to a science. I have all my mail sorted and rubber banded in neat bundles. I'm finding my groove, and I kind of love it. Even if they do stick me on entirely new routes every few weeks as people come in and out of various leaves of absence. The last guy was out with a dog bite, and now I'm covering a lot of apartment buildings after Peggy got a stress fracture in her shin. Honestly, Trip, I'm distraught. Have I told you about Thanksgiving? Yes, several times. My sister is joining her sorority alumni for their annual tropical pilgrimage. My mother was in the same sorority, but is not attending. It makes my mother sick to her stomach to say something as basic as, I can't afford the airfare, but she also doesn't want to admit that she doesn't want to fly alone or find lodging on the island since we had to sell my parents' timeshare. I just don't know what you expect me to do for the holiday. Do you really want me to be alone? I told you, Mom, we can spend the day together. We can get takeout. Takeout? I double-check that I hid all the mailboxes in the lobby of this apartment building before I make my way back out to the sidewalk. I didn't say fast food and burgers, Mom. We can order out a nice meal. Can't you just check the portfolio again and see if I can swing a first-class flight and a nice villa on the beach? I'm not going to check anything again. I'm having to manage Mom's investments and Dad's life insurance payouts, even knowing I won't get a cent of it. She has no idea how any of this works. And despite still working 60-hour weeks with only one day off, I have to make time to meet with the probate lawyer and the investment firm. I rub my temples. Mom, I really can't talk right now. I told you, you could sell the house or something smaller and then you'd be able to do those sorts of trips. This type of talk is so primitive, Trippy. You know I don't like it. Yes, Mother, I know you don't like anything. I roll open the door to the mail van to refill my bag for the next block. I decide to add a few extra stacks in there to try and make up the time I've lost. What a way to talk to your mother. I'm grieving, and you're scolding me. I'm also grieving, I think. You're scolding me, too, and you're the parent. But I didn't say those things. People in my family don't say those things. Except to me, I guess. I sigh. I have to go, Mom. We'll talk soon. 
and I hang up before she has the chance to say anything else. I can't handle her shitting on me right now. I look down at the phone and see I got a message from Orla. Cute bun! When are you off again? We should hang. Hang? With Orla fucking Brady? What would that include? Telling her more about my shitty family? Dragging her along to another rabbit event with my circle of bun moms? Lusting after her so hard my balls ache? Despite the fact that she's carrying another man's child? She's the one reaching out to me, though. Because we both have a dead parent, I remind myself. Not because she wants me to fuck her again. I wonder if her vagina would still stab me with a baby inside. I wonder if I'd still mind. I must be a glutton for punishment. I type back, Off tomorrow, actually. Coffee near you? Yes, please. I actually haven't tried that place since I moved in. See you there at nine? I take off my ball cap and run a hand through my sweaty hair. I don't know why I do these things to myself. I'm trading helping my mother understand her financial limitations for an opportunity to talk about cremation with a woman who makes me burn with lust. I'll be there, I type. And then I finish the rest of my route in record time. In the question. I wind up sitting even closer to him, and I can feel the heat radiating off his chest. He pulled his hand away while I was adjusting, but I reach for it and bring it back. We both stare at his hand on my skin. I don't know anything about babies either. I didn't even pick anything up from when Maddie had Arlen. Wait, do you even know Maddie and Liam? He shakes his head. Right. You were just at the wedding because your dad knew my dad and uncle. Wally seems uncomfortable at my mention of his dad and of his prior life. Anyway, because I know nothing at all, my doctor recommended this app. Every week it tells me what the baby is up to in there. Really? They can tell all that? I shrug. I guess they know generally what happens each week. I wriggle around and pull up my phone, glad that he doesn't retract his hand. He's stroking my stomach gently now, as if he's caressing the baby, and it feels amazing. Look, I show him the screen where, together, we read about how the baby is the size of an ear of corn. And this week, it's growing nostrils. Practice breathing, he says. Huh, I guess they really do start from scratch if they have to practice breathing. I just nod. We're sitting so close, and he smells so good. Not like cologne or anything added on, just soap and Wally. My nostrils are still super sensitive from pregnancy, so I'm being invaded by Wally smells. I breathe in and out through my nose a few times, my own sort of practice breathing, and say, I guess we should talk about our parents. He makes a face. It feels weird to do that right after we talked about your baby's new skills. I don't know, I say. I try to think about my mom a lot when I think about the baby. My doctor pointed out to me that the egg that became this baby was inside me when I was inside my mom. It's a small thing. I really like it. I like that cellularly, at least, she knows this baby. That is really nice, he says. I might be imagining things, or he might be drifting closer. I place my hand on top of his hand, preventing him from pulling it back. I realize we've never kissed. That night of Nicole's wedding, we didn't kiss at all. We just fucked. I never even saw him naked. I've also never thought this long or this much about kissing someone. Wally's a sure thing, right? Maybe not now that I'm someone with baggage. I feel the baby move again. What was she like? Your mom. He seems to be breathing heavy as he stretches out a hand to brush my hair back. His fingers skirt along my cheek, leaving trails of sparks along my skin. She was really kind, I tell him, licking my lips, trying not to stare at his. She and my dad were crazy in love with each other. Mom studied psychology and dad is an engineer, of course. He says she always knew what he was thinking, and it worked, since he wasn't ever good at communication. I have no idea what my parents saw in one another. A darkness passes over his face as he reveals this, and I think again of this man craving affection. 
I feel guilty for how mean I was to him when we hooked up. And then I remember that I'm being cruel to him right now, right this minute. Tell him, a small voice inside me whispers. I open my mouth to reveal my lie of omission, but he leans in and presses his lips to mine. Wally's kiss is warmth and gentleness. He holds the back of my neck with his free hand, his thumb rubbing the space where my hair meets the skin. He groans softly into my mouth and I open for him, moaning when his tongue slips between my lips. His mouth is yearning and oh so sweet. I dig my fingers into his hair, feeling the blonde waves beneath my fingers. I want to inhale him, jump into his lap. My blood surges until he pulls back suddenly. I'm so sorry, he says, raking his hands through his hair. I shouldn't have done that. No, I say. I mean, yes, you should. I liked it. I lean in to pick up where we left off, but he places a hand on my chest. Orla, it's... I'm not okay, and you need someone... You need someone okay. I want to scream at him that I'm a mess, actually, and I need someone to clean up life alongside me, not someone who has it all figured out to lord over me. I want to blurt that of course I need him because we're having a baby. But I don't say it. I, uh... Wally stands and reaches down for his shoes, moving to the armchair to put them on his feet. You're leaving? He looks tortured. I need to figure out Thanksgiving with my mom. And it's a total shit show, to be honest. I nod, collecting my dignity. I remember the holidays right after mom died. Everything's different. That's an understatement. But Wally knows that. I can see it in his face. I'm not sure what possesses me to say what I do next. Instead of tell him the truth about my burgeoning belly. I begin with a deep breath and blurt. You should come eat with my family. Your dad knew my dad and uncle anyway, so it's not like you're strangers. We're all eating at Nicole's because she has room for everyone. She's the one whose wedding you were at. There will be babies and yelling and probably crying. Lots of distractions for you if you need to escape feeling depressed about the holidays. Wally blinks a few times before saying, That's really nice of you, truly. Not many of my parents' friends have kept in touch after... everything. He puts on one shoe. I wish I could say yes. I have my mom and all. Bring her! My voice is high-pitched now, and I sound like someone on the verge of mania. There will be corn pudding. Corn! Like the baby is an ear of corn? That's kind of weird how they do food comparisons, now that I think about it. And there's always whiskey at a Brady function. Wally barks out a laugh as he ties his other shoe. Mom only drinks gin. Perfect, I tell him, standing and wrapping my arms around him in a hug. Is this our first hug? Does he even want me to touch him? I sigh when he embraces me right back and rests his chin on top of my head. We stand there for a long time until the baby kicks and he jumps back. I swallow down my feelings and gather my composure. So you'll come? To Thanksgiving? Orla. He drags a hand through his hair and shakes his head. Didn't my dad fuck over your family? With work stuff? Oh, I actually forgot about that. Between the pregnancy and the sinkhole project. My dad and uncle said that wasn't actually a big deal. I shrug. I'll talk to them, and you talk to your mom, and you should join us. I feel myself babbling and worry that I sound desperate. He nods his head just a little. Bring some gin, I tell him as he heads toward the door. It'll be terrific. Break out in laughter, and I could watch and listen to her this way for hours, admiring the look of her in a royal blue turtleneck and dark jeans. The small bulge of her belly isn't even noticeable from the back, and only when Orla turns to the side can I see the baby I felt moving the other day. She sees us standing near the counter and makes her way over. You came! Her expression is both surprised and happy, and I relax even more. Seeing her intoxicates me. Yep, and I brought gin as instructed. I hand her the bottle and she laughs. Mom looks like she's trying not to explode, and I realize I neglected to mention that Orla is pregnant. Orla sticks her hand out toward my mother. I'm Orla Brady. You must be Celeste. Mom seems unprepared for Orla's firm handshake. 
or maybe she's still reeling that the woman I'm interested in is about to have a child. It takes her a few beats before she remembers her hammered-in manners. Thank you for including Trip and me in your plans for today, Orla. That was so kind. Well, it's our pleasure to have you. I realize that Orla, too, has a persona she puts on for people. I can sense that she'd rather be learning a line dance with the others than making small talk over here. Oh, you know my Uncle Mick, right? She grabs the man's arm as he walks past en route to the bar setup. Mick, this is Celeste Sheffield and Wally. Walt, I say, shaking his hand. Mom looks perplexed. I don't know that she actually remembered my name isn't Trip. Mick nods at me. Then he turns to Mom. I knew your husband a long time. Heck of a thing for all you to go through. I notice that he doesn't say my father was a good guy or indicate that he's sorry for our loss. I admire the artful way he sidesteps those sentiments while still finding something nice to say to my mother. You were at the funeral, she says in a whisper. And that shocks me, because I thought Mom was stoned off her gourd for the entire event. Mom refused to come out of her room or contribute any information to the obituary. I had to plan the entire service and deal with all my relatives asking super uncomfortable questions. Mick nods and reaches to pour himself a whiskey. Felt like the right thing to do, he says. Orla sets the bottle of gin alongside the array of whiskey. Her uncle grins. Can I fix you to a drink? Mom places a hand on her chest and fluffs her hair with the other. Gin and tonic would be lovely, Mick. Thank you. Chapter 23 Orla I can't get over how good Wally looks. His flat front slacks and shiny brown shoes are so classy. I expected his mother to show up dressed like Jackie Kennedy, but I am stunned by Wally's good looks every time I see him. I love watching him take care of his mother, even though I know he says he resents how very much he's having to do for her lately. I'm shaken out of staring at him by Nicole, who hip-checks me. Hey! She and Logan sidle up to me to grab fresh drinks. Nicole looks at Wally, considering. I recognize you. Why is that? He clears his throat. I was at your wedding, he says nervously. My mother wasn't feeling well that day and I came with my dad. He drifts off as Nicole reaches past him to pour herself a drink. And now you're Orla's hot mailman? His mom looks mortified, while he clears his throat again as Celeste excuses herself to use the powder room. I'm a mail carrier, yes, and I will be in Orla and Kellen's neighborhood for the next while, yes. I frown. What happened to Peggy this time? He shrugs. Stress fracture. It happens a lot. They really have us working a lot of hours, and we're starting to get a ton of holiday packages. Throughout all of this, I notice Logan furrowing her brow. She leans in to whisper something to Nicole. Wally trails off as Nicole screws up her face and tilts her head to the side. So you're dick-stab Wally from my wedding and you're a hot mailman? I turn beet red, and Wally nearly falls over. Logan shrugs. I saw you leaving with him when Callum and I went to raid the cookie table. Nicole's mouth forms an O. You left to bang him in the middle of my wedding? And you stabbed him right in the dick and then came back to eat cake? He whips his head toward me. You told people? I bite my lip. It was concerning. Nicole cackles. Her pussy bites. It's so perfect. Better watch out for your willy, Wally. Nicole takes a sip of her whiskey. Man, I am hilarious today. She wanders off toward the kitchen to check on things. Wally leans closer to me, his breath hot near my ear. You told your friends we slept together. I can only nod, my pulse racing as I inhale the close scent of him, feel the heat from his tall, firm body. He grins a wicked smile. Did you tell them you could feel my cock in your rib cage, and that it felt amazing? My eyes widen and my jaw drops at his filthy reminders of that night together. I'm drenched with arousal. Wally has thrown down. He wants to be the beautifully tortured guy who rescues animals, and he wants me to remember how he took charge of my body until it splintered into bliss. Did you tell them that, Orla? 
he stays in my space and sips his drink slowly, appreciatively, like my dad says a man should. Wally licks his lips, and his eyes are wicked enough that I start mentally cataloging the spaces in Nicole and Zach's house where I might drag him. Dinner is ready. My dad beams as he hoists the golden turkey into the air and carries it to the end of Nicole's counter. And it breaks the spell Wally just put on me. Elizabeth follows close behind with the gravy boat and cranberry sauce. Let's review how this is going to go, Dad says, picking up the carving knife and using it to point at people. My cousins immediately start shouting out their favorite cuts of meat, and their partners swat at them. I see Uncle Mick lean close and whisper something that makes Wally's mom blush. Dad clangs his knife against the carving fork. Listen up. We've got guests. I'm going to review the rules. Arlen eats first. The rest of you will form a line. No cutting. No asking your girlfriend to trade places with you. No throwing rolls. And for God's sake, do not splash cranberry sauce on Liam's shirt just to irritate him. This last dig is pointed directly at Cal. I am insulted, he jokes. What will our guests think? Dad laughs and starts carving the bird while Liam walks Arlen along the buffet. My little nephew turns his nose at every single choice as Maddie laughs from across the room. Uncle Mick ushers Celeste to the end of the counter so she can get her meal first. And I don't miss the wolfish grin he gives her. I can't tell if he's trying to get in her pants or just wants a good shot at grabbing the wishbone. Eventually, everyone jockeys for space, fills up their plate, and crowds around the table. Zach built a few more leaves for the table, so it actually accommodates all 14 of us. I notice how Cal swats Zach when he tries to sit next to me, and I swallow down a lump when Wally slides into the vacated seat. He puts his hand on my thigh and leans close. Your family is great. I'm really glad you invited me. I smile and tuck a fallen strand of hair behind my ear. Wally leans in closer. I'd like to thank you later, if you're interested. And then he sits back in his chair, forking a huge bite of meat into his mouth. He's somehow managing to chew sexily at me. I sit there, wide-eyed, not eating, staring at him. I stare, and he sexy chews until Cal's voice rings above the general din. So, Walt, what's the wildest thing about being a mailman? The guy who delivers to the office at Beltane said he got chased by a snake once. Wally dabs at his mouth with his napkin and nods. Yeah, I've been chased by a lot of different animals. My family all shuts up and leans forward, like this is the most fascinating thing they've ever heard but that's not the wildest thing. Well, don't keep us hanging, man. Zach rubs his palms together like he's about to hear fantastic gossip. Honestly? Wally looks at his mother, whose face is twisted like she wants to be interested, but can't bring herself to show it. He continues. Senior citizens are the wildest thing. I have one lady who waits for me every day because she needs me to open her bottle of iced tea. Every day. We had to do a training because for a lot of seniors, the mail carrier is the only person who comes to their house with any regularity. A lot of times, it's the mailman who calls 911 if someone has a fall, or worse. There's resounding silence around the table. Nobody was expecting that, least of all me. I stare at Wally. This man who contains so many multitudes. This gorgeous man who now rescues bunnies and opens jars for old ladies. Wally nods. So yeah, that's the wildest thing. His mom starts to cry, and Wally jumps up. She waves her hands and dabs at her face with her napkin. I'm so sorry, she says. I just, I'm alone now. And when you said that, I realized the mailman is usually the only person I see now. Celeste stands abruptly and runs toward the powder room. Wally moves to go after her, but Uncle Mick stands up. Let me talk to her, son. I know what it's like to be alone. The table is silent. A first for a Brady gathering. Even Arlen looks around from his high chair, studying the adults. 
Eventually, he slams his juice cup on his high chair tray, and Maddie leans in to shush him. Wally taps his fingers on the table and looks around, seeming uncomfortable, until his mother emerges from the powder room with Uncle Mick at her side. Hey, folks, he says. I'm going to drive Celeste home. Save me some pie, huh? Wally stands. Mom, I'll take you home. But are you sure? You barely ate. She waves a hand. You're having a nice time. Stay with your friends. Michael has business up near the house anyway. I'm 1,000% sure that's a lie, but Uncle Mick gives us a salute and helps Wally's mom into her coat. They walk out the front door, and Nicole crosses her arms over her chest. Well, that was fucking weird, she says. Maddie clamps her hands over Arlen's ears, but Nicole flips her the bird. What? It's weird. I for one plan to grill Mick about it later. Wally, you better find a funny mailman story this time to lighten the mood. Zach pats her on the shoulder, and Wally grins, telling us about delivering a box of sex toys that started vibrating in his mailbag. Ha! Huh. Nicole gestures at Zach with her fork. Remember when you had to sign for delivery for my purple lady rocket? Liam and Cal and Dad all groan and start protesting loudly. But the mood has shifted back to normal, and I am able to sit back and watch as Wally joins into the chaos. I realize I like having him here, laughing with my cousins and telling raunchy stories. I like everything about Wally, and that scares me more than the feel of his child wriggling in my stomach. I have to tell him. I should have told him when he was at my house, but it didn't feel right when he started talking about his family's holiday plans. Tonight, I decide. I'm telling him tonight. Settling on that plan of action, I'm finally able to eat my meal. For her to read a sexual innuendo in my voice, and I can tell she receives it. I see her cheeks turn pink in the dim light, her eyes sparkling at me. She takes a few deep breaths and swallows before saying, I want your cock again, Wally. So bad. I drive like I'm being chased, screeching around corners with my hand clenched on Orla's leg. She periodically turns to look at me and licks her lips, and my heart on throbs inside my pants uncomfortably. I screech to a halt in her driveway and race out of the car as Orla fiddles with her keys. We barely get inside the front door before I back her up against it, fusing my mouth to hers. She makes a small, desperate sound, and I swallow it as I work to get her out of her coat while shrugging out of my own. Our frenzied kiss is interrupted by fumbling limbs as we both work at each other's buttons. I feel the firm sphere of her belly pressed against me, and I groan when she slithers out of her jeans and turtleneck. Chapter 25 Orla Walt stares at me as I try to cover my nakedness. I don't say anything, and eventually he helps me get my shirt up and over my head. Then I sit up and try to wrap my arms around my knees, but I can't reach, so I just sprawl out on the floor inside my front door. You are the baby's father, I whisper. The muscles in his face shift and twist as he tries to figure out what to say next. I watch as he cycles through a number of emotions all at once. I take a deep breath and say, when I found out I was pregnant, it was right after the incident at the Keto Bakery. The news had just surfaced that your family had swindled dozens of Pittsburgh business owners, and you were such a douchebag. I groan as I start to get a cramp in my lower back, and I start to roll to hands and knees so I can stand up. It's a whole process these days, and before I can get fully erect, Wally is there helping to lift me at the elbow. It's such a fucking contradiction. I don't know what to do about you, I tell him. It's like, there's Wally before and... Walt, now. You went from some smarmy prick I didn't want anything to do with ever again to being a guy who helps old ladies walk down the stairs and rescues dying animals. Were you ever going to tell me? Ever? I waddle across the room and sink into the sofa with my legs splayed open, and then I remember that I'm not wearing any underwear and I'm flashing my crotch at him. I sigh again and tuck my legs under me, grabbing a throw blanket and letting my head fall back against the wall. 
It's good that it's mostly dark in here. I can't bear to look at his face right now. I looked for you a few times, right after I found out. All we could find was information about your family's lawyer, and the office was pretty clear that a lot of fucking people were trying to find Walton Sheffield. They didn't know I wasn't calling you about money. Walt barks out a pained laugh and settles into the other end of the sofa, letting his own head flop back against the wall. This is unbelievable, he mutters, and then says it a few more times. I stay silent, resting my hands on my stomach, then feeling like shit because my stomach is a secret I kept from him on purpose for months now. Finally, he pulls his head up and leans toward me. When I saw you again this fall, you didn't say anything. We kissed. I told you about my dead father. You didn't fucking say anything about us creating a life together, Orla. How was I supposed to know which Wally was real? Maybe I didn't want the stinking Sheffield family getting their dirty hands and shitty morals on my kid. This is my baby, Walton. Mine. He springs to his feet. I'm not sure when he fastened his pants and tucked his dick back inside. But as he stands there in the dim light with no shirt, towering over me, he looks like Thor, glowing and fierce with his blonde hair glinting in the low light. He raises a hand and clenches it into a fist and roars. I want to hug him. I want to hit him. I want to fuck him. But I'm sure I lost my chance at that. Well, apparently it's my baby too, Orla. I have a right to be in my child's life, goddammit. You can't keep me from being a father. He spins on his heel and stoops to grab his shirt and coat from the ground and opens the front door. I spring to my feet. Walt, wait. Don't leave like this. I'm going home to feed my fucking rabbit and calm down. Do not call me. He looks over his shoulder on the steps. When I'm ready to talk to you, I'll find you. He backs out of the driveway and squeals off into the night. I sink to my knees in the doorway and sob. I cry harder than when I thought about becoming a mother with no mother. I cry from shame and regret because he's right. I should have told him weeks ago. I knew at bingo night that Walt is a transformed person. He's right that he deserves to be in his child's life, and he's right that I'm horrible for keeping that from him. I fumble around in the dark for my phone and try to text the foof group chat, but my fingers are slippery with my tears, and I accidentally start a group video call. Nicole and Sam and Esther answer first, and Nicole squints into the camera. Didn't you just leave my house with the sexy mailman? Girl, why are you not naked right now? What's this about a sexy mailman? Esther is in sweats in her living room. Her bar is only closed a few days of the year, and I feel bad bothering her on one of her rare evenings at home. I wipe my nose on the back of my hand and blurt out, I did something really shitty, and I'm a horrible person. Maddie has joined the call. Oh, sweetie, did your vagina stab his penis again? Sam's face brightens into a grin. Oh, the mailman is the dick stab guy? Hey, whatever happened with that? Did the doc say your IUD was fucked? I guess it's mood anyway now that you're prego. There's a pause for a minute while I continue to sniffle, and the other women seem to be considering. Esther finally stands up with her phone, and I watch as she moves through her house to her kitchen. Wait. Nicole got married in June, the night your IUD stabbed a man in the penis. And you're six months pregnant. Holy shit! Nicole starts smacking at Zach next to her on their sofa. Wally with the willy is your baby daddy? Maddie nods. And you didn't tell him, but today he did some math. I just start sobbing again. Sam sighs. Oh, honey, do not move. I'm coming over. Me too, Esther says, snapping off lights and grabbing her keys from a hook. No, guys, it's a holiday. I can't keep you from your family. Um, hello, you're in my family? Nicole keeps the video on as she stoops to kiss Zach, who has fallen asleep on the couch. I'm going to Orla's. Don't wait up. He just grunts. I feel bad, Maddie says. I can't come. I have to lay here with Arlen or he'll wake up. 
We've got this, mad dog, Esther says. How about you fill in Piper and Chloe? Before I can interject, my friends have ended the video portion of the call and are texting logistics back and forth, instructing me not to move because we're going to have a giant slumber party. I've never actually had a slumber party before, and I try not to let myself feel excited about it because I'm supposed to be wallowing in shame right now. Before I can settle on an emotion, the doorbell rings and Esther bursts in the door with an arm full of chips. Swats at my shoulder. You gonna tell me what's eating at you so we can get back to work? We're eating daylight here, Sheffield. I take another swig of the coffee and then look at him. I got someone pregnant. Mark scowls. Well, that's not so bad. I've done that myself. It works out okay. I shake my head. It happened months ago. She didn't say anything. She just wasn't ever going to tell me. Hmm, he says, pouring himself a cup of coffee and smacking his lips as he drinks it. Why'd she tell you now, then? She looking for a check? I don't think so. I don't think she meant to tell me at all. She... It's one thing to think terrible thoughts about myself for years and listen to my parents spew mean things about me. It's another to say them out loud to a co-worker I look up to. My family did some pretty awful things. Stole money from people. Mark's eyes widen. She thought I was involved. I crushed the empty cup in my fist. She didn't want anyone like that involved in the kid's life. Mark scratches his chin with the back of his glove and stands up, pacing on the sidewalk. Your family stole money from her family? I nod. I mean, my father's business stole from her family's business. Not personal theft. Not that it makes much difference. But I wasn't involved, I swear. He offers a hand and pulls me to my feet. Sounds to me like she did what she thought she had to do. Yeah, but now I have a child. Well, almost. I want to be involved. I can't just let my kid grow up with no father. Or, it's my kid. Even if I have no idea how to be a father at all. I realize I'm rambling now, pacing up and down and banging on the side of the mail van for emphasis. I also realize Mark must have pulled over and parked when I didn't get up for my fall. I look at Mark and feel something break inside. Whatever was holding all my emotions in a tidy column before now. I can't abandon my child. Not physically, not emotionally, not financially. I have a responsibility here. He nods and puts the thermos inside the van before setting both his hands on my shoulders to look me in the eye at arm's length. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to deliver the rest of this shit, and then you're going to go home and get some rest, because you look like you haven't slept in a few days. Then you're going to go find your baby mama and tell her what you just told me. I don't think I can do that, he scoffs. Man, you put your dick inside her. You can talk to her about the child you created. Being a father is about showing up. So you go over there and you show up. But first, you show up here at work, because I ain't finishing this route alone. He shoves me toward the passenger seat of the van, and I climb inside. Mark floors the gas pedal before I can respond, and we dive back into our silent rhythm, working together in the cold. Chapter 27 Orla My entire house is covered in blankets and pillows and sleeping women. I wake up in my bed alone with all my pregnancy pillows, and there are women on the floor of my bedroom, plus a few on the floor in the living room, and a cold spread eagle on the couch. In the bathroom mirror, I notice that my eyes are puffy from crying. When Foof got to my house, I just let it all rip to them. How I've been keeping the baby's father a secret not only from them and my family, but from him as well. They pretty much just let me cry until I fell asleep. I tiptoe to the coffee maker and get a full pot going just as Sam and Logan emerge and stagger toward the kitchen. Logan squeezes my arm and says, It was my turn to bring the feel-better brunch. I furrow my brow at her. What do you mean? She laughs and reminds me that Foof swarmed her apartment when she was going through a rough patch with Cal. Logan leans into my fridge and miraculously procures two giant boxes of mini quiche while Sam flings open a pastry box on the counter. Where the hell did you guys get all this on Thanksgiving? 
My mouth waters as Sam hands me a croissant. She winks at me and says, I know people. Now sit and tell us where your head is. Nicole comes into the room just as the coffee maker beeps that it's ready. Soon, we're all gathered around my table apart from Esther, who kissed the top of my head and said she had to go get ready for Black Friday drinkers. I look at the clock and realize it's nearly noon. I must have slept for hours, although I feel exhausted and drained. It was so much easier when he was just an asshole, lost to the paperwork of foreclosure. I mutter around bites of pastry. Nicole pats my hand. His family did very, very shitty things, she says. I actually felt bad for his mom yesterday. She seemed like she's not holding her shit together very well. Logan considers this. Some people feel trapped by societal expectations, she says and shrugs. It can be really scary to think you're going to be kicked out of your perceived safe space. I sigh. From what Walt has said, he's always felt on the brink of being ejected from his family's good graces. Sam groans. I love you, Orla, and I support you. But you have to talk to him, honey. You need to be having this conversation with him. Both of you are hurting. Logan nods. Even Nicole is silent, apart from her fingernails tapping on her coffee mug. She finally says, You've been hanging out with him for two months. You owe him a heart to heart. I bury my fingers in my hair, trying not to scream. I don't think he wants anything to do with me. I can't look up at them. Well, I hear Sam's voice. Honey, if that's true, you need to have a conversation about the baby. You can't put this back in the vault. I'm about to answer her when there's a knock at the door. I raise my head and look to my friends. They all shrug. Logan says, maybe it's Elizabeth checking in? She pads to the front door, and I hear a small gasp before she runs back into the kitchen. I feel the cold air of the door being opened and hear someone hustle inside, boots on the tile in the entry. It's him, Logan whispers. He's here. I stand up and try to smooth down my shirt, as if that will help me look more presentable. I make my way around the corner to the door, where Walt is leaning in his full U.S. Postal winter gear, complete with fur hat. Hi, he says. I'm Walt Sheffield. He holds out his hand, and I furrow my brow but return the shake, wondering what the hell he's doing. I thought maybe we could start fresh, since I think it's fair we both made some missteps early on. As I stare at him in the doorway, I hear a clatter behind me. I turn over my shoulder to see Nicole has just upended the plastic tablecloth into a giant bundle and is trying to shove the whole thing in the trash. I was eating that, I moan, but she holds up a finger. Nope, we're leaving. Wally can make you replacement waffles later. You two have shit to hash out. Sam and Logan flit around the living room, gathering up shoes and folding my blankets. Walt clears his throat. Actually, he scratches at the back of his neck, making a pained face. I was hoping I could persuade you to ride with me to my house to talk. I came here straight from work and... Oh, babe, we can tell. Sam pats him on the shoulder as she squeezes past him. You wouldn't think those pants would do it for me, but they definitely do. Are you guys objectifying my baby daddy? I feel suddenly possessive. It was one thing when the gray-haired ladies teased him about how good he looks, but these women are supposed to be on my side. Only a tiny bit, Logan says, folding her coat over her arm. Hey, boss, can you drop me at my house? Sam and Logan hustle away, and Nicole backs out with a wave so that Walt and I are alone inside my doorway. He raises his eyebrows, his face hopeful. So anyway, I came right from work and I have to give Pudding his pills, but I didn't want to let this go another night. I nod and follow him to his car. He smiles as he backs up and does a three-point turn. I rest my hands on my belly as he drives us toward his house, and I chew on my lip while he greets his rabbit. He just doesn't seem like he's sick, I tell him, attempting to squat down and pet the bunny, but giving up when my belly gets in the way. Well, that's because I make sure he gets his meds. Walt grins again as he scoops a bit of pumpkin into a silver bowl and sprinkles cut-up pills on top. The rabbit comes bounding over, circling his legs until he sets the bowl on the ground. He and I both laugh at the sound of the little tongue lapping up the food. 
Walt stands and leans back on his counter. So, he says, I swallow. Can we sit on the sofa while we do this? I don't think I could get off and on your stools at this point. He gestures toward the living room, and I settle into his couch, noticing that it smells like his hair, and then feeling awful all over again. I take a deep breath. I slept with you because I was pissed at my family, I blurt. They were pressuring me about work, about relationships. I was feeling down about my mom being dead, and you were there and hot. I slept with you because you told me to, he tells me grinning as he unbuttons some of his mailman layers. Jesus, I'm fucked if he turns this into a strip tease. Okay, so by the time I found out I was pregnant, your father had already been revealed as an uber douche. I wince, but Walt gives a go-on gesture. Even deciding to have the baby at all, that was more about me than you. I just felt like it was a freaking miracle. The IUD just happened to slip and rupture the condom, it seemed like fate really wanted this baby to exist, and I think I told you about how much it meant to me about the cellular connection with my mom. You did. Thank you for sharing that with me. When the hell did you learn the right things to say to people? I snap at him, taken aback by how he's handling this conversation. Sorry. But see? I'm shit at emotions and communicating. I was raised by emotionally unavailable men. Well, my dad is good at emotions, but he was a grieving mess for most of my formative years. Anyway, this whole thing was about me and maybe learning how to be a whole person by becoming a mother. I didn't factor you in. Walt stares at me, unblinking. But I can see his throat working as he swallows and he's practically vibrating. I acknowledge all of that. And you know I'm still working through a lot of emotional baggage with my own family. I nod. But you and I have been connecting, Orla. I'm not imagining it. We've shared things the past two months. I close my eyes. I was going to tell you. A few different times I wanted to tell you. But then either you kissed me and I got distracted or... I drift off and press my palms over my eyes and take a deep breath. I apologize, Walt. You have a right to know your child at every stage, and it was fucked up of me not to tell you sooner. Thank you, he says, and he scoots closer to me on the couch. He stretches out a hand. Can I? He looks so vulnerable, like he might cry. God, yes, of course. I grab his hand and press it to my side, where the baby is kicking windmills while we've been talking. When I look up at Walt again, there are tears in his eyes. Will you tell me about him? Her? I don't even know what sort of child I have. I shake my head. I haven't found out. I sort of wanted a surprise. And, you know, the sex doesn't necessarily mean a whole ton. He nods and keeps his hand still. His smile grows with each movement of the baby. Oh, I can show you something. Hang on. I arch up to extract my phone from the pocket of my leggings and search for the video I saved of the ultrasound. This is the anatomy scan, I tell him, starting the video. That's what they call it when they look over the whole baby to check everything. Organs, toes, bones, all of that. He clutches the phone like it's made of fragile ice and stares at the video. This is my baby. Our baby? I nod. And everything looks good, by the way. The doctor says everything is perfect. Christ, Orla. Look at that. I smile and watch as the baby rolls over. I remember sharing a laugh with the tech when that happened, because we had to wait for a better position to keep scanning. So, like I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know how to be a mom, and I don't know how to be a partner. I've never had any examples of functional adult relationships in my life. And my mom died so long ago I can't tell if my memories of her are real or just fairy tales at this point. Walt sets the phone down and places a warm palm on my leg. Maybe your memories of her are both. He moves his thumb in small circles, and I just sit with the affection in that. Maybe. Maybe we can figure everything out together, he says, his eyes dancing as he looks back and forth between mine. Hopeful. I'd like that, I whisper. I'd like to try. Walt pulls me into his arms and, 
With my belly between us, we sit that way, breathing, forgiving. Eventually, I must fall asleep because I wake to a swaying sensation. I yelp as Walt sets me in the middle of his bed and starts to tuck me into the covers. Hey, I whisper as he starts to back out of the room. Oh, I'm sorry I woke you. He puts a hand on my leg. I'm too tired to drive you home. But I can sleep on the couch. No, I say, trying to sit up. Suddenly, the thought of sleeping alone is overwhelming. Too much. I need his scent here and his arms to reassure me that things can be okay. He freezes. I could call your dad or one of your cousins if you'd... I mean, no, like, don't sleep on the couch. Come and hold me. I toss the covers back and lie back down on my side, looking up at him. He nods and unfastens his pants, which drop to the floor in a clatter of belt buckles and keys. It should be sexy, but I'm so exhausted that I just sigh as he climbs in behind me and pulls me against his chest. I fall asleep in his arms, his hands splayed across my stomach, across the child we've created together. Prior to going into the exam, she's the most competent person I know. Apart from the rest of her family, they're all grotesquely competent. It drips off of them. But they're not even assholes about it. I allow myself a small smile, a moment to feel proud that I've managed to sneak into their good graces. I can't dwell on it for long, though, before I have to dive in and focus on my own seemingly endless work. Chapter 29 Orla Oh, thank God that's done. I throw down my pencil and march up to hand in the last part of the exam. My tailbone hurts from sitting on a wooden chair all day. I shouldn't say all day because I spent at least as much time in the bathroom as I did taking the test. I smile at the proctor and gather up my things. I fire off a text to Walt, grinning. Only took eight hours and 24 million bathroom breaks, but I finished that fucker. And then I panic a little, because it scares me that I texted him first, and not my family or the foof group chat. I can't think of a single other piece of news that I didn't first want to share with my family. I send them all the same message as I get situated in my car, cramming pretzels in my mouth as my stomach gurgles. My phone pings with a thousand responses offering congratulations and assurances that everyone knows I did great. I do know I did great. I can feel it. But again, I'm taken by surprise when I feel a flutter in my chest, seeing the response from Walt. Never doubted you for a second. How do you want to celebrate? How do I want to mark this occasion? A vastly pregnant person who has done nothing but study and practice for weeks? How do I want to celebrate when I'm repeatedly distracted by memories of Walt fucking me with his face on the floor inside my front door? We've kissed on the cheek a few times since Thanksgiving and done plenty of chaste cuddling. But I really need more from him, and I'm hoping he's on the same wavelength. I send him an eggplant emoji, a peach emoji, a hot dog emoji, and a taco emoji. My phone begins to ring almost immediately. Hey, he says. I can hear the beep of his mail truck and know he must be out delivering packages somewhere with his four ways blinking. His voice is breathy. I like it. Hey, yourself. I turn on the car, but I find I don't need the heater. Between thinking about celebrating and this damn baby turning me into a furnace, I'm already sweating. I want to make sure I don't misinterpret your text message. Walt? I need you to fuck me tonight. What time do you get done with work? Oh, fuck. Orla. His voice sounds strangled, and I think he nearly dropped whatever he's carrying. Yes, Walt. Exactly that. What time? Jesus. Um, shit. It's five now? I can do six. I can make this happen. I'll meet you at your place. I don't want him slithering away midway through to go take care of pudding. I haven't had a dick inside me since the night we made this baby. I just took the most intense exam of my life. I'm going to need him at least three times. I stop for takeout and run home to grab an overnight bag and get to Walt's house just as he's screeching into his driveway. He leaps out of his car looking crazed. I grin. I take it you're excited about my celebration plans? Orla. 
Fuck. I meet him on the step into his front door, and he grabs my hand, pressing it to his crotch where I feel how very enthused he is about this party. I love how he gets when he's horny. Walt becomes assertive and confident and uses his fingernails and tongue like tiny magic pleasure sparks. His lips on mine are possessive, hungry. He fumbles with his keys, and we burst into the house. He seems to snap out of his sex haze, remembering his rabbit. He grabs my hand and drags me into the kitchen. Do you need some water or anything? He looks over his shoulder as he hurries to toss lettuce in a dish for Pudding, who is trying to climb his pant leg. I'm good. Can I help this go faster? Meet me upstairs, he barks. He looks down at his pet. I'm giving you your pill and saying goodnight. Sorry. I chuckle as I climb up his steps, shedding my clothes along the way. I find his bedroom in the semi-darkness and switch on the lamp on his nightstand and then, oh God, he's got baby books by his bed. I swoon onto the covers and sprawl out just as Walt bounds up the stairs. I'm here for celebratory orgasms, he says, and then he blushes. That sounded sexier in my head. Chapter 30 Walt I can't sleep without you anymore, Walt. I don't even try to hide the giant grin on my face when Orla calls me at work. Can you come over tonight? I sigh. You know I want to, but by the time I get done working and give Pudding his pills, you'll already be sound asleep. I grunt a little as I hoist a new bin of mail forward in the van, tossing the empty one in the stack behind the passenger seat. This is dumb, she says, and I hear her moving around the house in the background. I'm just going to stay at your house. I feel a rush of warmth bloom in my chest at the thought of Orla in my bed. Not even because I want her sexually, although I definitely do. But I crave all of her. Her wit and her temper, her vulnerability that I might just be the only one to witness. I'd really like that, I tell her, hustling a bit. Maybe I can shave a few minutes off my day. Where are you in twenty minutes? I'll come meet you and get your house key. She finds me a half hour later and greets me with a steaming cup of hot chocolate and a grin. She looks like some sort of Celtic goddess in a white, puffy maternity coat, and her hair tumbling around her beneath a white beanie. I halt in my tracks at the sight of her, and then I'm overcome with an urge to let the world know this woman is spoken for. I rush into her arms and kiss the hell out of her, loving the little moan she offers in response. Can it be real that this woman is interested in me, for me, is responding to my affection? It still feels foreign to want to give affection and then receive it in return. I'm drunk with the experience of something as simple as a cup of cocoa from my girlfriend. I'm pretty sure she's my girlfriend. It occurs to me that we didn't really discuss that. We just sort of slid from discussing the baby to celebrating her exam to me giving her all the sex she can handle whenever I'm not at work. I fish in my pocket for my key ring and hand her the key to my condo. You should go make yourself a copy. I kiss the tip of her nose. I'll definitely do that. Oh, hey, before I forget, Maddie and Liam are hosting Christmas. They're asking about a head count. We do it Christmas Eve in the Brady family. Christmas? She rolls her eyes. Yeah, you know, dumb party games, another turkey, the guys competing in a gingerbread structure competition. It's fun. You'll come with me, right? It seems to have just occurred to her that I might not come, and I can't think of anything better than another holiday in a house full of people who actually enjoy each other. I... I haven't talked to my mom about any of this. My parents usually went to stiff, fancy holiday gatherings at their club. There were tuxedos involved, and special silverware. Not that those things in and of themselves are bad. It's just that I always spent the entire night sweating and trying not to talk lest I embarrass my father, or else putting on my trip costume to ward off any women at the start before they could reject me. She holds up a finger. Your mom is invited, obviously. Maddie just needs a head count for this one game she's planning. Hmm. I also still haven't told my mother about the baby being mine. I haven't told my mother much of anything in the past few weeks, and I feel a little bad that it's been pretty great. Stuff with my father's estate seems pretty wrapped up. The life insurance payments are all situated for my mother, and I've just been focusing on Orla and making plans for the baby. 
plans that I haven't wanted to include my mother. So, I tell her, scratching the back of my neck uncomfortably, the thing about my mom is, oh my God, you haven't told her yet. I shake my head. Well, are you planning to ever tell her? Invite her to the kid's high school graduation with a surprise note? Orla has her hands on her hips now, looking fierce. I lick my lips and then have to reach for my lip balm. I go through the whole process of preventing chappage while Orla stares at me. I promise I will tell her before Christmas, I mutter, stuffing the tube back in my jacket pocket. I have to figure out the best way to tell her, but put us both down for the Brady party. Every day when I come home from work, there are more of Orla's things scattered throughout my house. I look at her annotated textbooks, unable to even comprehend some of the equations I see on the open pages she leaves piled on my table. I find leggings draped over the shower curtain rod and plaid button-down shirts on the hooks in my bathroom. I showed her how to take care of pudding, and he started responding to her, approaching her in the kitchen and circling her ankles when she walks to the fridge to get herself a snack. She told me she read about Christmas trees being potentially dangerous for rabbits since they get treated with pesticides, and so she suggested we decorate with fir boughs on higher surfaces and battery-operated candles with no cords that Pud might chew. Never in my wildest fantasies did I imagine holiday decorating with a partner like this. I find it hard to breathe when I realize that she is making room in her heart for me and for my pet that she's considering his wants and his needs and making adjustments to the ways she celebrates this season. For us. I walk around corners and spy her long legs crossed on my couch as she props a notebook on her belly to study as she eats her cereal in the mornings. And when she hears me enter a room, she looks up at me and smiles, happy to see me. Terrified of losing this, I avoid telling my mother, I start to appreciate why Orla withheld the truth about the baby. I know that this news will trigger in my mother a deep-seated response. Thoughts of a baby will activate words like air for her, and she'll begin talking about prep schools and nannies and finding the proper personal trainers for golf and tennis. My mother knows I'm dating Orla, and she knows Orla is pregnant. By the time I leave to get her for the Christmas Eve party, I rationalize that it's probably going to be fine if she doesn't know yet. I'll offer her lots of gin and hope she sticks close to me and avoids small talk. I slide open the door to Maddie and Liam's loft and hear Mom gasp at the sight inside. There's a Christmas tree set up behind a bright colored plastic fence. It's chaotic in a delightful, welcoming way. Every corner on every surface has a padded cushion attached and there are labeled bins everywhere that seem meant to contain toys but the floor is scattered with all the people and wooden animals and miniature motor vehicles instead. Cal looks up from pouring himself a drink and sees us at the door. Hey, everyone, the Sheffields are here. We can start the ball game. The chatter at the party stops and people turn to look at us. I wave as Maddie comes over to greet us. Hey, Walt. She stretches up to kiss me on the cheek, a move that takes me by surprise, and I forget to greet her. Mrs. Sheffield, Maddie grins. Merry Christmas. Can I take your coat? We're tossing them on the bed. Everyone's itching to see what's in the foil ball this year, so why don't you two grab a drink? Try not to sit near Zach. He throws elbows. I look around, dazed at the frantic, excited energy. I spy Orla perched on a bench and make my way over to her with my mom in close pursuit. I stoop to kiss Orla's cheek, and she moves to stand up when she sees my mother. Don't get up, I tell her, shaking my head. I'm just scooching over to make room for Celeste, she says, patting the bench. My mom smiles politely and sits. So, what do I need to know about what's going to happen? I nod my head in thanks to Cal, who hands me a beer and then starts passing out oven mitts. Orla smacks her lips. Okay, so this is a very important piece of Brady family tradition. Most families do this with a ball of plastic wrap, but Liam can't handle the environmental implications of that, so we use aluminum foil, which we obviously recycle afterward. Orla places a hand on my mom's shoulder to reassure her, as if recycling were in some way important to her. I laugh, seeing my mom nod. The host fills a ball of foil with random little gifts, chapstick, bath bombs, gum, but there are also lottery scratch tickets in there, and 
Because it's the Brady family, the center of the ball is always a gift certificate for a Pittsburgh Marathon registration. Pretty sure Uncle Mick foots the bill for that grand prize. It's hard to say whether people are more excited for the scratch tickets or the marathon entry. Maybe the scratchers, since all of us are obligated to enter the marathon regardless. Mom furrows her brow. You all run marathons? Orla nods and looks a little insulted. Yes, multiple times a year. We've even got Nicole working up to a full, and Maddie has started doing some 10K races. Orla looks me up and down, considering. Walt, you probably walk 20 miles on a workday, right? You'll have to start at least doing the corporate relay with us. We get really competitive about our time. You're kidding. I feign surprise and laugh into my beer, as Mom asks Orla why on earth people are wearing oven mitts. We learn that the game is played by someone in oven mitts unwrapping as much of the ball as they can, and they get to keep whatever falls out during their turn. The person after them in the circle rolls a pair of dice, and when they get doubles, they get the ball and oven mitts. All the Bradys squat on the floor in a long-limbed circle. Arlen toddles around, staring, clutching a ring pop Logan gave him to keep him occupied during the game. Everyone ready? Celeste, Walt, you know the rules? Maddie arches a brow at me, keeping one hand on Liam's back as he sits poised to open. Cal stares intently at the dice in his palm, ready to drop. We're good, I say. But Mom looks mortified. I know she's terrified she'll make an error, violate a social rule. I wish I could convince her that that seems to be part of the fun for this particular game. But Maddie screams, Go! And pandemonium ensues. Liam, decked out in Santa-patterned oven mitts, growls at the foil ball, using his teeth to help him while his brother swears at the dice. Small bottles of liquor roll out of the foil before everyone shouts as Cal rolls double fours. Everything gets passed around. Even mild-mannered Kellen shakes his fist with enthusiasm as Elizabeth unrolls the first set of lottery tickets. Before I know it, Zack is stuffing oven mitts on my hands while Nicole starts rapidly dropping the dice to the polished concrete floor. I laugh at the awkward foil ball in my hands, at my utter inability to grip it and start unraveling. Use your teeth, Walt! Orla shouts, slapping at my shoulder as I kneel on the floor beside her. I can't bring myself to put foil in my mouth, but I finally catch an edge and start peeling, giggling with glee as a few lottery tickets and chocolate bars fall by my knees. Suddenly, Orla yanks the ball from me and starts stuffing the mitts on my mother's hands. Mom seems frozen with anxiety, but Orla is already rolling the dice and cackling. Come on, Mom, you can do it, I prod. She sits there, staring, as if she can't believe her life has come to this. But then she turns and looks at me, and there's an expression on her face I haven't seen before. Maybe lightness? Acceptance? She starts pressing the ball into her knees for leverage and digging in with the thumbs of the oven mitt. Aha! She shouts as a pair of lottery tickets falls on her lap. I did it! She doesn't seem to notice when Orla snatches the mitts and the ball for her own turn. Trippy, I won! Mom holds the tickets against her chest, forgetting herself for a moment, sitting in the frenetic energy of the game. And I want to cry because I've never seen her so content. It passes just as briefly, and she's smoothing out her skirt again, patting her hair and looking on as Nicole screams at Zack to win her all the liquor. None of those stupid candy canes, husband! We want the Jose Cuervo! Eventually, the foil is all unwrapped. Elizabeth's son, Jake, has won his first marathon registration, and everyone lucky enough to get lottery tickets is happily scratching to see if they won. Everyone but Mom who keeps staring at hers until Nicole comes over, holding out a penny. Here you go, Grandma. Gotta see if you win that bambino some college tuition. Nicole's smile slowly sags as my mom blinks at her, unmoving. Orla whips her head to look up at me. I close my eyes and groan. Nicole presses the penny into Mom's hand and looks at Orla, silently pleading for guidance. Chapter 31 Walt Orla clenches her teeth and says, Hey, Walt, seems like maybe you still have some things to discuss with Celeste. Nicole backs slowly away and I swallow. Orla jumps to her feet, hands on her hips. Yeah, so I'm going to go get myself some food, and when I come back over here, we'll all be caught up, right? 
I nod, and she stomps across the room to join Nicole, who I see apologizing as Orla shakes her head and gestures with her hands. I take Orla's seat on the bench next to my mom, who is still sitting with the penny in her palm and scratch tickets on her lap. Grandma? She looks like she might cry or run away. Maybe both, although I've never seen her run before. I blow out a breath. So, Mom, before Dad died, I had a... I had an affair with Orla and got her pregnant. An affair? Trip, how could you be so careless? What will people think? She looks aghast. I tug at my collar. People think it's great, I tell her. Look around this room. I wave a hand. Everyone here is excited about it. Look! I point at Orla, who rolls her eyes as her father places both hands on her stomach and beams at her. Mom stands abruptly, the tickets falling to the ground. I'd like to leave, she says. She starts walking toward the bedroom where Maddie took our coats. I rush to follow her. Mom, you can't run away like this. Look, I know this is a big deal. I should have told you before the party. I'm sorry, okay? She whips her head around and hisses at me. You're sorry? You hid a love child from me for months, and now you caused me to be embarrassed at a party. There's nothing to be embarrassed about, Mom. She makes a disgusted sound. You don't think it's embarrassing to be the only person who doesn't know a secret? What does that tell them about our relationship? She starts to rummage through the coats. What on earth do you expect to happen here, Trip? You have told me repeatedly there is no money for frivolity. I can't fly first class with your sister to Turks and Caicos, and you expect me to fund a college trust for a love child? If your father were here, he'd... She claps a hand over her mouth, like she's just remembered that Dad is in fact not here, and won't ever be again. Her nostrils flare as she leans against the wall, her eyes glittering with tears. Mom. I reach for her, and she winces. My mother winces at my touch. I lick my lips. Mom, listen, the baby will be fine. I have a nice job. Orla has a terrific career. We're not worried about all of that. Her eyes glitter with tears that haven't yet fallen through the makeup on her cheeks. She shakes her head. None of this is. This isn't the life I planned for you, Trip. This wasn't how things were meant to be. I want to hug her. No. I want her to want me to hug her. I reach for her hand instead and squeeze. It's going to be okay, I tell her. My life right now is better than it's ever, ever been. How can you say such a thing when your father is barely cold in the ground? She starts to cry then and begins dabbing at her eyes with the side of her index finger. Mom, I know you're grieving. I am too. But I'd like you to be happy for me that I found someone. I found someone, Mom. And she looks at me like I make the room light up. And I have a job that you don't approve of, but I like it. I like what I'm doing. I grab her hand again and press it to my chest. Can you try to understand all that for me and the baby, your grandchild? She takes a shuddering breath and shakes her head a few times, and then puts her party face back on, the wooden smile that doesn't quite reach her eyes. Of course I can, Trippy. Now... I have had a bit of a long night, and I would like to go home. I look down the hall, toward my pregnant girlfriend, toward the room full of people I really want to join. Mom sees me looking and pats my forearm. Call me a ride, darling. You stay and enjoy the festivities. I nod and pull out my phone, ordering the black car service my parents used to hire to take them to and from the airport. I bend to kiss her cheek, and she makes her way toward the door. Merry Christmas, she tells me, waving and hurrying down the hall. Merry Christmas, Mom, I mutter at the back of her head as she disappears from sight. I walk back to the party with my hands in my pockets, and Maddie greets me with a pair of lottery tickets. I rescued these from the floor, she says, gesturing for me to take them. Thanks for doing that. I tell her, sighing as Orla wanders toward me, looking irritated. Maddie smiles and pats my shoulder as Orla leans on the wall, her arms crossed over her chest. I didn't tell her, I say, 
running a hand through my hair until I feel it standing up. Yeah, that was obvious. Walt, that wasn't fair to her. I know, I tell her. I lean against the wall next to her and close my eyes. But I was right that everything seemed better without including her in it. Orla runs her hand along my arm and I look down, meeting her eye. She seemed like she was trying tonight, Orla says. I nod. I'm going to call her tomorrow, and I mean it this time. We're quiet for a beat, and Orla looks at the lottery tickets in my pants pocket. You gonna scratch them and see if she won? Orla! I feign shock. That would be cruel. I'm going to mail them to her. She laughs and swats me on the arm. Come on, sir. Kiss me under the mistletoe. Cute will she look out there running with the baby? Me. I'm not cute. Please don't make me cute. Logan. She'll be super cute and fierce and imposing, too. Don't worry, Orla. You will always be our Lagerta. Elizabeth. Was that one of those autocorrects? Lagertha? Maddie. Ooh, she's from that show Vikings. She's a badass warrior, Mama. Your toast right, Logan. Orla is our Lagerta. Nicole. I'm fierce, too. Logan, Nicole, you could totally slaughter your enemies with an axe or an arrow. Maddie, ooh, the theme could be stars and arrows. Logan, screenshot of forest pattern. Look, there's arrows and foxes and pine trees. This is so great. Me, I'm putting this thread on mute. No shower before my exam, okay? I can't focus on two things at once. Logan. I'll have the registry done by tomorrow. Nicole, we can move on the shower whenever, and Orla won't even be aware it's happening. I toss my phone across the room so it lands on the armchair. My exam is tomorrow, and apart from editing inspection reports and double-checking my peers' work before they submit to Dad, I've been focused full-time on studying since Christmas. I have a crib set up in the baby's room and a bunch of diapers, plus an entire plastic bin full of clothing from Maddie. My dad assured me that's fine to get started with. This exam is the most important thing in my life right now. Walt is working basically around the clock still, despite the snow and polar vortex temperatures. It's a good thing he has me staying here at the house to make sure the pipes don't burst. I don't tell him I also am glad I'm staying here because I actually get to see him a little bit each day. I miss my guy when he's not here, and I'm getting a little more comfortable admitting it. I thought things would slow down for him after Christmas, but he says now people are spending their Christmas money and ordering shit in the mail, so he's still racking up obscene amounts of overtime. Since I can't have Walt here, I really like spending the day with pudding while I'm studying. Walt is really good at back rubs, and rubbing other things, but Pudding has been hopping up on the couch with me while I'm studying, and he just nuzzles up against my leg and falls asleep. It's the sweetest thing. I definitely see how Walt got so smitten with this critter. And after spending a little bit of time with his mom on Christmas Eve, I also see how he'd be craving affection. Walt says when he talked to her, she wouldn't stop obsessing about the baby's financial future. He tried a few times, but she wasn't ready to talk to him about anything beyond that. Maybe he shouldn't have blindsided her at a party, I muttered a pudding. My back starts hurting, so I decide I need to move around a bit. I fix lunch for myself and grab some parsley for pudding so we can eat together. I'd sit with you on the floor if I thought I could ever get up again, I tell him. He doesn't seem to notice as he slurps the parsley in like spaghetti. I wince as a cramp tightens up my back muscles. Dr. Andrews did say I'd start having practice contractions as my body gets ready for labor. All right, baby, I say to my stomach. I see what you're saying. Training is important and all that. I feel another quick squeeze on the underside of my belly. Okay, I think we're going to try a bath. I soak in Walt's tub until the water gets cold, and then I drain the tub to fill it again, loving how the pressure is eased from my joints when I'm floating on my side. I'm not sure what time it is when he pokes his head in the bathroom, but I'm on my third refill, so I must have been up here a long time. What's going on in here? He squats down next to the tub, 
his nose pink from being outdoors. He always smells sweaty when he gets home from work, and it's probably gross, but I kind of like it. Everything okay? He runs a hand along my wet head, his eyes filled with concern. I just wanted a bath. It feels amazing not to be supporting my own weight right now. I grin at him like an idiot, but he's so damn cute in his polo shirt over black thermals. I like messy, disheveled Walt way more than fancy suit Walton Henry Sheffield. Probably because I now know I'm seeing the real him when his guard and society manners are down. How about I make us dinner and you start to de-prune? Your toes look as wrinkled as peach pits, babe. How about you strip and join me instead? He arches a brow and splashes water on me. As tempting as that sounds, I truly need to eat, or I'm going to pass out. I sigh and climb out of the water, dripping on the bath mat for a bit and staring at my stomach. I wonder what my mother thought about when she was this far along with me. Dad has some pictures that I've been staring at obsessively the past month or so. He tells me she had an easy labor, because I was always an agreeable child. I'm not sure where he got that idea. All my memories of myself include me snapping at my cousins, yelling at them, just so I'd feel heard. I sigh, because of course mom didn't know me when I was a girl thrust into living with three boys. She got me as an only child in a house where I learned to behave, because my mother was often sick with chemo and resting. I make my way downstairs as I start to smell garlic and onions from the kitchen. My mouth waters when I see Walt sautéing chicken, dancing along to pop music on the radio, and tossing veggies to pudding as he works. Hey, I say, trying to hug him from behind, but finding I can't reach. But just as I do, he spins in my arms and wraps his around me, so we're pressed close together. His kiss is sweet, and familiar by now, salty and warm. I feel his smile as he pulls back. I like this, I tell him. He frowns. What's that happening there? In your belly. You can feel that? I drop my hands to where my muscles are tightening again, same as earlier. It stopped when I was in the bath, but it seems like my body is gearing up for another practice session. Walt nods. I can totally feel that. Is that... That's not kicking? I shake my head. Dr. Andrews said there would be practice contractions, hiccups or something. Braxton Hicks? Yes, that. Why do you know that word? He shrugs. You know I've been reading. I love that, is what I say, but in my head I think, I love you. I swallow as he serves me a plate of aromatic food. Just like that? I think I love Walt. Or maybe it's not just like that. I sit next to him at his table, in his house where he gave me a key, and think of the past few months. He's been honest with me and real. He hasn't wanted to change me, has only been supportive of my goals. He works all the fucking time. But when he's here, he's present and thoughtful. God, I really do love him. This is delicious, I tell him. But what I'm really thinking is that he understands me, he completes me. The hugeness of it overwhelms me. Or maybe it's another Braxton Hicks, or maybe the baby just kicks me in the ribs, but I don't say it to him. I wanna run through my notes one more time, I tell him, and then I'm going to try and sleep. Walt jumps up and grabs the plates. His is wiped totally clean, because he always inhales his food after work. He takes a few bites of mine as he walks to the sink and rinses both plates, and then he joins me on the couch, rubbing my feet while I review equations I could identify in my sleep. Through contractions, if I needed to. I wake up to Walt bringing me coffee in bed. It's not yet light out, but that doesn't mean much in January. I don't usually have to be up as early as him, but he agreed to be my alarm clock today. Hey. I say, brushing the hair out of my eyes. Oh my God, this smells so good. Doesn't this smell so good? My sensitive nose sends the hot coffee aroma buzzing through my body before I even take a sip. I don't know that there's anything more decadent than hot coffee in bed, and I sip it as I watch him get dressed. I could get used to this, I tell him, grinning above my mug. 
I sure hope so, Orla. He crawls across the bed once he's dressed and pries the cup from my hands. I'll give it back, he promises. I just want to kiss you properly. He gives me a peck. For luck, he slides his tongue into my mouth, and I forget to worry about anything. I know he has to leave, and that I won't see him until late, so I dig my fingers into his collar and try to keep him here with me, knowing it's wrong to wish him away from his job, but past caring. I'll try to get home early tonight, he whispers against my lips. And then he's gone. I should be nervous about my exam as I drive to the testing center. My future at work depends on this. The next few years of my life depend on this. But I know I'm ready. I'm as confident in that as I am about my next breath reaching all the way into my lungs. Instead, I think about Walt and how I don't want my life to disentangle from his, about how thoroughly I've switched from a mindset of raising this baby on my own to not being able to imagine embarking on this journey without him. My phone rings, and I grin, seeing my dad's face on the screen. Hey, Dad. Are you there yet? I can hear the excitement in his voice. You know I'm here ten minutes early. On time is too late, we say in unison, and I laugh finding comfort in the routine predictability of his advice. Well, I'll let you go, but I just wanted to say, I'm proud of you. I feel warmth spread through me, even though he says this at least a dozen times a week. Thanks, Dad. I love you. I love you too, sweetie, but also, Orla, I hope you know. He draws a shaky breath. Your mother would be so proud today. I squeeze the steering wheel as he takes a pause. I can just imagine her calling me every few hours today, asking me how I think you're doing. Aw, oh, Dad. Come on. A surge of emotion powers through me and I close my eyes, trying to see if I can feel my mother out there in the universe somewhere. Somehow. Call me when you're done? Of course, Dad. Sure thing. We hang up and I sit in the car for another minute, pressing my hands against my belly, feeling grateful. As I'm checking into the exam, the practice contractions start up again. Of course, I mutter, but I ignore them and get to work. I stand periodically, swaying back and forth at my workstation when a particularly stubborn wave rolls through my lower back. By lunchtime, I'm sweating and using my marathon breathing techniques to concentrate on the problems each time my body decides to cramp up without my permission. In through the nose I breathe. I solve an equation. I hiss my breath out through my mouth as I squeeze the pencil and turn the page in my exam book. During one of my bathroom breaks, I sneak out my phone and power it on to text Maddie. These practice contractions are super inconvenient. Maddie. Oh no, are you having a big one during your exam? How's it going? Me. One? Try 100. Test is great. I was having these contractions last night too. So annoying. Maddie. Hmm, I only had like a handful of those before it was real labor. You really had 100? You okay? Me. Totally fine. I've got this. Just gotta breathe through and keep doing that math. Right? I power my phone down and waddle back to my workstation. I think I'm ahead of schedule for the problems, and I decide to work through my afternoon break to get ahead. I groan a little as the next wave seems to be squeezing my spinal column. I decide I'll finish the test standing up, and I'm just about to get started on the last problem when the door to the room bursts open and Walt rushes in. What the hell? I drop my pencil and clutch the edge of the desk. I want to yell at Walt, but I groan instead, deep and low. This is a really big one. My girlfriend is in labor, Walt announces. The exam proctor looks at me, and then I groan again, and he looks like he's going to pass out. The proctor stares at the floor as if I leaked amniotic fluid all over it. I think that's an exaggeration, Walt, I say. Only I don't say that. I hear myself bellow like a lowing cow. And it occurs to me that Walt is right. This isn't practice labor at all. I scrabble for the test paper and scratch out the final details for the high voltage problem I was working on. I am done.
I start wailing. Walt scoops up my notes and hands them to the proctor as I clutch the edge of the desk and breathe. Come on, Orla, he says, tugging at my hand. I take a few steps and bend over, putting my hands on my thighs. I shake my head. Come on, babe, you've got this. The car is the finish line. Not? I huff and take a few steps. True. I take a few more. My entire body seems to be squeezing and rendering me unable to walk. Walt scoops me up and carries me, bridal style, out to the parking lot. He tries to buckle me into the seatbelt, but I growl at him and turn around so I'm draped over the headrest, panting with my ass toward the windshield. He starts to drive, and I'm aware that he's very calm. I feel like a goddamned disaster. How can he be calm? How are you here? I hiss, resting my head on the seat during a blessed break in between contractions. Maddie called me, he says, keeping his eyes forward as he speeds along the highway toward Oakland and the hospital where I'm delivering. And then I enter my own space inside my head, where there is nothing but me humming with my mouth hanging open and the squeezing of my back and front muscles all at the same time. At some point, I hear Walt asking me if I can get out of the car, but I can't pay attention to him right now. There is nothing but my body and this tiny circle of black leather on the headrest where I am focusing my vision as I huff. I think I hear Dr. Andrew's voice muttering something about a gurney, and then I feel arms on my arms tugging me out of the car. I squeeze onto the headrest, roaring and panting. Finally, someone pulls my pants down and I feel them around my knees. Get it off, get it off, get it off, I chant in rhythm with the pulsing of my body. The pants are peeled off my body by unknown hands. I close my eyes and breathe. There's a moment in between contractions and I sag against someone's chest. Walt, I smell him and sink my head back against him inhaling deeply. I think he's lowering me to the ground, and I briefly feel the icy wind on my ass before I drop forward with my hands on concrete. My body starts to squeeze. No, it's pushing. I'm pushing! I close my eyes, and I recall my mother's face as she pushed me on a swing. I looked back over my shoulder at her in the sunshine, and she smiled. Harder! But the fantasy shifts, and it's not me yelling, or maybe it is. But there's another voice here, too, telling me to push, telling me that I am beautiful. And then I feel burning pressure, so much pressure, followed by immediate relief. I collapse, not onto the sidewalk, onto Walt. You got me. I pant, and then I realize. Our baby, where's our baby? She's right here he says, turning my face toward the screaming, slimy bundle that Dr. Andrews is hoisting into the air. She thrusts the bundle at me and I pull her close. She? I look up at Walt, who has tears running down his face as he smiles. She? Orla? We have a girl. I look down at the baby in my arms. My baby. Our baby. She's here, I say and I lie against my wally as my ass goes numb on the frozen sidewalk outside the hospital. And it pays homage to the sounds of your name, Nora. Like mother, like daughter. She smiles. I love when she smiles. What's it mean? I kiss Orla's head and then bend my neck to kiss our girl. I inhale and I'm distracted by the magical scent of her tiny head with wisps of white gold hair. It means light, I murmur. And yours means golden princess, so it's a nice combo, I think. Orla closes her eyes and sighs. Nora, let's do it. Orla falls asleep eventually, and I pace around the room, holding Nora, talking to her, promising that I will always do my best to love her. And I want to love you, I tell her. I don't want you to ever have to pretend with me, okay? You tell me who you are, and I'm always proud of you. When she too falls asleep, I set her in the bassinet by Orla's head and work on activating the family phone tree. 
My phone is practically ruined, scratched to hell from dropping it in the parking lot. But I can just barely manage to use voice commands to call Maddie. Hey, I whisper when she picks up. Orla is asleep, so please do not screech. Just give me the update, Walt. Gimme, gimme. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited you're calling me first. Am I first? Liam, we're first to find out. Are you there? Yes, sorry. Update? Miss Nora Helen Sheffield was born in the parking lot outside the hospital a few hours ago. I'm interrupted by a loud squeal that sounds like it's coming from Liam. I hear Maddie slapping and scolding him and telling him to shush. Orla's terrific. Had a few stitches. She's sleeping. Nora's sleeping. When can we come? Liam must have wrestled the phone away because his deep voice exudes joy. I'm getting my purse! Maddie yells in the background. I laugh. I make them promise to let everyone know and ask if they'd please call my mother for me since my phone is messed up. An hour later, the room is full of Brady's clucking and shaking their heads. Kellen hugs everyone multiple times and does nothing to wipe away the tears of joy streaming down his face. Mick slaps me on the back and hugs me as if I did anything. And he must note my confused look because he says, She really trusts you, son. I can tell. And I think about that, how few people I myself have trusted, and how the number of people who trust me must be much smaller than that. But actually, recently, maybe that number is growing a bit. I stand amidst the back pats and hair ruffles, and consider that the people in this room all trust me with their beloved Orla, and the realization isn't scary or overwhelming at all. I feel a sense of pride in this relationship. When a nurse comes to kick them all out at the end of visiting hours, I make arrangements with Logan to take care of pudding. Once she has my key ring, she and Cal tell me they'll come back to the hospital with a car seat, and I'm grateful this big, nosy band of relatives is thinking of these sorts of details, since my exhausted brain had not considered that. We spend a sleepless night figuring out diaper changes and keeping track of which breast Nora eats from and when, getting checked and poked until somehow the hospital staff determines that we are qualified to go home with this baby. Are you ready for this? I ask Orla, as I walk slowly beside her to the front door. As long as I agreed to carry Nora, the hospital staff agreed that Orla didn't have to use a wheelchair perhaps because she gave them a look that suggested she would burn them to a crisp if they didn't. I'm definitely not ready for this, she says, clutching my arm and wincing a little as she walks. Aw, oh, come on now, any woman who can complete an engineering exam in active labor can surely handle one little newborn. Orla gives my arm a squeeze. She weighs nine pounds, Orla says. That's not even newborn-sized diapers. I situate Nora in the car seat, awkwardly tugging on the straps while Orla climbs in the back to ride with the baby. We decide we're going to stay at Orla's house in Morningside, at least for now, because having Kellen and Elizabeth across the street seems a lot more important now that Nora is actually here and seeming so fragile. When I pull in the driveway, we laugh, because our lawn is filled with bright decorations and it's a girl signs. I hurry up the steps to the front door with the car seat and jog back down to support Orla as she makes her way up to the porch. What's that? Orla points at a piece of paper taped to the front door. I pluck it down and hold it up so we can both read. You're welcome for the lack of pink decorations. We all broke into your house last night to set up all the crap we would have given you at the shower. You're not getting out of the spa event, though, and we're going to serve booze now. Foof. Orla smiles and looks like she's holding back tears when I open the front door to reveal a house transformed. A glider rocker has been set up in the living room with a diaper changing table and stacks of creams and wipes. I see a machine I assume is a little radio, but when we look closer, we discover it's a breast pump with a note from Maddie about how to use it. The walls are covered in banners and congratulatory decorations. Nora's bedroom is decked out with a crib. The dresser drawers are full of washed and folded clothing, and the master bedroom is now home to a bassinet, white noise machine, and another case of diapers. Orla clutches Nora to her chest and hums, turning in circles. This is... It's all just a lot, she says. I just nod. I feel teary myself, 
thinking about how much folks care to band together like that at the last minute, like it was nothing. This is everything, I say to my girls. This means everything to me, that people would do this for you. Orla squeezes my arm. For us, Walt, she says. They did it for us. Come on, and these cans are cranking out the milk that's chunking up her first grandchild. I don't have time to care if Celeste is uncomfortable. I smile again, squeezing Nora's thigh. She's gaining almost two ounces a day, I say, and look over at Celeste. Her eyes widen. That sounds like an awful lot. I mean, we want her to chunk up. She's getting primo liquid gold right now, too. I start blabbing nervously about all the food people have been bringing over, because I don't know what else to say to Walt's mom. Not only is my dad letting us stay in his spare house, but he and his girlfriend have been making us dinner every day. And Elizabeth knows all the different foods that help milk production. So everything has oats or fennel and so much protein. I've never eaten so much meat in my life. I feel myself rambling and decide to just take a pause. Nora's just finishing up, so I say, Would you like to hold her? I offer the baby out like Rafiki in The Lion King and bite back an urge to make a joke about everything the milk touches. Celeste swallows and takes Nora from me, and I put my boobs back inside my shirt. I smooth out my clothes and move over next to Celeste on the couch. She is speechless, just keeps shaking her head and saying, Oh, at the baby. Oh, my. She looks like Walt, don't you think? I tickle Nora's foot as Celeste holds her kind of awkwardly. Celeste turns to look at me. She is absolutely breathtaking. I bite the inside of my cheek and look up at the clock. It's 5.55. Come on, Wally, I mutter under my breath. I sigh in relief when I hear his car door close and his footsteps on the stairs out front. He bursts in the door and I waggle my eyebrows at him. He looks fine in his winter gear, what with the blue trousers and the fur-lined hat and that jacket that shouldn't turn me on but does. He beams when he sees us. All the best women in the world, right here on the couch, he says. And I feel smug when he kisses me on the cheek first before greeting his mother. I made spinach dip, I tell him, gesturing toward the kitchen. Oh, you're a goddess, he says. I follow him in there and laugh as he crams an entire ladle full into his mouth without bothering to dip in chunks of bread. As he chews, he pulls me in for a proper hug and then gives me one of those old Hollywood kisses where he dips me backwards a little. He sets me back upright and tugs my ponytail. I'm going to grab a shower, then I'll be back to eat the rest of that dip. I watch him jog up the stairs, admiring the view, and I sink back onto the couch. I could get used to this, I say, grinning. But Celeste looks at me strangely. I know she doesn't really approve of Walt working as a mail carrier, so I just chalk her attitude up to that. I don't love his job so much myself right now, but I don't want to talk with her about how much he's been gone. I'm not about to create a situation where he feels ganged up on again. A few days later, I'm having another great day where I shower, get dressed, and even manage to check my email. Putting hops over to nuzzle my feet as I sit at the table with my laptop. No news about your daddy, I tell him, and click the lid shut. It's getting dark, and I haven't heard from Walt at all today. So I decide to take advantage of Nora's nap and eat my dinner without him. It's definitely starting to get a little ridiculous how many hours he's working. I mean, sure, he gets paid overtime, but what good does that do him if he has no opportunity to ever spend it? I'm in bed feeding Nora by the time he gets home and crawls in beside us. I missed you, he whispers, and his lips are cold against my skin. We missed you too, I say. I try to roll over so I'm facing him. It takes a few minutes, and he finally scoops Nora up and starts covering her with kisses. I hate how much you're gone. I know, he says. I put in for my parental leave again. I'm waiting to hear from my union rep when that will be approved. Listen to you talking about union reps. I kiss his scratchy cheek. He doesn't grow much of a beard, but he does tend to get stubbly by nighttime. 
I rub against him like a cat as Nora drifts off to sleep between us. Do you have any other work lingo? Mmm, he hums. COA. Hot case. His thumb traces circles on my shoulder blades as he talks, and I want to be turned on, but I'm too tired and sore, so instead I fall asleep in his arms, vaguely aware of him scooping up Nora and talking to her softly as he changes her diaper. Walt kisses us both goodbye in the morning and spends time romping around on the floor with pudding before he sighs and starts layering on his outdoor gear. I tug his hat on his head and try not to pout as I wave goodbye to him from behind the storm door. I'm halfway to the kitchen when I hear a knock on the door, and I grin, assuming it's Walt back for one last kiss. Did you forget something? The words die on my mouth as I open the door and realize it's not Walt, but a stranger. Orla Brady? I furrow my brow at the man, who is wearing a suit and looks like an evangelist. I'm definitely not ready for unsolicited company. Yes? I cross my arms over my chest, worried I'll start leaking milk before I can get rid of this person. He hands out an envelope, which I accept, and stare down at it. You've been served, he says, and turns to rush down the stairs before I can ask questions. Served? I close and lock the front door and sit down on the couch, pulling Nora up onto my lap as I open the envelope. Inside is a thick packet of papers with lots of legal jargon. I haven't had coffee yet and only slept in small increments last night, so I'm not entirely sure what this is. I see the words DNA verification and paternity and financial responsibility, and I start to panic. What is this? I set the papers down and take a few deep breaths. I'm not thinking clearly, and this isn't my forte. I pick up the phone to call my dad, who answers immediately. Is something wrong? Does Nora need her grampy? I smile. Nora always needs her grampy, dad. But actually, something weird happened this morning. Can you stop over on your way to work and take a look at something for me? He's bounding out the front door within seconds, and I shake my head as I watch him dash across the street. I let him in and wait patiently while he cuddles Nora, greets Pudding, and then asks me what's going on. He studies the documents carefully, saying nothing. His face gives nothing away until he gets to the last page for the second time, and I see him press his lips tightly together. What is it, Dad? Something about Nora and Walt? Dad shakes his head and inhales sharply through his nose. This is a subpoena for you to submit Nora for a DNA test, Orla. The documents call for establishing paternity and creating a custody and support agreement. I hear him saying those words, and they make no sense to me. Why would Nora need a DNA test? What has Walt been up to all this time he hasn't been here at home with us? Dad squeezes my leg. It looks like the Sheffield family is concerned about their assets, sweetie. These papers, they make it seem like you are trying to go after their money. I snap my head back. What money? Walt said there is no money. His stupid dad squandered it all away. I stand up and clutch Nora against my chest. Don't answer that. It's undignified and against the point. Me? A gold digger? Orla? Let's talk about... I'm pacing in tight circles now. I can't begin to verbalize how angry I'm feeling right now. I didn't even want him to be involved. I didn't want anything to do with the fucking Sheffield family after I learned the truth about their business dealings. I think about how rarely he's here. I think about how loving he seems when he is here and how strange it is for him to be arranging to send legal paperwork to the house without discussing it with me. My eyes flare wide, and I feel my heart racing. I knew his whole Good Samaritan mailman persona was a long con. God, he had me fooled. Where is Walt, Orla? Let's ask him why he would have these sent to the house. I burst out with a high-pitched sound. He's at work, obviously. He's always at work. I'm surprised he could get a day off to bring me and Nora home from the hospital. Dad nods and I can tell he's trying to consider this whole thing rationally. 
But there is nothing to rationalize, is there? Dad sighs. I have a hypothesis here, and I know it's going to be upsetting. I halt and stare at my father. He blinks. God, Dad, don't leave me hanging here. What? Your hypotheses are never wrong. Dad licks his lips and sighs again. This really seems like something Celeste would have set in motion. Have you spoken with her since she came over to meet Nora? As soon as he says the words, I know he's right. I set my teeth and pull my daughter close, kissing the top of her head and pausing for a long sniff because I can't help it. You're right, I tell him. And no, I haven't spoken to her. I've barely even seen Walt. He works all the damn time. Dad nods. He has a challenging job. I'm pacing tight circles now, my heart racing. Is he trying to get out of being with us? Because I can make that happen for him really quick. I snarl and rant, and Dad stands up, walking toward me. I'm sure that's not what's happening here, sweetie. Yeah? Between the long hours and this bullshit legal crap? I thrust Nora out toward my dad, and I go into the bathroom to splash cold water on my face. I stare at my reflection, at the dark circles under my eyes from not sleeping, at the puffy chin I still have from the weight I gained carrying Nora. I let myself rely on him. I let myself believe we could be a family together. Custody and support agreement? Fuck him, I shout at myself in the mirror. I storm out of the bathroom and stomp over to the couch, where Dad is still sitting, looking concerned. I grab my cell phone and look up the number for the locksmith. This shit ends right now. What did my mother do? Kellen smiles briefly at me. Talk to your mother. Find out what's going on with the papers. And son? My mouth is dry at his endearment. It feels so overwhelming to hear another man call me that. A man who has never been anything but nice to me. He shakes his head. Talk to Orla about those long hours at work. You've got a newborn. Kellen extends an arm back down toward the driveway and doesn't say another word. I stare at him for a few minutes before I clear my throat and point to the pile of things on the porch. My customers sent all these things for Orla and Nora, I tell him. Can you please see that they get them? His nod is barely perceptible, and I back down the stairs and climb into my car. Kellen stands on the porch with his arms crossed, so I back out of the driveway and down the block before pulling over to think. I haven't even seen my daughter since this morning. Orla received some sort of court summons in the mail, and I wasn't even able to help her navigate that. I groan and pull up our lawyer in my contacts. Watson, hey, it's Walt Sheffield. I was wondering if you knew... Trip, hey, no worries. I got the notification that Miss Brady was served this morning. I thought your mother would have told you. My mother? He laughs. Yeah, she said she was setting all this in motion for you. Jesus Christ, my family. You have to know I was not involved in setting this in motion. How in the hell can you serve my family a subpoena without my permission? I got home today, and I think my girlfriend changed the locks on me. He makes a sympathetic sound. Yeah, that'll happen in these cases. What cases? Watson, you're helping my mother fuck me over. Now talk to me like I'm five here. What did my mother have you do? I drive to my childhood home in a blind rage and barge in the front door without knocking. I find my mother in the dining room, clutching a wine glass to her chest and looking alarmed. Trippy, what on earth are you doing here? Cut the crap, Mom. She sputters. Is this about the paperwork? I can assure you, Mr. Watson said it's all very standard. You're not married. A DNA test is standard in these cases, sweetheart. She sets her wine glass down and folds her hands on the table. I throw one of the dining chairs and walk closer to her. DNA test? For what? You need to tell me exactly why you had Watson serve my family with court papers. Please sit down, Trippy. You're upset. Her face has gone paler than usual, and she pushes her plate of food away from her. Do not call me that anymore. I hate that name. Call me Walt, mother. And you're damned right I'm upset. You, for some reason, took it upon yourself to meddle into my family and make my girlfriend think that I think she's a gold digger. Or, God, what if she thinks I'm trying to get out of my responsibility to Nora? 
The way she was talking the other day, relying on charity to provide food, squatting in a house she can't pay for. What kind of message does that send? I'm just looking after our assets, sweetheart. I throw another chair. Mother, there are no assets. What in the actual fuck is wrong with you? Her eyes widen. I squat on the ground in front of her. Listen to me. Your husband, my father, left us with nothing. You are barely hanging onto the house. You are clinging to a lifestyle you can no longer afford, even with the life insurance. There is nothing for Orla or anyone to come after. She starts shaking her head, and I stand up and stomp my foot. How dare you accuse her of that? Do you know what she was doing when she went into labor? She was seven hours into one of the most comprehensive engineering exams around. Do you know how few people can even attempt to take that, let alone do it? Orla Brady is an absolute rock star, and I don't deserve her. And now, thanks to your meddling, I've most likely lost her. I put my hands on my mother's shoulders and force her to look me in the eye. You might have just cost me my daughter, mother. My child. Mom starts crying, but I don't have time for her emotions right now. You're going to fix this. You're going to tell my family that this is your doing, and you're not going to meddle into my affairs ever again. If you ever want to see me or your granddaughter ever again, you are going to make this right. I storm out of the house without waiting for her response. Chapter 36 Orla I don't feel like having a spa night with my friends. I don't feel like doing anything at all. I've been walking around in a haze. Elizabeth and Maddie come over periodically to make sure I'm drinking enough water. My own father stood on the stoop and tried to be good cop talking to Walt, like it's okay for his family to meddle while he's out working every single hour of the day. Fuck that. I didn't invite him into this whole situation just to raise the kid on my own anyway. Today, when Nicole burst in the front door to collect me, I just assumed it was another hydration intervention. But she hauled me and Nora into the car. I know you already got the presents. That's the best part, Orla. Now we can stick you in a chair and rub your feet and sniff your baby while Esther plies us with drinks. I snored and tried to comb my fingers through my hair. I'm not sure when I last showered. I actually don't know how much time has passed since the subpoena, but I haven't been good at keeping track of time since Nora arrived. Nicole parks outside Bridges and Bitters and scoops Nora out of her car seat, and I follow behind with the diaper bag. The back room is full when we walk in, and everyone cheers. Nicole is immediately swarmed with foof ladies wanting to meet Nora, and Esther escorts me to one of the pedicure chairs. I slump into the chair, only briefly caring that I haven't shaved my legs, and the nail technician is going to be rubbing her hands through stubble. Emma Stagg hands Nora to me to nurse, and when she's done, Maddie scoops her back away. I don't even have the energy to put my boob away, and so I'm sitting there with a Moscow mule, tits out, getting my toes painted, when Juniper Jones shouts at me. Hey! She taps her foot and I startle, nearly dropping my drink. First of all, you have to put your boobs back in your bra, Orla. I know we're friends here, and I myself breastfed giant stag babies, but you, my friend, are a mess. The nail tech blushes. I sigh and set my drink down so I can fasten my nursing bra with both hands. Juniper smiles and helps me up out of the spa chair, guiding me over to a station where another vendor is threading eyebrows. This is actually a pretty great event Nicole put together. I feel bad that I'm not able to be more present. Now, Juniper says, taking a seat across from me and putting on a sweatband to hold her short hair back from her forehead so she can get her brows done. Once I'm done here, I'm going to look at the papers your family tells me you were served. Sound good? I nod and watch as she doesn't even wince, as her dark brow hairs are yanked out of her face. I'm not nearly as stoic when it's my turn, yelping and squirming, but I share in Juniper's observation that the results are pretty good. I look like... More me, I tell her, turning my face a bit to stare in the handheld mirror. Damn right, Juniper says. Now give me the papers. Nicole said she was going to slip them into the diaper bag when she went to get you. I raise my newly shaped brows and rummage in the bag to discover she is correct. 
I slide the folder over to Juniper, who scoots her chair closer to mine and mutters to herself as she traces along with her finger. Okay, she says. This is really standard paperwork for families of financial means, even sometimes if the couple is married. She flips through the final few pages. But the fact that Walt didn't mention anything to you is very odd. Not gonna lie. Well, I snort. In order to mention it to me, he'd have to come home sometimes during waking hours, which, in case you don't remember, are all the hours because we have a newborn. Juniper pats my arm. We're going to figure this out, okay? Just then a hush falls over the room, and I look up when Nicole says pointedly, This is a private engagement. Oh, hell no, I say, when I see who she's talking to. I stand up and say, That's Wally's fucking mom. I don't want to see her. Foof forms a human wall around me, all standing with their hands on their hips, regardless of what stage they are at in their spa treatments. Esther comes in the door holding what appears to be a polished chrome pipe, smacking it against her hand menacingly. She says, If you've got more papers to serve, you can just leave them and be on your way. Celeste wrings her hands and seems to tremble. She opens her mouth to say something, but no sound comes out. I'm standing behind my wall of friends, holding Nora against my chest, but I'm way taller than Emma and Chloe in front of me, and I can see Celeste wobbling, like she's going to fall over. Please, she begs, her voice cracking. I need to tell you something. Nicole looks like she wants to drive a spike through Celeste's heart, but she says, You have exactly two minutes, and then I'll drag you out of here myself if we don't like what you have to say. Celeste looks around the room and the rows of angry eyes fixed on her. Logan taps one fingernail on her watch, and Celeste draws a shaky breath. I had the papers sent to you, Orla. I was the one who called the lawyer after I came to meet the baby. She fishes in her pocket for a tissue and tugs on it with both hands. Trippy, Walt is furious with me. He's refusing my calls. She closes her eyes and a tear slips out. Do you know what it's like for your own son to refuse your phone calls? Nobody says anything and Celeste keeps talking. He says I have to make this right. That I have to make you understand. Well, I suppose after I left your home, I imagined that you were rather desperate for money because you were talking about receiving meals and free rent. Maddie snorts. Oh, come on. Seriously? But Logan elbows her and she closes her lips. Celeste looks just at me now. I assumed that because I would have been, in your shoes, desperate, that is. The way I was raised. There was never any question that I'd stay home in support of my husband and his career. I... I want to tell you something not as an excuse for my behavior, she sniffs. But perhaps you'd accept an explanation from me. I don't encourage her, but I don't tell her to kick rocks either, so she continues. College was for meeting sorority sisters from good families, building connections, finding a husband. You have to understand, Orla, that that is all I've known. Nicole is frowning now and staring at Celeste intently. But Nick no longer looks irate, so I let myself relax my posture a little as Celeste continues. I barely knew Walton when we married. My father owed his a favor, if you can believe that, and encouraged me to spend time with. It was practically arranged. Piper walks over and offers Celeste a chair, and gradually the foof ladies return to their seats as Celeste keeps talking about how she's been groomed her entire life to be a model housewife. Walt came to my home and told me about your exams and your career, Orla. And he talked about you so passionately, with so much pride. I saw in his face that he was in love with you and your drive and your goals. She dabs at her face. I've never had goals, other than the ones my family set for me, to marry up and raise respectable children, and the men deemed acceptable for me. Well, they would never take pride in a woman doing such things as that. Sam murmurs. Fucking patriarchy. And everyone around me groans in agreement. Celeste turns to face her. 
I was a teen in the 70s, she says. Feminism was a bad word at our country club, a word for crass women who couldn't land a proper husband. She shudders. My husband's love was always conditional, she says. I always knew my looks mattered more than anything I had to say about him or his work or his ideas. I was just supposed to look good and be pleasant, she shrugs. And if I didn't feel pleasant, I drank gin or took pills until I could pretend. Celeste shudders. My husband never once looked at me the way I saw my son look at you when he came home from work the other day, when I was at your home. She swallows and closes her eyes, and she's silent for a long time. Nobody says a word until she opens her eyes. I'm so sorry, Orla. I don't know how to be a supportive mother to Walt. I don't know how to be a mother-in-law to an ambitious woman. I don't even know how to be among society anymore. Not after the humiliation of my husband's final years. She drifts off and starts crying until eventually, Chloe walks over to sit next to her and pulls her in for a hug. I watch as my friends gather around her and offer her drinks of water and tissues. Celeste cries harder in the face of their kindness. How can you possibly forgive me? She shakes her head. What matters is that you forgive my son. This was not his fault. He says he's been trying to escape me for years. My son. I drove my own son away from me. As Celeste breaks down, I sigh and walk toward her with Nora. Chloe gets up from the seat next to Celeste, and I sink into it. Look, I say, turning Nora to face her grandmother. I'm terrible with feelings, mine and other people's. Yes, it's fucking awful the pressures you and your husband placed on Walt growing up. Nobody needs that bullshit. She starts crying again. I hold out my hand. But it sounds like you suffered through the same bullshit for your whole life, too. And you were just... I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying here. But I promise, I'm not after your money. She clutches at her chest. Oh, God, I know that now. I apologize for setting those papers in motion. I've called Mr. Watson and told him to shred everything. I feel the urge to say thank you but I know that's not the right emotion to convey in this situation. I'm glad you did that, I say finally. I bounce Nora on my lap and stare at this wounded woman who has inflicted so much pain and has been harmed as well. Then, like she's reading my mind, Chloe stands up and says, Hurt people hurt people, she squeezes Celeste's shoulder. It's good that you came here to say all that today, Mrs. Sheffield. It's a good first step. Celeste swallows. I don't know what comes next. She looks around the room. I think this is the quietest a foof meeting has ever been. Well, Sam says, tapping on the table, this group here, we call ourselves Fresh Out of Fox. We gather together to help each other overcome these kinds of problems. Celeste's eyes widen at Sam's flagrant use of profanity. Feminism isn't a bad word. It's not about destroying men. Feminism and foof are about empowering women to make their own damn choices, pursue their own goals. Hell, just having a goal is a radical act for a woman, apparently. There's a chorus of agreement. Celeste nods, slightly. Sam grins and looks around the room. Well, ladies, we have a new member whose goal is to atone for shitty meddling. She raises her brows at Celeste, whose jaw drops open. Sam continues, and I think Celeste is going to work on identifying some personal goals now that she's newly single and currently not employed. Oh, I've never been employed, Celeste says. Sam waves a hand. Doesn't matter. She steps towards Celeste and sets a hand on her shoulder. We're going to help you, Celeste, but you have to let go of your fucks. Can you do that? Celeste's eyes are wide, and her lip trembles. She whispers, I have no earthly idea. She looks around the room, and she looks at me, and finally at Nora. Nicole nods and says, we can work with that. Chapter 37 Walt 
I feel a huge sense of deja vu as I sit in my living room, just staring at the wall. I have no girlfriend, no parents. At least I have a job. A job that denied my request for parental leave and is impacting my relationship with my girlfriend and my baby. My Nora. I ache to hold her, to see her. I don't know how I'll ever forgive my mother for what she did, for jeopardizing the family I started to build for myself on my own terms. Nora is supposed to be my chance to show someone all the love and warmth I never felt. And damn it, Orla too. I need her. I need her to understand that I would never do something like this to shake her trust in me. I cannot bear to think she thinks of me as the same sort of person my father was. A lifetime of anger throbs through my veins until I feel helpless. I've tried calling Orla hundreds of times, but she clearly has my number blocked, or else her phone has really been turned off for days. I understand the urge. After I drove up and screamed at my mother, I blocked her number too. I just am not ready to listen to anything she has to say about the situation. Not yet. I have to figure out something I can do to at least talk to them. Half of me wants to run to the police station and demand that they make sure I can spend time with my daughter. It's killing me, not knowing how her face has changed, or if she has a rash, or all those thousand things I got to learn about her every day, even if I had to be at work. I hear a knock at the door, and I ignore it, assuming it's a political canvasser or the mail carrier with more certified mail for me. I scoff at the absurdity, but the knocking persists. When I look outside, I see Orla on my stoop looking irritated, and I open the door so fast she topples inside with the baby carrier. I catch them both before we all hit the floor. Orla! Hey. She looks at me and doesn't say anything further. I feel like I can't breathe. I want to hide and squeeze them. I want to scream and laugh. Oh, God, my baby girl! I reach for Nora who is awake in her seat and staring at me from beneath her knitted replica mailman hat that Orla found online. I scoop her out of the seat and pull her close, inhaling her, peppering her with kisses. She brings her tiny hand up to grab at my nose. I hear a click and look up to see Logan grinning from the stoop, taking a picture with her phone. You're so cute with her, Walt, she says, smiling. She looks at Orla. Okay, well, you're here. I'm going to give you privacy now. Orla looks at her. What if I hurt him and you're not here to protect him? Logan pats Orla on the head as she helps her to her feet. Nobody is getting a smackdown. I trust you with your baby daddy. Orla glares at me as Logan waves and walks toward her car. I squat on the ground holding Nora, frozen in place and afraid to move. I want to spring up and wrap Orla in my arms. I want to just blurt out all my apologies for ever bringing my stupid parents into her world. But I've also spent decades being told to keep my trap shut, so I lean into that training and wait for Orla to talk. She turns toward me, blowing her hair out of her face with a puff. Your mom came to my baby shower, she says. I groan. Oh, God, I'm so sorry, Orla. Please, let me explain that... She holds her hand up. Celeste told me that all the paperwork was her idea, and then she talked about how she's always been a prisoner of her privilege. I raised my brow, surprised to learn my mother would say anything of this nature to Orla. She continues. I'm still really fucking mad at her, Walt. I just don't downshift that fast, especially knowing how much you have been hurt by her and your dad over, well, over your whole life. I nod, swallowing down a lump. Is it possible to choke on emotions? To actually suffocate? Orla takes a deep breath. I'm really sorry I was so fast to lock you out, and I'm sorry I kept you from Nora, Walt. That won't ever happen again. I understand why you did it, I say. I want to hug her. My arms burn to be holding both of them. I don't want crippling indecision to stand in my way, so I just say, I really want to hug you, Orla. Can I hold you? She holds up a palm. Not so fast. I'm not done. I swallow and nod my head toward the couch. She doesn't sit, though. She stands in front of me with her arms crossed, frowning down at me. You work too much. I slump against the couch. 
I know I do, but what can I do? I don't have my own route yet. I keep getting shuffled around and it's taking me ten hours to do something that Mark can do in six. Well, then fucking have Mark do it, Walt. You took one day off when your baby was born. One day. Yeah, I snap. And I caught a lot of shit for it. Her eyes flash. Do you really want to work in a place that gives you crap for taking one day to get your baby home from the hospital? The hospital, Walt. I scrub my palm down my cheek, noticing that I haven't shaved. I think about what she's saying, and I know she's right. But I also need her to understand how this job is the first thing I've ever had on my own terms. The first thing I was ever able to take pride in. I take a deep breath. I'll talk to them again about my hours, but I need you to appreciate that I'm committed to this job. Her nostrils flare, and I watch as she takes a deep breath, considering. Finally, she nods and sits next to me on the couch. I want to work on shit with you, Walt. I love you. I suck at trust and communicating, and I'm stubborn, but I love you, and I need you. Oh, God, Orla, I need you, too. I need you and Nora so much. I pounce, pulling her close with one arm while Nora is cradled between us. I inhale the scent of the top of her head, never wanting to be apart from her long enough to forget how this feels, ever again. I'm not sure how long we sit there, hugging in the living room. Eventually, I feel something wet and sticky on my arm, and we realize Nora has blown out her diaper. This leads us both to further realize we don't have any baby stuff here apart from what's in the diaper bag. Orla washes Nora's butt in my kitchen sink with the dish sprayer, and it feels so good to laugh with her about the mess, about the chaotic reality of life with babies. Slowly, my body begins to unclench from the past few days. We can work on this. She wants to work on this. Nothing about our evening is elegant or refined, and yet I'm more comfortable in the middle of a literal shitstorm than I've ever been, because I'm not alone. Orla packs Nora into my car, and we drive back to the house in Morningside, and I breathe easy, because I'm back where I belong. For now. Chapter 38 Walt April Did you pack her giraffe? Orla shouts from the kitchen where she's packing lunches for all of us. Bottled breast milk for Nora, a regular lunch for herself, and an entire cooler full of fat and protein for me. I got the giraffe and the crinkle thing. We're so lucky that we don't have to take Nora very far for childcare. Elizabeth watches her two days a week across the street and my mom has been sitting with her at our house the other three days. It's been a challenge. Orla wasn't thrilled with the idea, but we didn't want Nora to start at a daycare center before she had all her vaccinations. We argued a lot about relying on grandparents instead of me being able to take parental leave. We argue about my job a lot, actually. Orla pokes her head around the kitchen wall. Today's an Elizabeth day, right? It's Friday right now? Yep, totally Friday. Okay, then I'm not going to worry about the dishes until later. She's down the hall before I can remind her that she doesn't need to worry about the dishes while my mom is here either. Mom has been working really hard on herself. She's probably never going to be best friends with Orla, but I really think Mom has come a long way. You know, I shout, I caught Mom cuddling with pudding the other day. Orla freezes in her tracks and comes into the living room, where I'm squatting as I stuff diapers into Nora's bag. She was cuddling? Like, on the ground? Yep. I pop my pee as I point to the guy in question, currently chewing on one of Nora's little moccasins. Give me that, you rascal. I pry the shoe away from him and grin at Orla. I've caught Mom nuzzling with pudding enough that I'm trying to get her to come with me to the next bingo fundraiser. Orla's jaw hangs open in surprise. You're trying to get your mother into a fire hall to play bingo with other ladies? I nod. Give me three months and I think Susan will have her signed up to foster. Orla raises a brow at me and grabs her bag. Well, keep me posted on that. You okay to drop her off over there? I nod, and she kisses us both and rushes out the door to ride into the office with her father. They wave at me from across the street as I finally start walking down the porch steps. Elizabeth greets me with her usual friendly kiss on the cheek. It feels really good to be a part of a big family like this, 
Even if Orla's cousins do get annoying when they argue about the structural stability of my messenger bag, or show up here unannounced, not that I'm home much for the unannounced visits, I sigh as I drive to the station. My work hours are probably at least half the reason Orla's cousins show up as often as they do. She went back to Beltane without missing a beat, starting up a new fire detection project and even bringing in Cal to partner on autonomous fire protection something something. I sometimes come home to find the two of them on the couch with Nora, asking the baby her opinions about fire safety along power lines in remote locations. It's sweet, and I remind myself it's good that she has the support, even as the thought eats at me that it should be me there asking my daughter questions, not Nora's uncle. The Bluetooth in my car picks up an incoming call from Orla just as I'm pulling into the lot. Hey, she says, sounding frenzied. Do you think your mom would come with me to Kentucky? What? Why would you ask that? She sighs. Cal and Liam and I are presenting a proposal to the utilities managers in Lexington. I don't want to deal with the milk pumping to leave Nora at home. Okay, first of all, that's amazing. And second, why wouldn't I be the one to come with you? She pauses. Walt, when could you go to Kentucky? Are you saying you could get time off to go on a multi-day trip? My heart sinks as I realize she's right. But what's worse? She's accepted this as the truth. She can't rely on me when she has to take a business trip, and she seems resigned to looking elsewhere for support. I don't know what to say, I tell her. Okay, well, take a few hours and think about it, because I need to start making arrangements. Elizabeth can't come because Jake has finals, and she can't leave him home alone, obviously. Sure, sure, I just... Can't believe my mom is the option here. Hey, babe, Dad is here to brief me on our strategy for this. We just found out they liked our proposal, so this is all unfolding really fast. We hang up, and I stare at the parking lot, where my colleagues are bustling around already. Some of them have been here for hours. I see Mark and give him a wave, smiling when he grins back at me. I do enjoy my work, and this job really saved me when my entire life was fraying at the seams. I chew on the inside of my cheek. My life is fraying at the seams now. Orla and I have had a very chaste, business-like arrangement ever since the incident with my mom and the paperwork. I know we have a newborn, and I know that's rough on all relationships. I also know she resents how much I'm gone. I just didn't know she had mentally recast me as a side character in her life. I look at my picture of Nora on my phone lock screen. Mark circles over to my car and wraps his knuckles on the window, pointing at his watch. I wave him off. I stare at my daughter's picture and think about the reality that my partner cannot rely on me for physical support. We've established that we love each other, and I know she relies on me emotionally, and that alone is deeply meaningful to me. But this stings. It makes me feel useless again. Powerless. I scoff, shaking my head. I know that my hours at work will theoretically ease once I earn my own route, but my family needs me right now, and the one thing that's more important to me than anything else is to be present as a father. Christ, it's not like we need the money, I mutter, climbing out of the car. We're sitting on the sale of my townhouse until we figure out where we want to live permanently, and Orla gets paid a badass salary for badass work. I've also worked plus overtime, nearly every day for the past ten months, and with that one phone call from Orla, I realize that it's not something I can continue to do. Being a mail carrier helped me stop being Trip and learn how to be Walt, but now the job is keeping me from being a dad. Panicking and sweating, I climb out of the car and swerve past my colleagues into the main offices. I need to talk with my manager. Chapter 39 Walt When Orla walks in the door, I greet her with flowers. I also got some apple blossoms for pudding to eat, since I didn't want him to feel left out, so there's a convenient trail of pink petals all through the house as my Celtic queen walks in through the garage with her eyebrow arched. What's all this? Well, I lean against the counter. First of all, our daughter is still across the street, so any reactions you have can be as loud as you like. Reactions to what? Why are you here during daylight? I want to go to Kentucky with you, I tell her. 
I want to go everywhere with you. I beckon for her to step closer, and as soon as I can reach her, I tug on the belt loop of her jeans. She's got a tool belt in one hand and her hard hat in the other, and it's taking all my self-control not to yank the leather gloves from her back pocket and beg her to put them on. I'm super glad you want that, Walt. Is that even possible? I quit my job today, I tell her, and I smile when she holds a hand over her mouth in surprise. But you love your job, I shake my head. Not as much as I love you and Nora, I tell her, holding up a hand. But that's not the end of the story. I take the hard hat and tool belt from her and set them on the counter behind me. Pudding hops around the counter and starts eating the petals he spilled on the floor earlier as I squeeze Orla's ass and pull her close. As you know, I say, running my fingers through her ponytail. They're very short-staffed at the post office. She nods. After we hung up today, I felt like shit. I sat in my car until Mark started kicking it, and then I went inside to quit my job. I tell Orla how much I hated doing that, how I've been a kept man my entire life, and it made me feel like trash. I tell her how much I enjoy being a bright light in people's day, about opening cat food cans for Mrs. Natali. But, I add, I also know that I can't be the type of man whose partner doesn't even consider him among the short list of adults she can rely on. Orla's shoulders sag. She opens her mouth to say something, but I stop her. I know you want to rely on me, Orla. But you're right that you can't. Not with how things are going at work. I mean, what's the point of having a union if I can't even get a few days off when my baby is born? Orla stares at me and picks at a piece of fuzz on my shirt. I sniff. So, anyway, I tried to quit, and I was walking back to my car where my boss actually chased me down and begged me not to. She raises a brow at me. He told me I've got great aptitude for this work, and they have me on a short list to get my own route. Don't roll your eyes, I'm getting to the good part. I told him I need a month off. She squints and tilts her head to the side. A month? An entire month? I nod. I explained how my very important girlfriend had very important work out of state and I need to be available to care for my newborn, and then I reminded him that he had declined my request for parental leave when Nora was born and I really got going. I threatened to have Watson call him about violating labor laws. Orla grins at me. Would you do something like that? I shrug. Probably not, but you need me here. She exhales. I do need you, Walt. That's very true. I like hearing you say that, I tell her. I know it's a big deal for Orla to be vulnerable like that and admit that she needs someone. I want to be here to hear you say that, and anything else you need to say to me. They can't just work you all the time like that, she says. I don't understand how they can stay in business when they treat people like that. I kiss her on the temple and feel her sink into me a little more. I like this, holding her, listening to her be mad on my behalf. I'm off for a month, and then I'm being promoted to regular. Orla makes a face. Regular? What the hell are you now? I'll have you know I've been a city carrier assistant. Hmm, she says, reaching up to rub my face. I don't like how they treat their assistants. I promise I'll never treat my assistant that way if I get one. She grins and calls me a doofus, but then she lets me hug her, and eventually she lets me carry her to the couch, where I hold her for a long, long time. Nora showering, putting on pants that zip, but I'm too distracted by anticipation. I negotiated working from home one day a week when I came back from maternity leave. It was my dad's idea. Sometimes I hate that he suggests these things to me, since I already work for the family business and feel a little bit like a schmuck getting a leg up. But damn it, I'm doing cool stuff, and I'm bringing in a ton of new business for Beltane. Studying for my test, I learned about all these cool systems to place smoke and fire detectors throughout forests, linking them to electronic alert systems— I've become obsessed with it, reading up while Nora's nursing and grilling Dad hardcore about the project he and Liam are working on with power lines throughout Appalachia. I just need the damn paperwork about my professional license. I even have the frame all ready to go. I watch a few episodes of Vikings at Logan's suggestion. 
But watching Queen Lagerta engineer defensive walls around her realm just makes me even more anxious to find out if I met the mark in my own engineering work. I spend most of my afternoon standing in the picture window, staring at the street, looking for that damn mail truck to park. It's late when I finally see it, and I can't identify the mail carrier when they start at the other end of my street. I debate getting dressed and bundling up Nora to rush out and storm the truck, but I remind myself that the mail will get here faster than I can get a newborn out the door. She's just about asleep when the truck moves up a few houses. I bite my lip but the guy is doing the far side of the street first. That motherfucker is doing our house last. Why today of all days? I set Nora down in her bassinet and listen for the metal clang as the mail guy lifts the lid outside, but it doesn't come. Instead, I hear the front door open and I pad down the hall to see Walt, standing in the doorway with a big grin on his handsome face. Special delivery, he says, waving an envelope in the air. You beautiful asshole. You covered our street today? He nods. I wanted to be the one to bring you the good news. I gasp. Did you open my mail? That's a crime, sir. He shakes his head and holds my letter up high while he drops his mail bag on the ground and shrugs out of his coat. I don't have to open it. I know what it says. I resist the urge to jump at the letter he's holding up high. I put my hands on my hips and glare at him until he laughs and hands me the envelope. He spins me around and pulls me against his chest, looking over my shoulder as I peel open the corner of the envelope and slide out the letter. Don't read out loud, I tell him as I feel him gearing up. Dear Ms. Brady, we are delighted to inform you that... I stop reading and clamp my hand over my mouth to squeal. Nora's asleep. I whisper yell to Walt, who is squeezing me and pulsing his arms around me almost like he's doing the Heimlich. I jump up and down as best I can in his hug, and then I sigh, sinking back against him. That's such a weight off, I tell him. He sucks on my neck. I didn't know you'd been carrying it, he murmurs. I would have told you that any woman who can blast a baby out in a parking lot can pass a silly old test. I swat him with the letter. This feels like an opportunity where I should be mature and open about my feelings. This is what my therapist tells me. I started seeing a counselor after Walt moved back in. She herself lost her mom at a young age, and I can bring Nora with me to my appointments. I've only had a few so far. But I like that she gives me specific homework, such as telling Walt my feelings. I spin around to face him, glad he doesn't let go of his hug. I wasn't anxious that I'd fail, I tell him, but I needed that hurdle so much. I needed to prove that I could do it, and I need that qualification to do the next project I want to work on. He nods. I want to hear all about your project. He starts kissing my neck. Do you want to tell me first, or do you want to celebrate? I laugh. How do you know how I want to celebrate? Hmm... His voice is low and deep, and I love how his chest rumbles against me. Last time you finished a goal, I believe there were euphemism emojis. He thrusts his hips against me, and I feel exactly how excited he is about celebrating, and then I realize how strange it is for him to be home like this. What are you doing here, really? He bites my neck. This is my route now. I pull back to look him in the eye. Seriously? You got a route? He nods and honks one of my boobs. What does it mean? It means, he kisses my throat. I deliver the mail in Morningside every day. He kisses my earlobe. And then I come home to make dinner for my hot goddess girlfriend. Pleasure zings through my body as he nuzzles against me. You'll really be here every evening? Everyone you'll have me. Walt reaches for my crotch and I draw back. I don't know if I'm ready for this. We've had a few makeout sessions here and there since Nora arrived, but I've mostly been too tired to take it any farther. Hey, he soothes, putting some space between us but not letting me go. Tell me what you're thinking. I bite my lip and shake my head. Tell me, Orla. I'm right here. I'm afraid Nora broke my vagina. It's a mess. I clap a hand over my mouth after I blurt it out. I've been holding that suspicion in for a long time. 
but between fighting about Walt's job and learning to be a parent and getting stitches, I just haven't wanted his monster cock in there at all. Your vagina is perfect, he says as he licks my earlobe. When did my earlobe become such a sensitive body part? This feels amazing. It looks exactly like it should look after a human being passes through it. When have you been looking? My instinct is always to tease him when he says something nice, something emotional. I need to tell him how I feel. I'm afraid you won't think I'm sexy right now. He stiffens. Is that really what you think? He looks aghast. I chew on my cheek. You get hotter every day, with your mailman butt and your forearm veins, and I'm not even able to go running right now, and I think my crotch looks like chopped ham. Walt sinks to his knees and rests his cheek on my stomach. He looks up at me and his blue eyes are glistening. Orla fucking Brady, you're the most beautiful woman in the entire world. From the moment I saw you, I've been obsessed, not just with how you look, but with all the parts of you. He starts squeezing my thighs and tracing fingers along my belly, making me shiver. You are fierce and brilliant, and I'd be honored if you let me make you come in celebration of passing your big, impressive milestone. God, Walt, you can't just say things like that. I start crying. Why? He stands back up and dabs at my cheek with his thumb. Because you're making me feel things. He kisses me. Big loving things. Like, I can't imagine life without you when you say shit like that. He kisses me again. You make me feel cherished. I squeak as he scoops me up and carries me down the hall toward our room. I do cherish you, Orla. Let me show you how much. Mm, yes, please. He sets me on the bed and starts taking off his work clothes. I slither out of my nursing shirt and jeans, and before I know it, I'm sighing under the weight of a naked Walt, pressing me into the mattress while he kisses me all over. He moves to put his mouth on my breast, but I put up a hand to stop him before he gets to my nipple. Please, no, I groan. It's too weird for me with nursing. He kisses my sternum and smiles. You got it. He settles his weight on one forearm and stares into my eyes as I feel his hand slide lower and lower. Finally, his fingers reach my hip. Your hands are cold, I breathe. But I like it. And it's true. I like everything he's doing right now. The way he's so gentle. Daddy ran too, says my bride. And it's probably the best sentence I've ever heard. I drape a sweaty arm around both of them and we stand there, letting the chaos blend into the background until the Brady guy starts slapping us on the back. Well, Orla just set the unbreakable record, Liam says, sounding a little forlorn. None of us can ever compete with running a full marathon while pregnant. Speak for yourself, Maddie says, elbowing him. He whips his head around to look at her, and she rolls her eyes. Relax, I just mean it's not outside the realm of possibility. For me. Orla hands Nora to Maddie and turns back into me, like she can't stop hugging me. I'm not about to complain. Mick trots over with a pair of finisher medals dangling off his arm. Figured you two would forget about the hardware, he says, handing us each the correct medal for our distance. I do a double take when I see my mom at the finish along with the rest of the Brady crew. Hey, I say, walking over to hug her. We've been hugging more since Nora was born. It was awkward at first, but we're getting better at it, even in public. I thought you said you had plans today. She smiles. These are my plans. Surprise! Mom wraps her arms around me briefly, but then pulls back when she feels how wet and sticky I am, between the sweat and the hose. I'm pretty gross. I'll give her that. We all make our way toward the park where there's more room. Plus, Orla keeps insisting she needs two bananas, since she ran the race for two. Nobody is about to argue with her. We find a place to sit down under a tree, chugging down water and cuddling. I start massaging Orla's shoulders and kissing her neck until I notice her father standing above us, his brow furrowed. He points at my hand as I work out a knot in Orla's neck. Walt, he says, putting his hands on his hips. Want to tell me about the bling you picked up since I saw you last? I grin at him. Oh, this? My wife gave it to me. 
Orla bursts out laughing and rests her head back on my shoulder, snorting. How long have you been planning that line? I kiss her ear. At least a week. Wife! Callan looks more shocked than when Orla first told him I was Nora's father, more surprised than when she told him we were having a second baby. Orla, what on earth is going on? Orla springs to her feet and shows her dad the blue wedding band on her left hand, beaming. Walt and I decided to do a thing, she says, waving her hand around like I gave her a giant diamond instead of a stretchy blue band. But to Orla, the practical band means more. I'd buy her a hundred diamonds if she wanted them, but I know that what she wants most in the world is to be herself, to traipse off into the woods checking the electrical grid and helping to supervise her former interns before their engineering exams. I know that Orla wants a man she can rely on, who supports her and loves her for all that she is. And I know that becoming that man has meant more to me than I can say. I spin my own ring around my hand, excited for the promise it brings, for tomorrow and the day after that. Kellen looks back and forth between us. Can you get married in the middle of a race like that? Is that a thing? Orla pecks him on the cheek. Let's go home. She pats her stomach. I'm hungry, and I'll tell you over barbecue. Thank you for listening to Current, A Secret Baby Romance, the Brady Family Series, Book 5, written by Lainey Davis, narrated by Tom Taylorson and Carly Robbins, both members of SAG-AFTRA. Produced by Blue Nose Audio. Production coordination by Karen White. Post-production by Banvard Audio. To stay informed about upcoming titles by Lainey Davis, go to laneydavis.com. Copyright 2023 by Lainey Davis. All rights reserved.